Members, we're now live streaming. We're about to commence the meeting. Members, the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor. City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, the 12th of May, 2020. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who may be with us today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the sites for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Will all present stand in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country at sea, on land and in the air? Thank you, members. Members, uh, I have no leaves of absence tonight. No, just double checking, but we don't. Um, I'm, I'm look for confirmation of the minutes. Uh, we have two lots of minutes from the 14th of April and also from the 22nd of April. Um, and I'll look for a mover. Uh, if I can ask people to use their... Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, and seconded by Councillor Knoll. Uh, members to the vote, those in favour by your physical hand, all those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, we have one deputation tonight, and that is Mr Jason Redman. Um, Jason, I believe you are with us. Yes? Yes. He's with us. Great. Uh, there you are. There we go. Hello. Um, you have five, I'm using, yeah. five minutes. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and thank you, councillors, for uh, allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm here to do... Uh, to talk about a, a globally unique vision uh, for, our, for our city of Adelaide and uh, a concept that I've, I've been lucky enough to speak with Alexander Hyde uh, with um, uh, just recently and, uh, and uh, something that I believe is very, very exciting. Um, I'll open with, um, I, I'm coming to you today as a, as a citizen uh, of this great state. I'm not coming from any particular organisation or any other agenda, um, a commercial agenda for that matter. Um, this is a concept that's been in my mind for, uh, for a couple of years now. I finally got it down onto, uh, uh, in, into some form that's presentable and, um, and I'll, that's what I really what I want to share with you all today. The, the, the concept is to um, develop a, an internationally recognisable South Australian icon um, and that is um, 
to uh, to um, really provide a park, our parklands with an identity uh, that cannot be replicated in any other city in the world. Um, it will encourage and promote active lifestyle. Uh, it offers an essential Adelaide tourism experience um, and is also very considerate of our Aboriginal and our colonial um, heritage. The concept is very, very simple. It is a non-stop shared walk, run, cycle track that circumnavigates the city uh, of Adelaide. Um, and when I say non-stop, that means it is absolutely uninterrupted um, um, uh, throughout uh, as it uh, uh, goes around our great city. Um, it, is, uh, it will feature an uh, Aboriginal Dreamtime uh, inspired surface. Uh, it'll utilise recycled materials and also integrate various modern technology aspects uh, into it uh, to safeguard and also enhance the user experience. Um, and also incorporate native landscape surrounds and sustainable techniques and resources. I'm very conscious I only have five minutes, so I'm going to move through this quite quickly. I've, um, I've named it for the moment, the Adelaide Rainbow Circuit. So you may hear it referred to uh, as the ARC. Um, and really what it does is it brings together and promotes a number of different areas. Um, firstly, our Aboriginal heritage, something that's very important to all of us. And I certainly love the introduction today. Um, thank you, Sandy. Um, but the, uh, it's really looking at the uh, Dreamtime story of the rainbow serpent uh, and in the way that, that uh, it um, makes its way around the land and uses its body to form our mountains and valleys and rivers, et cetera. Um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to speak to um, um, some Ghana um, representatives around this concept. Uh, obviously the Ghana uh, side of things is more around the um, uh, the, uh, the Adelaide Plains and, and the identity of the kangaroo. However, there is um, uh, linkage to the rainbow serpent, and uh, and um, I've had conversations around using that theme um, for this. But I think there's certainly a lot more work that needs to be done. The next thing it brings together is Colonel Light's vision, um, as as once again introduced uh, at the beginning of this session, um, and that is to be using the parklands as intended. Um, uh, really for a, for a pace of, of recreation, leisure uh, and, and enjoyment. It connects notable Adelaide sites um, uh, throughout our, uh, sorry, surrounding our great city uh, from zoos to botanic gardens, etc. I'm sure everyone's familiar with all of those. It encourages activity um, and in um, uh, and particularly active, um, uh, active lifestyle activity. Um, in whether it be cycling, whether it be walking, or whether it be running. And it would go a long way in, in maintaining our position as, as one of the top 10 most livable cities in the world. And finally, it does, it's very much in line with our South Australian tourism uh, plan. Um, and it would look to capture the fastest growing um, uh, sector in global tourism, and that is um, uh, known as active sports tourism. Uh, and it's very much focused on, the, on meeting the objective of developing unique and appealing experiences for, uh, for tourists to our, to our great state. The concept is to look at a 12 kilometer circuit in phase one, um, really looking at, uh, at, uh, at utilizing a, a, a bunch of um, existing track, but also enhancing various other areas. It is, it is um, the, the major component of this is some bridge and underpass infrastructure, which is quite significant. Um, to, to genuinely make this a, an un, uninterrupted circuit of our city. Um, and uh, it would also incorporate native landscape surrounds and, and, and feature things like comfort stops and off-road trail adventure segments and those types of things. The surface itself um, would be inspired by, um, by the rainbow serpent itself. It would look at um, using a bunch of techniques in being able to, uh, and innovative ideas about for being able to use projection technologies and, and LED technologies to genuinely enhance that surface. Um, and also some of the other technology that we're looking at integrating into this would be things like Wi-Fi and being able to um, uh, track users and look at use and, and, and those types of things. I'm assuming that's a, a ding for the amount of time I have left, or am I done? I'm not too sure. That's, thanks, Jason. If there's anything you wanted just to to finish off, that'd be great. But that is yeah, your time. I, I will. I will. The, the, the main thing here is the support that I've had, um, and uh, and it, and it's 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 quite far-reaching. Everywhere from Business SA, Martin Hazy has been a huge promoter of this. Um, as I said, um, uh, some uh, some Ghana uh, representatives in Mickey O'Brien, who I've spoken to. 
um, our APA team from uh, uh, including Shane Sodi. Um, I've spoken to Martin Cook, who's a representative within Adelaide uh, City Council around the APLA implications, uh, Bike SA, Athletics SA, Walking SA, um, the Bicycle Institute of South Australia and the South Australian Runners Club. Um, I've basically been out speaking to as many people who will listen to me um, about this and they're all offering their support. Um, and most importantly, I've, I've got this in front of um, representatives within the state government who are, who are very interested in this as well, particularly off the back of some of the COVID pieces that we have at the moment. Yep. I will call it there. Thank, Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, that takes us to item eight, and there are no petitions tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, suggest that we move the following items on block. Uh, so, members, if you raise your hand, I'll read out the numbers. If you raise your hand, if there is uh, an item that you would like pulled out, uh, please do, and I will come back to you so I know what item that is. Um, so, uh, there is no, 9.1, there is no advice um, that has been distributed from the Adelaide Parklands Authority. Um, so, the items to move on block are 9.2, which is the advice recommendation of the Audit Committee from the 17th of April and the 1st of May. 11.1, uh, which is council, a report from council members. 12.1, uh, which is environmental health management policy. 12.2, which is the temporary revisions to the community consultation policy. 12.3, which is the 2019-2020 quarter three financial performance report. Councillor Martin, thank you. Um, 12.4, which is the progress of motions by elected members. And 12.5, which is the cultural investigation. Uh, so members, I have 12.3. Uh, Councillor Martin, I'll just unmute you. Sorry, Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, I wish to um, pull out 12.3 and 12.5. Correct. Okay, lovely. Um, so, members, I will look for a mover and a seconder to for the remaining items on block. And that would be 9.2, 11.1, 12.1, 12.2, 12.4. And I have uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Canole. Uh, members to the vote, all those in favour, uh, by your physical hand, please. All those against, that is carried. Beautiful. Um, so, members, that takes us to 12.3. Councillor Martin, one moment, I'll just unmute you. There we go, Councillor Martin. Um, yes, Lord Mayor. Yeah, you didn't move item 10 in the block, which is your Lord Mayor's oh, report. Uh, Are you I'll go back to that. I will. Thank you very much. I missed that one. I'll go to item 10. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor. Um, well, presiding members report from the 12th of May. Uh, hello, everybody. Voting in the supplementary election for the central ward vacancy closed yesterday. Uh, I want to say a thank you to all the candidates for putting themselves forward for election in, uh, in the strangest of circumstances and for wanting to represent their communities. Um, the online candidate forum that we hosted was a very unique way for the community to connect with candidates during these times and was well attended. And I really want to thank the team from my office as well as the governance team and the IT team for doing a fantastic job and pulling that together very quickly. And it was quite a challenging technical feat, so well done. The election vote count will be undertaken tomorrow and I look forward to welcoming a new councillor following their investiture at the committee meeting on the 2nd of June. A report will be brought to council on the 9th of June on the election. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the Electoral Commission of South Australia, Mick Sherry and his team for undertaking this election under the circumstances that we're in, which saw them having to take on a whole range of special measures. And we sincerely appreciate their partnership in this. As we move from containment to recovery phase, uh, I have been meeting through a variety of online platforms with many of the city stakeholders to have very candid conversations about what we all need to do and how we as a council can support them and how we can support one another in a realistic and practical sense. 
Um, I've also recently hosted a session of the Harney Street Roundtable with uh, the West End stakeholders, where the impact of COVID-19 on businesses was very openly discussed. Um, in recent weeks, I have also met with Premier Stephen Marshall, Minister David Ridgway, uh, the Australian Hotel Association, Restaurant and Catering Association, Study Adelaide, and we'll be meeting with Festivals Adelaide and uh, Arts to say about supporting businesses and their uh, roadmaps to recovery. Council recently hosted a forum to provide an update on the progress of the citywide business model, which is an important project to support our local businesses and promote our unique experiences to attract more visitors to the city. Earlier today, I took part in a webinar organised by David Pearson and the Australian Alliance to End Homelessness on Adelaide's COVID-19 response to street homelessness and also um, as as a chair of the Capital City Lord Mayors on our advocacy to the federal government. Um, as I stated in my opinion piece in the advertiser, homelessness is complex. We know a great deal on how to present it and in some ways the solution is quite simple and that is housing, providing safe short-term and permanent accommodation along with those wraparound and support services. And this action absolutely must be part of our COVID-19 recovery and I will continue along with many of the members to advocate uh, and work productively with all levels of government and our services provided to see this to fruition. And finally, uh, we had a very uh, a special anniversary yesterday. And um, even though I can't see her, I do want to offer our congratulations to Councillor Anne Moran on her 25 years of dedicated service to the community. That is an extraordinary milestone. Um, Anne, and we do congratulate you and, um, and thank you for your service. Um, and I hope you uh, enjoyed the flowers that we sent to you yesterday morning. So um, thank you, Anne. You can all do this because we can't hear you. <laughs> Um, members, that takes us then to 12.3, which, oh, sorry, I need, uh, before we go, I need a mover and a seconder, just by hand, thank you, Councillor Knoll, and a seconder, thank you, no, I just have Councillor Knoll, I need a seconder by little, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Our members to the vote, all those in favour, by hand, those against, that is carried, thank you. Um, Members, that will take us to item 12.3. I will go to Councillor Martin. Yes, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. And, and please uh, indulge me to the extent that uh, I also echo your congratulations to Councillor Moran. Um, now, look, I'm going to vote against this item, so I'm happy to move it, but I'm not sure that standing orders permit me to do so and then vote against it. Could I have some comment from the administration? We can certainly move it, um, Councillor Martin, and then vote against it. That's fine. Okay, fine. But you can only speak at the time that you've moved the motion. Okay? Does that make sense? Sure. Thanks. Why is that? You can speak at the time you move the motion, or unless you reserve your right. Do you, so if you're moving, you're taking to have spoken to the motion when you speak at that time. Okay, I have no intention of doing it, but why isn't uh, a summing up possible in circumstances when there is then discussion? You certainly get to sum up. So oh, it's well, the normal I process think... is what, sorry, my, yeah, sorry to confuse you, yeah. No, uh, it's all right, okay. Um, look, and first, a quick question for the administration at the bottom of page 35 on next steps. 21 says utilisation of special discretionary rebate to provide assistance to ratepayers of approximately $2.1 million. I, I've forgotten that. Could you please explain to me what that initiative is? I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor Martin. I will just ask for a seconder. I had Councillor Martin move. I'm looking for a seconder. I need it by, uh, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, and uh, administration.
Thanks, Jenny. Um, so what we're proposing to do is um, talk you through this on the um, 26th of May, um, but continuing the uh, to freeze the rate and the dollar. So that's the um, underlying approach that we'll be proposing to take with you, um, which results in that um, a, a relief of 2.1 million when it's modelled. Um. I, I'm sorry, I'm still not clear. So that $2.1 million represents freezing the rate in the dollar, or is there a special discretionary rebate on top of that? Sorry, just a moment, uh, Claire, it's not unmuting. Yeah, yeah. I think Jenny and I are in a fight over who's got mute. Um, and so that's a um, sorry, Councillor Martin. In my um, in my fight with Jenny over the mute control, can you repeat your question, please? Yes. Um, so is that two point one million dollars the sum total of freezing the rate in the dollar, or is there additionally a special discretionary rebate? Yeah. It's holding the valuations as is, so it's not changing anything to the valuations. That's what comprises the 2.1 million. Okay, I understand now. That's good. Thank you. Um, Lord Mayor, look, I, I did want to speak to this because um, I acknowledge that uh, we have debt of $70 million, and as the administration has advised in the last 24 hours, uh, most of that debt that this council has, most of the debt which prevents us from doing anything, is as a consequence of our not managing our budgets. Uh, that is, running an actual operating deficit of $17.4 million, $21.1 million, and around $20 million, or whatever it turns out to be this year. Um, uh, contrasted with, by the way, the frugal position of 2016-17, when council managed to surplus of $17.3 million. Now, um, I'm uh, concerned because the consequence of that deficit, as it's being explained to us by the administration, that is that debt of $70 million, um, less, say, $10 million, is that a raft of projects have been cancelled, postponed, or otherwise subject to a brand new budget process that will adversely impact on ratepayers. Um, from my point of view, uh, gone are uh, the, uh, um, uh, the activations of 88 O'Connell Street, the Jeffcott Street upgrade, O'Connell Street, Melbourne Street master plans, laneways, bikeways, um, even greening are all on the chopping block as a consequence of this deficit. And our problem is with that $70 million debt um, that comes from mismanagement is that um, we are in a position where we can't help ratepayers. We can't do anything for them when others are doing so. But uh, what troubles me most is, and this is uh, my speculation alone, is that uh, the whole of the financial strategy seems to be positioning us so that we have enough borrowing capacity to fund the central market arcade redevelopment. Uh, we've reduced debt, and I think that is the strategy to free up what's available to put it into the central market arcade uh, redevelopment. So um, mismanaged operating deficits and no capacity to help people, whatever. And worse still, capacity to set our communities back by not delivering the projects that we'd previously agreed. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, even more uh, upsetting is that this central market arcade redevelopment that we'll be putting all our borrowing capacity into, as I think, as I speculate, um, isn't even going to have a return, a positive return over the previous outgoings until about 2039. Now, I know everyone will dispute that, but that's uh, what the, uh, uh, the fiduciary report says. Now, this is uh, crazy economics, and um, it is disheartening for our ratepayers. And again, it's, it's my prediction alone, my speculation alone, 
but I, I say to people in North Adelaide, if, if you expect to see in the 88 Oak Street as well in the, the next five years, you, you're dreaming. It's not going to happen. So this is a really serious position that this council finds itself in. No. Now, I'm going to be Sorry, voting. Councillor Martin, I'm not sure if you heard, but that was time. Yeah, look, I, 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 oh, I thought you said Tom. Time, time. time. As in okay. time. Well, there is a difference in the tone. Yes, you're right. There was an Irish lilt to that ring, I think. Um, an Irish lilt? No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, so. Well, look, I, I will be voting against this. I, um, I expect yeah. that the team will vote for it, but really, I, I think we could do better. Um, Jesse's waving. I'm not sure why. I'm going to go to the um, CEO. Can you unmute the CEO? I'm trying. <laughs> there we go. And I will just see. Okay. No. Here's Do I need to, to provide some comment in response to the suggestion that Council is not managing its budgets and um, that there is mismanagement of our deficits. I think it's fair to say that Council has made an, a raft of strategic financial decisions over the last few years and uh, that has been entirely at the discretion of Council on valid projects and that has resulted in deficits which are undeniable but they were not a surprise and they have been deficits that have enabled Council to undertake the projects that it's wanted to. So I don't think it's reasonable to suggest there's been a mismanagement of the budget process. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, I will be voting for this. Um, I think it's a, a, a very reasonable way forward. Um, and one that is uh, fiscally responsible. Um, uh, I would say on the Central Market Arcade Redevelopment, that's a city shaping project, um, uh, and it's important that it goes ahead, um, not only uh, because it's city shaping, but because it will actually assist our bottom line in the long run. Um, uh, but I would say to the suggestion that we're actually um, uh, just trying to gear ourselves to carry debt in order to fund that, um, I'd just like to remind councillors that in actual fact, um, uh, the debt ceilings that we set for ourselves as a, as a city um, are very much uh, uh, just a, an arbitrary line in the sand in many respects, um, and we can actually go past them if we need to. You know, if we wished, we could uh, probably borrow in excess of $100, $150 million um, and still actually be very, very comfortable. So um, I, I do take umbrage with the idea that uh, that we're just gearing ourselves in order to carry debt to go into this development. Um, I also take umbrage with the idea that this council will not deliver uh, 88 O'Connell because um, uh, without reflecting too much on it, um, I think we all want to see something happen on that side. Um, and it's a very important and key project for this, um, uh, for this term of council. So I think it's a very measured way forward. Um, I think we are largely uh, responsible um, and uh, I, this, there's a discrepancy between um, in Councillor Martin's arguments regarding highlighting the operational expenditure, but then suggesting that um, uh, our capital expenditure is the issue. Um, uh, for me, what it comes back to, if you've got an operational deficit, um, uh, you need to look at your operations, not your capital programs that you're delivering necessarily. So, um, uh, and that is what I think we should very much look at as an organisation. I didn't unmute me. Councillor Moran and then Councillor Sims. I have Councillor Moran. Yes, I will vote for this. Um, I think we've, uh, this expected pandemic has uh, caused enormous, enormous financial strain to the council. Um, I think some of the projects that the previous council have lumbered us with um, have drained the, uh, drained the bank account badly. Um, bought a place while a lovely project was not necessary and tripled its or, uh, three times its, its original quote. I think that the Central Market Arcade, while a wonderful project, is too much for us at the moment. 
and uh, it was as I was the person who moved the original project, which was to sell the air rights and use whatever money we had from that sale to do up the ground floor and extend the market. It has morphed into something far more expensive. I still like the project, but I think that should be looked at. I don't think we'll be able to deliver ABA to Connor Street, and I don't, I absolutely do not agree with Councillor Hyde that the potential limit is just an arbitrary line in the sand. Uh, as we were always taught, the prudential limit should be something you see far in the horizon. Now we're approaching it. I think that's dangerous. So I think we have to proceed carefully and perhaps put some of our um, vanity project, which I don't mean that in a negative way, um, uh, put, put that on hold and look after and put, pour the money into our small businesses, our residents and the boring old stuff that council does. Uh, it is not time to launch into big development, and uh, I don't think it's. I don't think anybody's suggesting that the administration has not administered the budget. I think past councils have made big mistakes, but, but you know, to get them off the hook, um, we didn't know this was this was coming. Um, so I think we have to cut our cloth to fit our sail, or whatever the, the saying is, and. Um, and be sensible in this time. People are hurting. Um, one day the central market might give us um, return on our dollar, but it won't be for a long, long, long time. So I think we need to look at all those big capital works and we need to pull our debt back and spend our money where it's most needed. So I'm, I'm happy to proceed cautiously. Thank you, Councillor Moran. I have Councillor Sims, then Councillor Canole. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I don't feel uh, comfortable um, voting for this, mainly because I, I still have concerns around some of the projects that are being um, deferred and, and the potential um, impact on, on that. I also have real concerns around the process that's been adopted, and it's not a criticism of our administration because they have engaged with us um, throughout, and we had a discussion about this at committee but I really would have preferred um, an opportunity to go through uh, this with a lot more detail um, through a some sort of a subcommittee um, mechanism to examine the savings and to work out a, a way forward um, before uh, approaching it in, in this way. That option was presented. Council said no to that approach. So again, it's not a criticism of administration, but I, for me, I, I don't feel uh, comfortable backing this when there are many meritorious projects that have been put on the back burner. In terms of why we find ourselves in this position, I mean, obviously, you know, global pandemic absolutely um, has, has precipitated this for us and, and lots of other organisations as well. I do think it's fair to say, though, that our uh, organisation has been particularly exposed because of some strategic mistakes that the council has made. Um, one of those was Gawler Place which has um, been a very expensive uh, project. Uh, some might even say a white elephant. I mean, I think it looks great, but a lot of money um, spent on something at a time when we're fairly cash strapped. The other strategic issue that I think has compounded council's problems has been the decision over a long period of time not to increase rates. And the problem is when you don't increase uh, rate revenue when times are good, you don't have any flexibility when times are bad. And I know that that's a minority view, um, but it is my personal view. Um, and I think that has been a factor that has had an impact. I'm certainly not suggesting that we increase rates at all at the moment. Um, certainly that's not my view. Um, but had we uh, had incremental increases in the past during good times, we would have a little bit more money in, in the kitty at the moment. So I think there's a range of, of different factors um, that have contributed. I think council needs to have a discussion about its revenue and how we address that going forward. And um, I look forward to having discussions with administration and elected members about that because we need to address the structural problem we face with our revenue base. Otherwise, as an organisation, I think we're going to struggle to deliver the, the services um, and uh, the infrastructure projects that we think are vital. Um, but for me, I'm not comfortable with what's been proposed here, and um, so I'm not going to vote for it. Thank you, 
Councillor Sims, I have Councillor Knoll. And looking at the, the budget, et cetera, well, number one, yes, we are postponing projects. If you think about it, this was not going to be foreseen. We still run a very conservative balance sheet, and that's by, you know, by all uh, uh, general uh, critics who look at our, our balance sheet and then look at us as a council. We still have scope to be able to deal with things. So we're not really in any issue other than the ones we, we obviously set ourselves. And we're not forgetting too, a lot of these projects, what we're looking at here, um, besides those that are at the, the functioning ones that we, we do as, as ongoing, and there's a, a lot of those. But again, as, as Councillor Hyde said, we have shit, uh, shit, city shaping uh, um, you know, uh, projects, and they will be cash flow positive once you have got them and you, and got the, you have the, the income coming from those, but you don't get that until you actually do the building, until you actually do the construction and get things going. And we are all being asked to uh, use uh, construction and, and obviously activity, commercial activity to get our cities going. And here are, here are some of these projects that you do that with. And I mean, uh, I think we are still, we, it still doesn't stop us from looking at hardship from individuals, but let's look at it, at it uh, as individual businesses, et cetera, rather than trying to do blankets. And obviously we're having a few discussions around that, but here is the opportunity, uh, certainly just to reposition it, uh, certainly cauterize uh, the issues we have. Um, it's, it still enables us to do the other, other projects, et cetera. We just need to be cautious, but is, this is a time to reset uh, our council and uh, our budgetary agendas and, and uh, what, what we're really thinking we need to be delivering. So that's a conversation that we have uh, that will be ongoing, but at least now let's get to that and let's see what it looks like the other side. But uh, again, um, you know, you, you can't have predicted this to have happened, but I think with clever management and finding ways that we can deliver services and things like that, uh, that the community need and uh, are prepared to pay for, and using that as, the, as, a, as an opportunity now to redesign re, uh, or uh, reimagine ourselves, strangely one of our, our big words, that we can uh, come out of this and, and reset how we run our council and, uh, and work a lot smarter as we move towards a new, a new future. And that, you know, we have less cars now, there's ways we get to get around like that. So I think we just need to be uh, uh, very cognizant that we are still in good shape. We just got to be cautious as we start to think about how we walk, work out of it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Canal. Um, and of course, members, you know, it is the QS3. We've got our business plan and budget session on the 26th of May um, with 46% of our revenue coming from commercial businesses, which have all been uh, so incredibly affected by uh, COVID-19 and the closing down of businesses. There had to be adjustments to be made. Um, and so the projects that are in the the plan in terms of being retimed or reprioritised will be subject to our discussion on the 26th of May. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I think this is a, a normal business practice and practice and one that is um, very much required. Uh, I actually thank the finance team for the work that they've done um, in that we've been able to keep delivering our services throughout this period and we've kept our staff employed. Um, so, you know, they are two of the key factors that have been determined by the adjustments that had to go through this budget. Um, and I also look forward to those projects will be, uh, Councillor Sims, to your point, I think a lot of those projects will be discussed in more detail when we get to the workshop on the 26th of May, so that we can actually make sure that we are looking what's going to be delivered in um, QF1 and QF2 of the next financial year as well. Um, I will go back to... Can't hear. Councillor Martin, you, you're going to sum up? Yes, I will sum up. Look, I, you know, to, uh, to Councillor Canole and uh, to the Deputy Lord Mayor and everyone else who says things are okay, the balance sheet is good, I say to you, I have ratepayers who are saying to me, I am losing my upgrade. I am still going to have water in the front of my property in Jeffcott Street because you've cancelled the project. You have postponed it, cancelled it, whatever you've done, I am not getting my drains fixed. I am having a lake in front of my property every time it rains. And if the balance sheet is that good, why can't we do that? That's what people are asking. And look, to the point that uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor raises, 
that is to say that somehow if you're running an operating deficit of uh, a cumulative $60 million and it's not connected to capital, that's separate, that's a nonsense. They are connected. Because of that deficit, the administration is telling us all of these capital projects are off. They are gone. They're off. They're up for renegotiation. Um, and uh, if, if our prudential, as the uh, Deputy Lord Mayor observes, if our prudential limit is such an arbitrary, voluntary thing, if we can extend it at any time, why are we not extending it now to provide help to our ratepayers, to give them the projects they want? We're not doing that because we're in deep stuck. Uh, we are in a mess and it is because of imprudent spending and I'm not blaming the administration uh, they do as they are told by the elected body and the elected body has been saying spend 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 go into debt Lord Mayor this uh, is a truly horrendous outcome for ratepayers who have small projects that they have been banking on being completed for years. In Jeff Cott Strait's uh, case, 20 years they've been waiting and it's gone. Uh, and look, I take heart from your assurance that these things will be back on the agenda in the first quarter of next year. But I temper that also with the knowledge that the budget we meet to discuss on the 26th will not even be approved by council till November. That is well into the second quarter of the financial year and any action may well be next year, the year after, who knows. So I can't vote against this. I'd rather see the council borrowing the money. And God knows we've got the money. Uh, it's coming in. And to Councillor Sims's point, um, you know, rates have gone up substantially. When I joined council five and a half years ago, our rates income was around about $90, $92 million. It is now up around $110 million. Our rates have been going gangbusters we ought to be in a much better financial position than we are. Thank you, Councillor Martin. <laughs> we're, we're still struggling, struggling to figure out how we actually uh, use the bell. Um, members, uh, we will go to the vote. Uh, members, those in favour, by hand, thank you. Those against, that is carried. Uh, members, that takes us to uh, 12.5. Councillor Martin. Um, yes, Lord Mayor, and I will move this and I will vote for it. Um, um, have I a seconder? I will look for a seconder. Uh, thank you. I have Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, I'll just thank you very much. Um, uh, now, if I could begin by asking administration a question before I speak. Um, uh, I note, um, and I did read their um, uh, profile, a legal firm has been engaged to work with the audit committee to conduct this culture survey. Um, could you please tell me what was the cost of the engagement or is it open-ended with a minimum as has often been presented to us in other matters involving legal firms? And we'll just ask the CEO to answer. Sorry, Lord Mayor, I might need Rudy, I think, who oh. oversaw that process, or, or Claire. I'm not sure whether Vanessa has either. So either Vanessa or, or Rudy might be able to answer for us. Thanks. Through the Lord Mayor, um, the audit committee members, the independent audit committee members have um, undertaken this process and uh, through their uh, review of the submissions reviewed, um, they have indeed uh, considered the estimated cost as part of the criteria to be assessed. The uh, firms who provided a submission have given an indicative cost indication, of course, noting that it's very difficult to provide a cap to uh, such a process where it is unknown where um, it's gonna go. Um, the, in the report, you will see in the financial implications section in an indicative uh, reference to the cost 
uh, which was highlighted between 15 and um, 25 thousand dollars, I believe. But that's very um, pen uh, pending uh, the the depth of the review they need to uh, undertake. We have received through the uh, independent audit committee members also an overview of um, hourly rates that are applicable by the relevant staff members. So uh, it certainly has um, some boundaries around it and uh, the chair of the audit committee has undertaken to monitor that expenditure as it evolves through uh, regular reporting between himself and the uh, legal firm. Uh, so I, I understand uh, I understand then what's being said to me is that <laughs> stage one, as is it, it's described in the papers, is up to 25,000 or perhaps a little more, including staff. And if there's a stage two, that's on top of that at whatever figure that is. Yep. You need your microphone on ready. Yep. Okay. Um, through the Lord Mayor, um, that uh, indicative cost may well be uh, conclusive of stage one and stage two. Uh, it just depends on what the findings are, what they come across, how many interviews they need to undertake. So it's impossible to, uh, to put a final figure on that. Uh, the estimate may well be all inclusive or it may just be for stage one. That's just uh, unknown at this point in time. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, may I speak? Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, look, I, I want to make um, abundantly clear to all that um, as laudable as the goal may be, this is largely a political exercise. Um, it was described as such by uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Kouros at our last meeting when uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor said straight out, this is about you. This is about you, Councillor Martin. Um, and that may well be his wish, um, uh, and I'm happy to help in any way that I can, but I do think it does need to be broader and we need to look at some of the behavioral issues in this council. Things like violent language, uh, only uh, a little while ago, we had a member talking about an idea to this of the administration, which is really a pejorative language. Uh, we had a, a violent incident in the uh, the corridors of council, where um, which was filmed, by the way, which is on film and which staff have viewed and which I think. Sorry, councillor relevance. This is about um, council members and administration, not about council member to council member. Sorry. Oh no, no, no this, I, I must, this, no, relevance. No, no, Lord this, Mayor, Lord Mayor. You, you um, don't understand. I, I understand that. I am saying to you that the administration having to watch violent language and violent events does have an impact on the health and well-being of staff. That's exactly what I'm saying. Council, and I'm saying further. Yes, this is about the interplay between the council members and members of the administration. What do you think uh, violent language Council, and violent Councillor, if you'd like to continue, that would be great. No, no, I think it's very important, Lord Mayor. Do you think violent language... I think language it's really violent... important too that we actually keep it to the item that we're discussing, which is okay. about a draft uh, scope of work for an investigation that has already gone through council and that what we are doing is approving the draft scope of work and appointing the EMA, and that is the discussion before us on the agenda. Well, no, we're, we're being given a report that deals with the scope. The and recommendation is to approve the draft scope of work and appoint the legal people. So the scope of work is on the back, which Lord is Mayor, about what the consultants are going to do, and the uh, legal firm is the EMA Legal. Uh, Lord, I can see what you're doing. Everyone else can see what you're doing. I yes, am I'm trying to keep the discussion to the item on the agenda rather than to the content of the motion that went through Council. Okay, well, Lord Mayor, I'm saying to you that this is relevant to what went through Council. This is exactly the same subject. And as much as you might want to try and separate them, they are the same. And there are very important issues that need to be looked at in terms of the actions of elected members and their impact. 
Lord Mayor, you spent a good minute and a half of my time interrupting and telling I, me that. Councillor, if you continue, if you actually would like to speak to the motion before us, I'm very happy to give you an extra minute for my interruptions. If you will speak to the motion before us. All right. Well, before I start again, Lord Mayor, can I have it clear that this investigation, the scope that we're pre uh, preparing, moving, is to allow an investigation of the impact of elected member behaviour on the administration. Is this correct? This is correct. Okay. And therefore, I say that it is relevant for this investigation to look at broader things, things like the decisions of elected members to force uh, uh, meetings upon staff where they are required to remain in the same location until 3.20 a.m. after having worked an eight-hour day working eight hour, 18 hours straight and putting at risk, as this investigation is all about, their health and wing. That's about. Now, those sorts of things do need to be examined much more broadly than I know the political agenda of the Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Kouros would envisage. But uh, I want to make clear to members that I'm serious about this inquiry. I think it does need to go ahead and these things need to be examined. And I encourage you, as I will be, to write to the audit committee and to write to the legal firm engaged and explain to them the issues at play, the things that are really important in terms of impacting the work of our staff, from uh, issues related to long hours, the language, wow. behaviour, and also to this like culture surveys, which I know through um, uh, uh, information that was passed to me, were very upset, were withheld from elected members. Now, these are issues that actually affect the wellbeing of staff. If they talk honestly in surveys, and yet that survey information is withheld from elected members who they rely on to protect them, to help them. Now, these are the sorts of things that need to be looked at by this inquiry. So I suggest to members, write to them, write to the people involved, tell them these are the issues, and this is how they are impacting our staff, uh, as I will be. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. I have uh, Deputy Lord Mayor as a seconder, then I have Councillor Sims and Councillor Moran. Deputy Lord Mayor. It's not unmuting. Sorry. There we go. I'll reserve my right for the moment. Thank, Thank you. you. I have Councillor uh, Sims and then, there we go. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, I, I am um, supportive of um, this. I think it, it's always good to have a cultural survey. I guess I have some concerns about the cost, um, the implications at the moment, given um, you know some of the other challenges that we uh, face, but I'm broadly supportive of it. I, I do think, though, um, it would be good for it to have a bit of a broader remit and to look at how uh, councillors work as a team, how the elected body works as a team, um, not simply with respect to administration, but how we engage uh, collectively. Um, because I, I do think, and I'm not trying to be uh, inflammatory, but I, I do think it's fair to say that we probably haven't met the mark in terms of how we work collectively over the last 12 months. Um, you know, we could probably do that better, all of us collectively. Um, I think, you know, anybody who has watched council over the last year and a bit would probably say there's areas where we could all improve. Um, and I think sometimes having an external person come in uh, to look at those kinds of things um, would be very helpful, um, who doesn't have a, an interest and who is a, an independent person that can evaluate. So happy with what's been proposed, but it would be good, I think, to have a broader uh, focus for the inquiry too, if that is possible. But I'll leave that with the, um, the audit committee and encourage them to consider that. Thank you, Councillor Sims. I have Councillor Moran. Just one moment. There we go. Councillor Moran. Look, I won't support this. I think it was clearly aimed at certain councillors. I think Bill Martin, for one. In fact, I've heard that said to me directly. Um, Behaviour. Um, I have been, I think the uh, behaviour of the uh, elected members does affect the staff. 
and I think we have respective members to each other affect the staff. I'm the person referred to often in the media as uh, involved in a fracas in the um, corridor, which is quite correct, but as the, the completely innocent victim of a physical and... Councillor Moran, thank you. We're not prosecuting the case here. We are actually talking about the scope of work and the legal investigation recommendation. That is why I'm explaining my reasons for voting against it, because I think the biggest problem with this council is the behaviour of certain councillors towards other councillors. And I have been a victim of that behaviour. But councillor, that's not what we're debating at the moment. I'm we're, we're... Fine. we're not voting for this motion, Sandy. It's completely relevant. I think um, it should be aimed at the administration have the CEO to protect them. He's highly paid and highly skilled. And that is what his job is, to make sure that the relationship between the staff and the elected body is within uh, reasonable bounds. And I think he does that very well. I think the behaviour of certain councillors to other councillors and having been the, the victim. But that's not what this report's about. This is actually between, uh, and the motion of council is the conduct and behaviours of councillors and administration. Uh, well, so as, as much as that thanks, may be your concern, Councillor Moran, that's not what this um, item is about. I am voting against this item because it, the main problem with this council and the main thing that, that upsets our administration is not our behaviour towards them, it's our behaviour towards each other, which you seem to be totally blind to. I, I'm not Councillor Moran. I'm actually just trying to keep to the motion before us in the agenda, uh, which is delivery on a motion of council in terms of investigation. I'm allowed to say whatever I like. The behaviour in that day in the passage that went unnoticed... Councillor Moran, thank you. Uh, Councillor Moran, we're not talking about an, an, a situation that happened before. We are actually looking at the scope of work and appointing the legal authority. But I am not voting for that, Sandy, and the reason I'm not voting for it is because the huge behaviour problem in this council is not between the administration and the elected body, who is the council, it's between the council members. And I think that behaviour certainly upset me. And, it's and that's not the behaviour that is being looked at through this motion. This, this, this item is not investigating that and nor was the motion brought to council. That is, that is a separate conversation. If I was voting for this motion, then you'd be quite correct. Not voting for this motion ignoring shocking behaviour to, that would not be um, in any way contemplated in the normal work. My Thank you. has been breached time and time again, and you've done nothing, and that's what we should be looking at. Councillor Moon, thank you. I will go to Councillor Kerra. Thank you, Councillor Kerra. Thanks, Thanks Lord Mayor. Look, I will be voting for this. Um, I think it is um, really a bit ridiculous to suggest that this investigation uh, which is about uh, impacts on administration, that is working staff, should somehow be diluted and extended uh, to the interaction between councillors. Um, the, this is not a, um, th this is a chamber of government, okay? This is not a, uh, you know, friends of the ABC, herbal tea, you know, meet and greet society. Uh, this is an inherently, uh, this is an inherently ad adversarial chamber of government. To suggest that an investigation, which is about working people and working staff, should be completely diluted uh, by an investigation into how councillors who are grown up enough, big, up, big and ugly enough to look after themselves, I would submit. But to suggest that that ought to be diluted in that way smacks to me a little bit of saying, don't look over here, look over there. I welcome this investigation and I think all of us as councillors should not be afraid of what it may overturn. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kerra. Uh, I have no other speakers. Oh, sorry, my screen just changed. I have got the Deputy Lord Mayor, you did wish to speak, just one moment. There we go. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. And first up, uh, I thank Councillor Kerra um, for his commentary and his words. I think that was spot on. 
Um, this is a chamber of government. The reason that we don't need to be investigated is because we signed up for this. Our staff did not. Um, we signed up to an adversarial, uh, potentially adversarial political system. Um, we're elected through a campaign. I don't see staff scrambling over one another um, uh, to fight for votes for a, for a job necessarily. It's completely different. It's apples and oranges. Um, uh, now, having said that, I'm looking at Councillor Kouros and uh, I hope she's penning a, an email to her lawyer now to, about a potential defamation regarding the commentary that we've had here. But uh, to come back to it, of course, um, if, you're Lord Mayor, if you can stick to the item before us yes, in the agenda. Don't worry, I'll, I'll be better behaved. I'll we be are better here to approve the draft behaved. scope of work and the point for lawyers. I just had to slip that one in there. Yes, um, now, you. regarding you're regarding the commentary, Lord Mayor, um, uh, uh, from Councillor Martin, that this um, who is apparently for this investigation, but for someone who's for this investigation, he certainly has a lot of issues with it. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor, can we stick to the item before us in the agenda? Yes, and the item before us is about ensuring that we have a safe workplace for our staff. It's about ensuring that they are safe, healthy and happy at work. That's our obligation. That's the CEO's obligation as well um, uh, as their direct employer. And that's what we're essentially directing him to undertake work to investigate. And then so he can implement um, a finding. I do agree with Councillor Moran that the CEO um, uh, will be ensuring uh, coming out of this investigation that staff are protected um, uh, and that they are working in an environment that is conducive to their well-being. That's what it's all about. Um, uh, and when we're thinking about that, and when we're thinking about cost, well, um, uh, the uh, twenty to twenty-five thousand um, dollars that it may well cost um, uh, will pale in comparison um, uh, if, well, the cost of doing nothing. Which could be, which could be, in the worst case scenario, um, a, a fair work commission case and people suing us for hundreds of thousands of dollars um, uh, for mental anguish because we um, uh, or the council, as their employer, did not protect them adequately um, uh, from some of the things that they uh, that they have to put up with in the in the day to day of their of their job. It's about drawing a line in the sand. It's about talking about what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. Um, when it comes to dealing with staff. Um, it's an incredibly important uh, a review to undertake. It's very unfortunate that it needs to be undertaken, incredibly unfortunate that it needs to be undertaken because I would hope that people uh, conduct themselves in a measured and responsible way, but it's, it's not what we've seen um, over, the last, uh, over the last 18 months necessarily. And that's, that's why we're in this position and I'm very keen to see uh, what the report comes back with. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin, I'll go to you to sum up. Councillor Martin? Yeah, well, thank you, Lord Mayor, and I thank the Deputy Lord Mayor for demonstrating exactly what I began saying, that this is a politically motivated Councillor inquiry. Um, it is designed, as he said, and I will be referring his comments from our last Council meeting to the inquirers, that this is about another Councillor in a Council that's controlled by the faction he leads. That is the short of it. I will support it though because I have absolute faith in the integrity of the legal firm and in the audit committee. They are good people. They will come to the right conclusions and I will help them to shine some light on the issues that uh, the Deputy Lord is keen for them to see. Thank you Councillor Martin. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Um, sorry, Councillor Moran, you're just disappearing into your background a little bit there. My apologies, sorry. I just uh, want to uh, ask the Deputy Lord Mayor retract his call for the current to reach the lawyer. I did not mention Councillor Kouros' name and the facts are on a video clear for everyone. Thank to you, Councillor Moran. Oh, Councillor, no, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to retract your statement? If not, I will continue the meeting. Um, we will now go to uh, members. That takes us to item 13, which is questions on notice. Um, as 
with uh, the previous week. The answers to the questions on notice have been published to the website uh, for the public and for the media, and we will take them as read with the leave of the meeting. Councillor Martin, you have your hand up. Councillor Martin? Yes, I'm asking uh, that uh, the meeting agrees to the questions being read. Okay, I will go to the meeting. Uh, members, if you would like the uh, answers to the questions read, if I can have a show of hands, those in favour. I have two, those against. Sorry, I had three. Those against, that fails. They're taken as read. Um, members, I have two questions. Sorry. Division, division please. Uh, um, we'd, um, it's leave of the meeting as opposed to a decision. Um, so my uh, legals are telling me, uh, governors tell me I can't do call a division on that. Um, we have question no, item number 14, which is questions without notice. Um, Councillor Martin, I think there were two questions without notice that were uh, given. Um, uh, they, they were received quite late in the day, so I'm going to ask that uh, the qu well, I'll ask you as to read out your questions or notice, but I will ask that the answers be provided and circulated to members um, outside of the meeting, or I'm very happy to take them on notice for the next meeting. Um, well, um, Lord Mayor. Um I understand that you think lunchtime is late, but they did come in at lunchtime and all of the information that is sought is information that should be at the fingertips of the administration. Um, they, they relate to our staff. Um, if you would like to ask your questions on notice and I'll go to the CEO. Sure. Um, Last week, the state government detailed a list of projects eligible for funding to stimulate economic activity during any recovered, recovery from the COVID-19 panic. These projects were published in the Advertiser newspaper. Could the administration advise which city of Adelaide projects are eligible for state funding? What is the total anticipated cost for each project? And what is the contribution required of the city of Adelaide? And will such amounts automatically be included in Council's 2021 budget? Through you, Lord Mayor. Look, I don't have that information to hand. I don't know if the directors there um, could assist. Um, Clinton, are you available to answer? Um, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, First of all, we need to just understand the state government detail that Councillor Martin's referring to, and then we're happy to provide a detailed response um, in due course. Well, Lord Mayor, a subsequent question. Was it correct that Whitmore Square and one other project were mentioned in the advertise? Is that the understanding of the administration? Through you, Lord Mayor, if you're referring to the P&D funding, Councillor Martin, that would be correct. Thank you. And what was the second project? Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, you just mentioned the second project, Councillor Martin. What, I, which one do you mean? Uh, there were two, as I understood it. Whitmore Square and what was the other one? I'm genuinely asking. In the advertiser article? Yes. I don't have that in front of me, sorry, Councillor. No, that's all right. Uh, I know uh, circulation is falling at the advertiser. Um, and my next uh, question on notice is COVID real rule relaxation. Um, and if the administration could, uh, there we go, I can see it now. In the wake of the relaxation of federal and state guidelines for physical distancing, could the administration advise one what is the policy for locations from which and the conditions under which our staff will be required to work? And has there been or will there be genuine consultation with the Australian Services Union? Um, I'll hold, uh, well, 
the administration answers that if you like. So I will go to the CEO, CEO. Yes, very Lord Mayor. Look, I'll need to take that on notice. Happy to provide a response, but I want it to be an informed response. Thank you. Okay. Um, could the CEO hazard a guess about whether we might have talked to the union about the work conditions? Just a guess will do. Well, man, look, I'll take it on notice. Thank you. I want to provide you with a detailed response. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and under what conditions and when will council facilities, including town hall, libraries, community centres and the aquatic centre reopen? Three, Lord Mayor, same answer, please. Well, look, Lord Mayor, I, I, I uh, do appreciate the administration when they can help us. I, I had an email this afternoon from Secra, who seems to know of the opening of the libraries. Um, why our community knows these things, but we don't? That is a question. Uh, CEO, I'm, I'm in your hands. These are questions of the administration, so. Yeah, no, three Lord Mayor, I might ask um, Claire, are you available to provide any update? Are you on mission, Claire? Um, I'm not aware of the um, final approach for the libraries. Um, so I haven't seen any communication from us to SECRA. If SECRA has comms, um, my understanding is our incident management team's meeting in the morning and finalising arrangements for those um, areas. So um, I'm not sure what Councillor Martin has, but I certainly haven't seen it, authorised it um, or been informed. Okay, oh, well, look, uh, Secra sent us an email saying that uh, the library in their area was opening on the 16th, which surprised me by a mask. Uh, and the third question is um, if and when it is expected any of the council's remaining six scheduled voting meetings for the rest of this year, 2020, uh, will be at, at Town Hall and at which location? CEO? Yeah, three Lord Mayor, the same applies. These are three important questions, I don't deny. I would like to provide Council with some quality advice. I'll commit to do that offline and I'll send it through to Council members as soon as I've got the accurate information. But I do recognise the importance of the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Martin. I actually have uh, Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran, I'm just checking that there was a question without notice. Councillor Moran? I'd like to request it by mistake, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I have Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, sorry, I just can't see you because there we go. Deputy Lord Mayor. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Um, uh, just a quick question uh, of the administration relating to marketing and comms. Um, what, if any, City of Adelaide promotion is planned for the upcoming Ida Hobbit? on Sunday the 17th of May and of course Ida Hobbit is the International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biophobia. I will go to the CEO. CEO, are you able to? No, three Lord Mayor, I'm not aware of that. Um, Ian Hill might be able to answer for us. Director Hill, are you there? Through the Lord Mayor, I'm not fully across the detail, Deputy Lord Mayor, but I imagine would be uh, communicating the event through a range of our online channels, uh, particularly website, and uh, a range of the um, digital channels that we have, uh, covering about 120 odd thousand people through those, and about 1.5 million people unique people look at our website. But I'll come back to you tomorrow with a bit more detail. But I imagine um, an online presence and uh, promotion of the event would uh, would be what we'd be looking at. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Kouros. Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have a question uh, without notice. Um, I did submit it quite late. Um, so I hope that's, I, I don't expect an answer, but if you want, it can be provided um, to us. Uh, it says, can administration please provide an update of the motion brought forward by Hassam Abiyad on March, in March, 2019, asking for council to implement a UPARC ticket validation 
for the businesses in the city of Adelaide. The concept is to give businesses the ability to offer free parking when a customer spends in their business. I'm just wondering if we can have an update on that motion because it would really support the businesses during this, um, obviously during this recovery period. Yeah, three, Lord, we're happy to take that on notice. Um, there is a, a report dealing with progress of motions from council members. So we'll review that and again, provide an update to council members. Okay, so my screen has just changed again. Just a moment. I uh, had uh, Councillor Sims. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Further to um, the Deputy uh, Lord Mayor's question. Lord Mayor, I wonder whether you would consider uh, flying the pride flag outside of uh, Town Hall for the Ida Hobbit Day. Um, is that something uh, that you would be open to? So usually with the flying of the flag, uh, that comes in and is reviewed by civics. So if um, if you do know the organisers who I don't, they, if they can simply send uh, something through and then we can actually consider that and take it through. I'm not sure if we've uh, on the time frame of that, but we'll see what we can do. Okay, thanks Lord Thank Mayor. Thank you. Um, and I have Councillor Martin, Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, in reference to uh, 13.1, um, which I wasn't able to read, in response to my question, uh, could the administration advise tenants currently working on business plans if the um, $4 million uh, rent waiver uh, to apply um, um, to uh, businesses from April to June, council-owned businesses, um, is that the only measure um, that is to be uh, considered? And I, I wish to ask, um, uh, sub to that, is it expected that tenants will be required to provide, as it's suggested at 13.3 uh, or 3.3, .3, uh, that they must hand over uh, their books to show how they're doing? Is, is that uh, the criteria that's going to be applied to businesses in central market and so on, or to get a uh, rent consideration? I will go to the CEO. Um, CEO? Yeah, three, Lord Mayor. We have provided a, a response to the question, first of all. Second of all, um, if there's supplementary questions, I'm happy to take them, preferably offline, so that we can have some time to provide you quality advice. However, if you wish to pursue Lord Mayor, I'm happy to ask uh, Tom McCready to, um, to provide an update. Uh, if, if perhaps Tom could make a comment, and if not, we will also add that to the provision of the other questions without notice that have been asked this evening, um, that we can distribute to uh, members uh, tomorrow. Uh, Tom. Yep, through you, Lord Mayor, uh, in response to Councillor Martin's request, Firstly, the, the mandated code as set up by the federal government talks to various measures in regards to rent relief. Um, typically, it talks to uh, checking that uh, businesses are going through financial hardship. But as uh, elected members would be aware, um, through council's resolution, we turned this around very quickly. So we have not assessed any of our tenants' books. We offered the, the rent uh, support to all our tenants um, and we also offered it as a waiver, not as a deferral, which is uh, different to what other organisations and the federal government have said in regards to actually a deferral. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be our intent to, to go through people's books because it's quite obvious for us what businesses are open and what businesses aren't. Um, however, in saying that, um, if we get any comments or any requests, particularly from uh, bodies outside of what qualifies as small to medium enterprises, and that has happened. We have asked them to produce their books, and we're talking about bigger businesses than small business, um, but certainly haven't approached small businesses with that sort of tech. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Councillor Martin? Yeah, look further to that. And uh, these questions come from the administration's response. So I'm not uh, uh, traversing brand new ground. They mentioned at 3.2 um, business eligibility for JobKeeper payments as a condition of the federal guidelines leading to rate assistance. It, is that what the administration is applying 
or, or suggesting it might apply to some of the business. That is to say, if you're getting a JobKeeper allowance, your turnover has to have declined by 30%, and then you can talk to us about a rent waiver or deferral. Is, is that what they're trying to imply? Um, Tom, are you... Sorry. Yep. Through you, Lord Mayor, in response to Councillor Martin's questions, no, it isn't. What is referenced within uh, three is actually the current conditions have been applied by the federal government in regards to the mandatory code. However, as Landlord Council has chosen to go further than that, in regards to a 100% uh, lease or rent dispensation. Um, and we have not considered JobKeeper or any other measures other than providing support to small business during tough times. Um, it wouldn't be our intent to look at that. However, the only reference point which is valid is the $50 million, because that is the determination or part of the determination what qualifies a business sitting outside the small to medium uh, size enterprise. Thank you, members. Uh, Councillor Martin. Oh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I did want uh, to ask the administration, given that in its answer at 13.1, it says it will bring the matter of a continuation of a waiver or deferral of rates to council on uh, July the 14th, two weeks after those payments are due. Could the administration consider bringing this to us in June for the benefit of our tenants rather than making them wait until July when the rent period has begun and they may or may not want to make decisions about whether they continue to trade or not? CEO, did you wish to answer that? Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor. Look, we're happy to look at the dates to make sure it's as convenient as possible. So we will investigate that. Thank you. Members, with that, we will go to uh, item number 15, which is motions on notice. One moment. Sorry, I need to mute a few. There we go. Uh, we have 15.1, uh, Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I move um, the motion standing in my name that Council recognises the potential for increased bikeways in the city to boost community health and wellbeing and stimulate the local economy as part of the coronavirus recovery, request federal government funding for a citywide bike network, and request that administration investigate short-term measures to accommodate additional cycling on city streets, including the establishment of pop-up bike lanes. Okay. I seek a I have Councillor Donovan as your seconder, so if you'd like to speak, uh, Councillor Sims, thank you. Thanks very much, Lord Mayor. Uh, well, Lord Mayor and fellow councillors, um, across the world we're seeing lots of cities uh, dealing with the implications of the coronavirus pandemic, looking at how they can open uh, their city streets up to people, recognising that more and more people are going to be cycling and walking at this time, um, because they're less likely to want to take public transport. And what we should be doing is encouraging um, cycling and walking at this time, whilst also ensuring um, that social distance is, um, is being complied with too. And that's why um, the idea of looking at pop-up bikeways or temporary bikeways, I think is a really good one. Um, this is something that's being looked at in cities right across the world, Paris, Berlin, Milan, London, New York, Melbourne, Sydney have all um, moved to open pop-up bikeways. And I know uh, Cycling SA has uh, proposed the idea of opening up uh, left lanes of arterial roads as a temporary activation. One thing we could maybe look at, Lord Mayor, is some of the potential sites for the East-West Bikeway. We've had some discussions at, at a council level around what some of the locations may be and I know that different members have different views on that. I think there's a great opportunity for us to say why don't we trial some potential sites for the bikeway in a temporary activation way and see what kind of um, response they get from the community. So there's some really easy things that we can do to um, take action to encourage uh, cycling and, and that's what I'm proposing at this time. 
But I'm also proposing that we seek federal government funding for the citywide uh, bike network. And the federal government have talked about wanting to provide funding for local councils. I know a number of councils around the country are seeking funding from them for uh, bike paths and infrastructure. And I think it makes sense for Adelaide to do that. The um, bikeway uh, or Adelaide's approach to bikeways was always meant to be grounded in a, a comprehensive bike network. And there's lots of work that still needs to be done there. There's lots of work that administration has done over the last few years. And so some of those projects may well be shovel ready or require some additional government funding to get them over the line. And this is an opportunity for us to do that. So there's the, the longer term piece in terms of federal government funding um, and also the short term activations to really um, make the uh, to really respond to the change of, um, of community and need in terms of transport at this time. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, Councillor Donovan. I reserve my right. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. I have Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you. Right on. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, yeah, look, I'm uh, I broadly uh, I'm very supportive of this, um, just with a minor amendment that I'd like to propose. Have you got that? Would you like to read your minor amendment out yeah, so, so we can capture that? One as is, two as is, uh, delete three. And uh, and replace it with um, it would be I think the formatting is a bit skewed with on this, but um, it would be that council acknowledges. Yes, uh, it doesn't appear straight away. And as long as you read slowly, it's just- Oh, that's right. Oh, I'm not, sorry, I'm not actually delay. looking at the screen. Just um, okay. yeah, let me know. Uh, that, that council acknowledges its commitment to- Yes. A city-wide bikeway network. Yep. Connected to the Adelaide metropolitan area. Yep. And includes this in the above correspondence. In the above correspondence? Yeah, being, being the letter yep. that yep. you were right. Yeah, yep. that's right. Sorry, just making sure I heard you. Um, I will look for a seconder for that um, amendment. Sorry, thank you, Councillor Canal. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak to that? Uh, just briefly, um, I think it's always good for us to go looking at alternative revenue streams because we know how expensive um, uh, separated bikeways are and, and, uh, and other parts of that. Um, bikeway network. I think there's some real potential here, um, uh, but I wouldn't want to rush into um, uh, rush into pop up lanes because what's really going to assist our recovery is helping uh, people get into the city, uh, helping and most people come into the city by car and also by public transport as well. And I also want to wouldn't want to disadvantage buses full of people um, uh, who are on public transport getting to work or coming into. The What's really going to get our recovery going is making sure we are as accessible as possible to the largest number of people and the largest number of people are car users. Now there's lots that we can and should be doing uh, to make the commute safer for cyclists and more accessible for that mode of transport and other similar modes of transport, um, whether they be personal mobility devices such as um, and what have you. Um, uh, but if we want to get our businesses going, our businesses need customers and their customers predominantly drive in and they come in in their car and those cars require lanes. Uh, those lanes are for cars, they are not for bikes. That's what they're intended for, that's why they were built and that's how we should use them. I have Councillor Canal. did you wish to speak? Reserve. Thank you, I have uh, Councillor Kerr. Uh, thanks Lord Mayor, look, um, look I, I 
Well, support the amendment. Um, I think I do think that the administration, the administration ought to reflect on uh, setting the precedent uh, through splash of having a pop up bike lane. Um, I think that was, uh, to put it lightly, misguided. Um, I think that uh, it's beyond cheeky to call something a pop up uh, when what you're really doing is circumventing the chamber and installing uh, infrastructure. Um, there's plenty of things we could do and put the word pop up in front of them. We could have a pop up rates reduction uh, to help businesses, for example. So I think that's worth uh, the administration reflecting on because this is what you're going to get uh, if you do undertake that kind of cheeky behavior. Um, uh, I, I think it's a, um, it would be a mistake to, to have gone down the pop-up path. We, our business, our commercial businesses are needless uh, to say, struggling beyond belief right now. And it would have sent a message to them that we were essentially uh, almost taking advantage of the situation. They would say, listen, we uh, have had a problem before COVID of a lack of people coming into the city to spend money, uh, predominantly as, count as the Deputy Lord Mayor, predominantly by car, because that is the predominant uh, form of transport into the city. Uh, and uh, they'll say, and now you're gonna send the message out, you're gonna make it even more difficult uh, for people to come in, find a park and, uh, and, and purchase goods. We have got to deal with the perception issue of parking. There is a perception, it may not be warranted, but there is a perception that the city is difficult to drive into and difficult to get a park. And it doesn't matter what you think about cars. You may think that they are uh, Satan's uh, carriages. I, I, I don't really care. Um, that is a fact of life. And until we deal with that problem, uh, we are not going to see increased numbers of patronage in our city businesses. It is as simple uh, as that. So uh, with that in mind, I, as I do support uh, 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 cycling in general, um, what I don't want to see is any derogation of our city businesses uh, confidence in conducting business with uh, patronage coming in and finding a, a park easily. Sorry, thank you, Councillor Kerra. Uh, I have got Councillor Abraham today, then I have you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Abraham today, did you wish to speak? Sorry, Lord Mayor, I, my hand must have still been up from uh, seconding the uh, the amendment, so nothing That's to okay. say at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, I'm disappointed um, by this uh, amendment. Um, as per usual, there was no discussion with me uh, prior to the meeting. Um, had there been, I would have um, expressed my alarm at removing the main focus of um, the motion, which was to look at what we could do in terms of temporary activation. Um, and, you know, Lord Mayor, Councillor Hyde says that we shouldn't be rushing into this. Well, there's really no risk of that. Um, it really, council couldn't go slower on the bikeways if it tried, but the wheels have been spinning, but there's been no activity for years and years. So the idea that suggesting that we um, activate uh, streets that are not being um, used to the same extent as they are traditionally at the moment and have a temporary activation, um, that's hardly some sort of radical, uh, fast moving thing. It would bring Adelaide into line with world-class cities. Um, that are doing this and that are recognising that more and more people are cycling because of the, the pandemic, recognising that um, the city needs to accommodate that. Um, and I think it's a great shame if Adelaide is not going to rise to that challenge and to do that. As I said, it would have been a very good opportunity for us to trial some of the, uh, the pathways that we've talked about as potential sites for, say, the East West Bikeway. Um, it could have been a great opportunity for us to say, OK, let's roll out a temporary bike network and see how it's received and get a bit of um, intel from the community around that. Um, I think it would have sent a very strong message to the community that we are being um, fast and responsive um, in terms of dealing with the implications of the coronavirus pandemic. And it also is something that wouldn't have been very costly. Um, so I'd urge members not to support the amendment um, and to support the substantive so that we can both ask for federal government funding to get this uh, project completed, but so that we can also get something happening in the short term because our community are really calling out for that. They're wanting leadership from this council, not more backpedalling and spinning of the wheels. 
Thank you, Councillor Sims. I have Councillor Ho. Just one moment, Councillor Ho, just un unmute you. There we go, Councillor Ho. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, well, members, like, I actually, I mean, looking at the original motion moved by Councillor Sims, I actually like the idea, but I mean, my, I mean, because like the pandemic has changed like people's life and even people like myself have considered, I mean, to find a way to ride a bike from my home to the city. But I mean, look, like we, we spent the last one and a half an hour talking about the financial position we are currently in at the moment and i think we should set really save our resource and uh, push it for the permanent dedicated bikeway instead of any pop-up things that might not last for long and that is, i mean i keep I, I remember like in the previous meetings like councillor donovan was very upset and calling that the dedicated byway is going to be a never never i i, I actually disagree with it i i think we should have pushed for the dedicated byway within our turn all right. Hence, we need to save all the resources we could save and push for it. And that's why I don't, I don't support the pop-up by the way, but I support the other two items. Hence, I will support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ho. Councillor Martin. Yes, uh, Lord Mayor. Look, I support pop-ups. Um, I'd like to see some pop-up common sense uh, being on council. I'd like to see some pop-up coherent thought on council. I'd like to hear pop up coherent processes um, uh, instead of integral brain flips, pop ups are fine. Let's have more of them here on this council. And may I say, uh, Lord, I, this, this stuff drives me nuts. Uh, fundamentally, this council is here to make sure that there is safe access to this city. People who are driving cars, for people who are riding bikes, for people who are walking not one at the expense of the other. And every time I look at our part complete north-south bikeway, every time I look at it, I remember the commitment that we gave to the Botanic High School, who was contemplating setting up the first high school that would make bikes, not cars. And talking about the bikeway, north-south would provide safe access for kids. We haven't delivered, kids are at risk, are constantly putting their bikes in front of motor vehicles because we honoured our commitment to provide a safe access to this city and a safe departure for not only kids but for anyone on the bike, just as we have the same responsibility to pedestrians and to the drivers of vehicles. And if those who push this claptrap about car is king and just substitute it with safety is king, would come to an entirely different conclusion. Please stop it, you're driving me nuts. Thank you. I had Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I would just note that the New South Wales government is distributing $15 million for grants of this nature. So $100,000 for short-term projects, uh, that's temporary bikeways, a million dollars for longer term projects. The city of Melbourne is installing 12 kilometres of temporary bikeways. And why are they doing that? Because in the short term, it's space reallocation. Why would we not do it? For the previous points that have been made, there is no reason right now why the city is empty to maintain the current usage of space. The streets and the parking is not being utilised. It is so far from capacity, why would we not, in the short term at the very least, have a reuse of the space that optimises and provides alternate safe alternatives to other street users? To the Deputy Lord Mayor's point, laughable, once again, around uh, low numbers of, of uh, cyclists compared to uh, people driving. Of course there are lower numbers of people on bikes, because there's no safe, connected, convenient bikeway. There's no people traveling by tram to Hutt Street either, because there's no tram on Hutt Street. So why would we expect there to be bikes and, and people traveling by bike on a, a unsafe road where there's no network? So let's actually look to the science, look to all of the abundant evidence that pervades and consider why there are smaller numbers of, of people on bikes, because we don't have a safe, connected, separated 
convenient way for them to travel. If we actually want to facilitate people to use alternate forms of transport, we need to provide that. So unsurprising, completely unsurprising that this is not being supported, um, but onwards we go. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Um, just a few comments from me. Obviously, the city access strategy is a piece of work that hopefully will provide us with an integrated uh, transport strategy that looks at all forms of transport, uh, which we do have to provide for our city. Uh, Councillor Kerra, the, the whole idea of Splash is actually to do pop-ups and test and trial new ideas. And that was done on Cycle to Work Day. So it was done for a very specific reason on a specific day, as opposed to being there for as a permanent piece of infrastructure. Um, I, I do actually think that um, we, we collectively want to deliver the cycle way and we collectively want to deliver it in this term. And I'm really hoping that we actually get to that and that decision very soon. Uh, but that is not what we're discussing tonight. So I'm going to go back to Councillor Sims to sum up. Uh, uh, Lord Mayor, I think it's Councillor Hyde who is summing up on his amendment. And You are absolutely correct. Deputy Lord Mayor, my, my apologies. I've got two pieces of paper in front of me. Deputy Lord Mayor. That's right. If Rob wants to put my arguments for me, that's... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll go to you to sum up. Um, uh... Well, I, you know, I'm just perplexed, Lord Mayor, because um, I thought we were going to use all the space on the roads to put tables and chairs out there for outdoor dining. So, Deputy Lord Mayor, we're talking. Well, no, I, that's what I, legitimately I've got to save the space. Otherwise, we can't possibly fit everyone in. Um, God knows what will happen to the cars. Uh, we can just turn them away right at the uh, at the parklands, turn them away at the entrance to the city of Adelaide, which is, I think, the secret agenda here, Lord Mayor, isn't it? Um, uh, so, look, uh, obviously, um, the amendment's there, the arguments have been fleshed out, very happy to seek funding, very happy to go for permanent separated bikeways with lovely infrastructure, um, uh, but not this one. We need people coming into the city, we need them driving in, uh, we need them driving their families in uh, to come and spend money in our shops and in, in our restaurants um, uh, and all those other lovely things they do when they're enjoying our city, which hopefully, as we ease restrictions, uh, will be sooner rather than later. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Members will now go to the vote. Those in favour, by show of hands. Those against, by show of hands. That is carried. That becomes a substantive. Hello, Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims. Calling a division on the amendment, Lord Mayor. Council members, a division has been called on the amendment. Would all those in favour of the amendment please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called. Councillor Canole, Councillor Ho, Councillor Moran, Councillor Kuros, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Abraham today and Councillor Kira. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now go to, uh, unless anyone else wants to speak, I'll go to Councillor Sims to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I will um, support the uh, substantive because um, I do welcome... I can't welcome... hear you, though I have unmuted you. Can you hear me oh, now, Lord sorry. Mayor? No, I've got you. Oh, right. Um, Lord Mayor, I will um, support the substantive. Uh, naturally, I'm disappointed that Council once again has squibbed on an opportunity for uh, short-term bikeways and immediate action on this. Um, it's being pushed off down the road once again. However, I do welcome the support for uh, seeking federal funding. Um, there are opportunities for federal government support at this time, and I hope that council can take that opportunity and get something happening when it comes to cycling in our city. And Lord Mayor, I do need to say some of the arguments that have been made here are factually incorrect. It is not true that more bikeways damage the interests of businesses in the city. In fact, Quite the contrary is true. And studies that have been undertaken internationally, Lord Mayor, have demonstrated that where there is cycling infrastructure, there is an uptick in business activity. And that's well documented. So this kind of cult of the car and this idea that we need to turn Adelaide into you know, a city in a giant car park, um, I think is uh, really short-term thinking. 
Um, and uh, we've got to do a lot better than this if we're going to respond to the challenge of COVID-19 and if we're going to beat the climate crisis that grips our nation and indeed the world. So time for the City Council to step up. Let's get some support from the federal government, but let's also, you know, drop some of this stale um, thinking. It's really 20th century stuff and we've got to be better than this. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Thank you, members. Uh, I go to item 15.2 on the agenda, Councillor Martin. Oh, sorry, Councillor Kouros, did you? Councillor Kouros? I wanted a division on that one, so but is it too late now? You moved too fast. Uh, I think I've already called the next number. Um, no, I'm getting a, a shake of the head. Sorry, Councillor. Okay, what, so do you call a division what do you prefer, hand or raise the arm? Uh, just one moment. Thank you, Councillor. Um, if, uh, if members can use the raise hand button, uh, if they're going to call a division, that would be handy. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's... So apologies, Councillor Kouros, but I'd already called the next item. Um, Councillor Martin, 15.2. Uh, Thank you, Lord Mayor. I um, have a couple of questions first. Do you wish me to put this and ask for a seconder? Uh, yes, I will ask you to put that and ask for a seconder. So Councillor Sims, sorry, I'm gonna ask you to use your, your electronic hand, but I've got you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Martin. Um, uh, before I uh, go to discussion, Lord Mayor, a couple of questions. The notes suggest that you and the Deputy CEO discussed this matter with SAPOL. Uh, could you advise, was this the Commissioner or one of the Deputy Commissioners? Uh, yes, I, it was the Assistant Commissioner and it was also the, uh, the local um, uh, task force that we know as in... Um, uh, Superintendent Craig Wall and also uh, Matt Nairn. Okay, but not with the Commissioner? Uh, no, with the Assistant Commissioner. Uh, oh, there are about nine of those. Yes, so, that is correct. So one of them, yep, okay. Um, uh, and may I also ask, um, was it your office or the administration which changed the title of the motion from parking for SAPOL and other essential workers to on-street parking? I will ask the CEO. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor, when we receive motions, um, we rely upon the motions themselves containing the description of the item, and we provide a very basic um, title for each, each, each matter that is listed. Okay. Uh, does the administration understand that adding the words on-street before parking change the nature of the motion? Three, Lord Mayor, wouldn't have changed the nature of the motion because the motion was unaffected. Uh, but uh, uh, the uh, parking allows for the consideration of on and off street. If the word, words on street are added, it reduces the discussion to just that. Three, Lord Mayor, I don't agree. I think um, the motion was tabled as provided to the administration. It's just merely the title of the agenda item. That's all it was. All right, so uh, is the administration and everyone else happy to understand that this is about parking, including on and off street, even though the administration has added the word on street? I think that's a yes. Okay, that's great. Okay. All right, um, look, uh, this, uh, this motion, um, and I, I do ask people just to assess this on its merits, uh, I am going to play this with a straight bat. I hope you will as well. Um, it is uh, a request uh, backed up by a letter from the uh, South Australian uh, Police Association requesting us to consider providing parking arrangements uh, for SAPOL uh, staff and their private vehicles 
on the streets or off street um, as a consequence of a motion that was approved by the council to look at a similar measure for medical staff dealing with COVID-19. Um, uh, they are asking uh, not because uh, they want a, you know, a, a free gift from the city. It, it's about um, uh, protecting the health of uh, police. Um, as you probably understand from reading uh, the papers and the letters that have been sent to you, most police travel to work by public transport. And there is a great fear within uh, SAPOL that members may contract the virus by using public transport. Um, this, uh, rather than enhancing the chances of contracting the virus, uh, would allow police members to travel to the city in their own vehicle and park uh, without the possibility of uh, coming into contact with somebody who may have the virus. And uh, it is important to us uh, SAPOL are working not only to keep us safe, but to deal with the possibility of any lawlessness that arises out of um, any spread of the virus that causes civil unrest. Now, already uh, one officer uh, has uh, been uh, diagnosed as carrying the virus. That led to the self-isolation of about 100 police officers. And you can start to see the scale of the problems if you imagine that that was replicated two or three times. So it would have a substantial impact on policing in South Australia if a group of officers became infected and were not able to go about their duties. Now, I know that uh, people will say, oh, well, look, things are better and um, things aren't so bad anymore. We're getting back to phase one, phase two. Um, let me tell you, it is the view of emergency services in uh, South Australia that they are not stepping on, that they need to be prepared to deal with this if anything happens, that there is a conniption and uh, the virus begins to spread again. Now, um, I'm asking that people uh, consider um, in uh, looking at this measure whether we couldn't perhaps allow parking either on street or in our U parks subject to uh, the investigation of the administration. And I don't need to tell you, our U parks are severely affected by uh, the coronavirus outbreak. Um, they have, and it is plain for everybody to see, I'm not divulging confidential information, they are plainly empty, half empty, not used to the extent that they were. Now, um, we could do this, and I would suggest to the Sorry, administration... Councillor, the time has, has, um, has gone. May I have one minute, Lord Mayor? Uh, I'll look at the chamber. I need a show of hands, members. One minute. Thank you. Yes, Councillor. Thank you. Um, uh, we could, if we uh, ask the administration to have a look at this, ask them also to look at linking this measure to the emergency declaration. Um, and as everybody knows, the declaration which is made by the government is due to expire at the end of this month. It is expected it will be renewed for a further month, but by linking this measure to the emergency declaration, it would apply specifically for the period when there is this uh, coronavirus watch uh, that's currently on. Uh, and then at the end of the expiry of the emergency declaration, it would lapse. So look, I would ask you uh, to consider this carefully. And, and I do want to say, I want to take the opportunity, by the way, of uh, thanking SAPOL um, for the work that their members have done over the last couple of months in keeping us safe, uh, in monitoring the lockdowns that have occurred in hotels and generally ensuring that this community functions well. And look, I commend this to you. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Sims as the seconder. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I reserve my right. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Moran, Clara and Kuros. Councillor Moran. Oh, yes, I have put my hand up to second it. But uh, just to support this motion, I consider police like nurses and doctors uh, part of our front line. 
we're lucky here, it's not too serious, but we've got plenty of car parks. And I assume that um, off street car parks are included in this. And I disagree with the CEO, that does change the meaning. Um, we've got plenty to spare. I can understand their nervousness. If all our police get sick, we're, we're in trouble. So they are essential workers. We were in New York. Uh, they would be considered first by us. And it's a, it would be a great offence to our brave police officers to say, you're not as good as nurses, you're not as good as doctors, you're not first responders, we don't care. Thank you, Councillor Moran. I have Councillor Kerra. Councillor Kerra, there we go. One moment, sorry. Sorry, Councillor Kerra, it's not unmuting for me. Yeah, do you want to have a try, Jenny? Sorry. I, I've done it my end. Um, I just think it's cute that uh, Councillor Martin uh, wants to play this with the straight bat. I like the acknowledgement uh, of his that he plays nothing else for the straight bat. Councillor um, Kerra, we're speaking it, to the motion, let please. It, let, it be, uh, let, let, it be, let it be known that Councillor Martin believes that public transport is a basis for the spreading of deadly viruses as opposed to private transport. Uh, uh, I have Councillor Kouros. Thank you. I have some questions, if that's OK. Um, in the conversations that um, we've had with SAPOL, did they express the need for parking for the police officers? Have Sa SAPOL themselves have said it? Where has this request come from? So the, the request has come from the union. Um, in the conversations and the meeting that I had with SAPOL, uh, they were not asking for uh, for free parking, they actually were, uh, they in fact uh, commended us on the U Park Plus and quite a number of the members have actually joined the U Park Plus, um, which enabled a whole lot of staff to actually um, use that parking. Um, uh, and um, so that, so it's also um, what I was trying to understand is what uh, was the quantity, what was the operational requirement um, and uh, which Councillor Martin has actually mentioned one, what was the trigger to start and stop? So if we did this, how would we um, actually, uh, we, at what point do, do, do we not have parking permits for them? Um, uh, so that was, that was the main conversation that I had with SAIPOL. So do they have a request or a number in mind of how many that they need? Uh, they, ha they haven't been uh, specific other than there are 1,500, I believe, uh, police that work in the CBD. Um, uh, they were obviously of the opinion that we had given the free parking to the nurses that were frontline at the RAH, um, but that was, of course, the Premier through the state government. Right. Have uh, the unions approached the state government in regards to their request? Are they only asking the City of Adelaide? for the ratepayers to pay for this? Um, I am unsure if they, I actually don't know if they have, um, um, and I haven't had a conversation with Minister Wingard either. Okay, and sorry, I've just got so many questions in regard to this, but um, had, has administration received a request from the fire brigade, ambulance workers um, for um, off-street parking? Free off -street I would have go to the CEO on that one in terms of um, ambulance and fire brigade. I, I'm not aware of anything that's coming to my office. CEO? That's really well. Could you just repeat the question, please, Councillor Kills? I'm asking if the administration has received any requests from um, the fire brigade or ambulance, ambulance crew workers or anything like that that are stationed in the city for free parking. Yeah, through the Lord Mayor. And as, as the Lord Mayor said, no, I haven't received anything from through my office. So this request has only come through from the unions. SAPOL hasn't, we haven't received any requests from the fire brigade. We haven't received any requests from the ambulance workers. So basically we're looking at um, a, a, a concept that um, we finding it very difficult for the ratepayers to pay for the burden to implement into the city of Adelaide. Um, 
I, I feel for them, I can understand their fears of catching public transport because it's everyone's fear. It's, it's everyone that works in the city that commutes into the city or commutes for work. It's a fear for everybody catching public transport, but we are assured by our state government that they are cleaned regularly and that they are sanitised and that they're doing their best to um, maintain this virus um, uh, on the, on through, at, you know, in, on the public transport. So, um, the, obviously, the fear is lesser now with the less amount of uh, cases coming through. Um, and I understand also with the nurses, they've actually direct contact with people with, um, with the virus. And there was support from the state government in regards to, um, uh, you know, their off requiring parking was met with conjunction with the state government. So this is a whole different body of work that we're looking here. And it's a very complex um, a request that Councillor Martin is asking for, and I understand he's trying to get his feel good votes out there, but I think that, um, you know, buying your feel good votes comes with consequences. Yeah. And um, I just don't think that at the moment, if no one is really asking um, for it, then I don't understand the reason to implement it. So um, I, I, I don't think I could vote for this. Thank you, Councillor. Kara, I have Deputy Lord Mayor. Sorry, I've just that. Oh, sorry. There we go, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, just a question, a few questions. Um, uh, but the first one is: Could the administration detail how many car parks the Police Association are asking for? I'll go to. Oh. Uh, sorry, I'll just go to. There we go. Uh, Director Mottler. Um, in the discussions yesterday, um, as the Lord Mayor's already indicated, um, various different uh, functions um, uh, that the police undertake here in the city were discussed. Um, we have received a separate uh, request uh, late today, which I haven't had a chance to go through, but from memory, um, the two areas in particular um, that the um, union were asking us to consider was the, um, I think it was the organised crime branch. So they're the section that, that deal with drug laboratories. So they're a very small team that deal in very specialised work. Um, and so um, if someone within that um, facility um, got COVID, then obviously it could take out um, the whole team. So that was of concern. Um, and also, I think it was the forensics branch as well. So um, we had asked um, uh, the uh, representative um, to just confirm which um, parts of, of the police um, were more at risk than others, and then to come back to us with some numbers. So um, I haven't had a chance to go over the correspondence that was received today. Um, so I can't actually give you that number. Okay, but, but at, at, out of those teams, was it... Um... Was there a specific request around a, a team of police officers, perhaps, that are that are uh, dealing with people that have COVID nineteen, that are going to them and having contact with them? Um, not necessarily, because even officers um, on the street, face to face, um, you know, will be at um, potential risk um, if. Uh, they come into contact um, with uh, someone, you know, similar to our staff as well. So anyone that's um, dealing with um, people face to face for any period of time could potentially be at risk. Do our staff get any free parking in the city? Is there any sort of offer on like that on the table for our employees? <laughs> Sorry again, could you repeat that question, please? Uh, the, the question was, the question was, are there any sort of uh, free parking arrangements in place for our own employees who deal with people in person and face to face or in the public, public team, for example? You part plus, so we've been promoting and making sure any staff that are required over this period of time, um, you know, are aware of you part plus. Yeah, okay, but it's not free. No. Uh, it's the $8 you part. Oh, yeah, 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 correct. 
Um, uh, and the other thing is, is because um, it wasn't elaborated on in the comment, is the administration aware of any financial hardship um, that SAPOL officers might be facing that would make it uh, unfeasible, unworkable for them to pay the $8 fee for UPark Plus? I can't unmute. Sorry, there we go. Not that I'm aware of. So, so it hasn't been raised by the police association. No. No. Okay. Um, uh, I think that concludes my questions then. But I'll just make a, a very quick comment, just for one minute. Um, uh, it appears that uh, this uh, request has come from the police association of South Australia. It has not come from SAPOL. It hasn't come from the police officers themselves. It's um, uh, come from their union. And like many unions at the moment, I think they're struggling to find relevance um, and have found us as a, as a big juicy target and parking as a, as a media, media savvy sort of play to make. And as, as always, when we have third parties that gang up on the city of Adelaide and, and uh, want to have a go at us, there are naturally detractors um, in our chamber that uh, are more than happy to team up with them um, if it means hurting uh, the city. But uh, look, Deputy I, I Lord will Mayor, say that please. this, this, well, it's actually happened. No, come on, talk to, the, talk to the talk to the item in front of us, please. But, but it hasn't come from SAPOL. We haven't had a request from, um, we have not had a request from uh, the Fireys or the Ambos. We haven't had any such request. And of course, we all hold them in, in great esteem and we appreciate the work that they do. Um, uh, but uh, they they haven't had any requests come through or or even from their unions for that matter um, because they know better than to ask for something that does not need to be given for something that is not necessary. Uh, SAPOL officers, um, I would expect, are, are still on full remuneration and certainly it hasn't been indicated that they're not in any discussions and I would have thought that's the first thing the union would raise. Um, so they, as government employees, are probably some of the only people left in the state um, untouched by the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the economic uh, ruin that it is bringing on people. And as such, you know, uh, you know, I'm a public servant and I pump my money back into the local economy. I think other public servants should do the same now more than ever because we do have some job security and we are getting regular payments. I worry about the small businesses that aren't in that boat and have to fend for themselves. Um, I'd rather give free parking to them um, than to people who are still on the government payroll. Uh, this is not necessary. Where it is necessary, we've put arrangements in place with the state government um, at the request of them uh, and working with SA Health. And we have that arrangement which is ready to enliven or be enlivened where it's necessary um, to serve the nurses and the critical health care workers at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, who are the people who are dealing with COVID-19 patients. Um, they are the only people uh, really directly dealing with them in a face-to-face -face, um, manner. Of course, uh, there were no new cases reported today. Um, and as I understand it, uh, as I'm reliably informed um, uh, by reading the advertiser, there is only one patient in hospital. Uh, touch wood. There is only one patient in hospital. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just perplexed to see the need for this Lord Mayor. There, there is no need for it. Um, it's, a, it's an entirely constructed, entirely construction, constructed and fabricated uh, controversy. Uh, and we can vote this down. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I have Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims. Uh, Lord Mayor, what a load of nonsense we just heard from Councillor Hyde there. What an insulting attack on working people and their union. Now, I find it really baffling to hear members of council say, oh, well, if the request hasn't come from SAPOL, then let's not consider it. If it's come from the union, let's not consider it. Well, the union actually represents the interests of the workers Lord Mayor, and if employees are feeling unsafe and they are carrying out an essential service, arguably the most essential service in our city, that is keeping our community safe and healthy at this time, then I think we have an obligation to help them. And I'm really appalled by the attack that's been made on uh, the union. I think that is totally out of line from someone who is an office bearer of this council. Might I also say, Lord Mayor, if Councillor Hyde wants to talk about external bodies unduly influencing this council, maybe he should turn his focus on the property council, because let's face it, they exert a huge amount of influence over what happens here in Town Hall. 
And maybe if some members of this council paid a little less attention to big developers and vested interests and a bit more attention to the interests of workers and vulnerable people and the community, then we might not be in such a parlous situation. Thank you. I have Councillor Canal. Yes, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I mean, I do find it sad we need to have, have these sorts of these sorts of conversations actually occur because I don't think anybody has a particular attention of, of denigrating anyone. And we all should thank the, the police and all of the essential uh, service workers for what they do. And let us not forget, essential service worker is a whole gamut of people that are providing services from food through to security services as police do to the public. They're all at risk. They all have a certain level of, of uh, concern to make sure that they are you know, safe themselves in the context of, of this virus. And let us not forget, it is improving and we are doing really well. And I, I don't necessarily want to use that as any form of excuse, but if we look at the practical implications, we have 1,500 of them uh, uh, working in their administration as well as on the, on, the, on the ground over three shifts. The majority of them will be taking vehicles where appropriate. And uh, I am informed that, uh, I mean, they have had uh, a free public transport uh, for quite a long time uh, to be able to get into the city. So, and we are looking after the buses. And if the buses were not safe, we would have more people uh, having had COVID and we've been able to uh, link it back to that transporting on the, on the actual buses. Um, I do have other sorts of problems uh, and that is, it, it's, and it's, it stems a little bit, uh, if we uh, identify their vehicles as we must so that they're able to have that because you don't know where they're needing to park, et cetera, then we're identifying their vehicles, which is something special because it really nobody else has them other than ours. Um, and that could be a risk to the vehicle for those people who want to create mischief to uh, themselves if, if someone has some sort of vendetta and all these things could happen. I mean, they're, they are, they're possible, not necessarily probable. And also, I think, I mean, as we all do, all of us in, 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 whether we're in business or those who, are, who have teams of people that carry out uh, functions, uh, you know, for, for what every organization, we have a critical response plan. Now, any organization that puts all of their people on at the same time that carry out the same functions, put themselves at massive risk of not being able to do their, their, what they need to do. And even from our own administration to the, our, our authorities, they've split their teams up so that they're not in position to minimize, to, to impede their ability to, uh, to provide a service. So if I would assume that SAPOL has this plan in place and is segregating uh, their, their staffing accordingly so that they're able to have teams that can function independently of each other because bus is only one thing but the, the, we, they have all the other means by which people can catch things. And so many of them are inadvertent and, and all of a sudden it's, it's a, uh, when a 71 year old and oh, six weeks still has antibodies. And so, you know, there is a whole gamut of things that we need to worry about. And there should be basic processes in place for, for the organization itself to ensure that it's the services. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pennell. I have Councillor Donovan. Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, briefly, um, I was a little ambivalent on this one initially, but I think with the uh, additional clarification that it would be linked to the emergency declaration and the additional clarification of suggesting suggestions around the U Park and noting that, it, that this is uh, already uh, speaking to non-health related essential care workers. So there is a, a limiter on who we're talking about here. And it is looking at a scheme, it's not defining what that scheme would be. Um, with those things in mind, I will support this motion. And I would just note that it's fascinating listening to the contradictory arguments that have arisen um, in uh, this, this discussion compared to the previous discussions and week to week on motions with the same underlying rationale and premise um, and the arguments of convenience that pop up uh, yeah, um, interesting to listen to. Thank you, members. If there's no further speakers, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Councillor Martin? Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I am uh, disappointed to hear uh, so many reasons why we shouldn't do this. It, it is straightforward. Um, police officers receive as state employees free public transport to travel to and from work. 
The police association, which represents 60,000, is saying it is not safe uh, for people to travel on public transport and work in confined spaces. It would enhance their safety immeasurably if they drove. And in that context, they're asking, would we consider providing some kind of assistance to park for the duration of the emergency declaration? Now, these people are working on the front line. Um, they are doing much more than our staff uh, in terms of contact, face-to-face -face contact. Um, they have been, I remind everybody, on guard around the clock at several city hotels um, with people uh, quarantining. Um, they will be required uh, to go out into the streets to deal with any crime, any incident that occurs, regardless of whether there's a risk of COVID-19. And so uh, they are simply asking to limit the risk for the sake of insurance. Can you please agree to this measure for the short term? Um, there is, uh, let, let me assure Councillor Kouros, uh, there are no votes in this. Um, uh, there are uh, simply um, the concerns that any reasonable person would have for the safety of our frontline workers. And look, I, I do implore you, I know you disagree with me, all of you, about many things. This is one thing about which we ought to be solid. It is about providing support to those people on whom we rely in an emergency. And God, God hope we don't uh, need to rely on them in the next few months, but it would be good to know that if we need at any time to rely on our police to respond, that we have done the right thing and help them as much as we can. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, members, uh, to the vote, those in favour? Those against? No. Sorry, sorry, members. I'm actually going to ask you to do that vote again. And um, please you leave your hand up because we're actually trying to see multiple screens. So members, those in favour? And those against? So here's an interesting one, members. It's a casting vote, um, but I haven't spoken to the motion. Um, so as, as I do actually uh, support our essential care workers, my concern was around the trigger to start and the trigger to stop and who it applies to. Uh, these are the questions that I asked of the union, which I, I believe we received a response late this afternoon. Um, what I would ask is because what I want to see is who it applies to. I don't think we can do open slather to 1,500 uh, workers for the city because once we actually, there's no, once we look at essential care workers and if we're also talking about police and the fire brigade and the ambulance drivers and those service providers for homelessness, um, I don't actually think that we would be in a position to be able to provide on-street and off-street parking for all of those essential care workers. Um, my consideration uh, is more around, uh, and I guess that was uh, what Deputy um, CEO was talking about, is we asked for specific information uh, that I could, that, so that we could actually inform this debate. Um, uh, unfortunately, it came in uh, very late this afternoon. Um, so that we could actually see who would it apply to. Um, Councillor Martin, you did answer one question in terms of around the state declaration, um, but it was who would it, would it apply to and how long for. The other thing I did is check with my other capital cities to see what they've done and um, various parking had been put in place, but they're actually putting the metres back on. Uh, the majority of the cities have actually come through as they're coming out with the restrictions lifting, they're also lifting that um, uh, that the any permits that had been done, a lot of it was blanket in the city, just as we 
were flexible with our parking in the city during that period. Um, so that being noted, I'm not sure how I do this because I don't actually want a blanket um, on and off street parking for um, a scheme when we don't actually have the information to inform such a scheme in terms of numbers and, uh, and having some understanding because the, the motion doesn't actually call for a start or an end date. I'm gonna to go to Councillor Martin for a minute, just in terms of um, Sorry, I'm just getting some advice here. Just a moment. Okay. Um, so given that, um, sorry, I've just been um, uh, given instruction that I, I can't actually talk to amending the motion, bringing more information in anything else. So in that circumstances, I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to vote against it because it's too open. Um, I am continuing to talk with the police union and I will continue to work with administration to do what we can uh, to work with uh, both the police and our health workers. However, um, because this has got no um, um, framework around it, I don't think I'm in a position to vote for this, I'm afraid. So that is lost. I can't hear you. Sorry, Councillor Moran. Sorry. Just a technicality, Lord Mayor. You are not. You have spoken after the mover summed up, which is totally out of order. You're allowed to cast and vote, but nobody speaks after the summing up. And also, I'd like to call a division. You are correct, Councillor Martin. Though yeah. I wasn't called. Thank you. Um, and we'll call for a division. Council members, a division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called. Councillor Sims, Councillor Martin, Councillor Ho, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Moran. Thank you. Members, it's just coming up at o'clock. Um, I think what I'll do is possibly if we do one more motion and then we, I was going to take a break between uh, or around 8 or 8.30. Members happy to keep going for a short while and then we'll take a half hour break? Okay to keep going for a short while? Great. Okay. Um, members, we go to um, item 15.3, Councillor Martin, uh, Councillor Moran, my apology. Uh, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. I move that I request the CEO investigates whether any council provided communication devices have been used by elected members. This council, the fourth of this council term, to contact any official employed by the Saudi Arabian government or a member of the Saudi royal family. I'll look for a seconder. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Moran? I think it's fairly uh, straightforward what I'm uh, suggesting. Uh, there has been some uh, interest in the uh, print media, the advertiser, um, that uh, an ex-councillor who is now an employee of the Saudi Arabian totalitarian monarchy has sought to um, speak to candidates during this election and apparently uh, so reported by Celeste, and I, oh, sorry, Cameron England, and I presume that his information is correct, um, has sought to set up a ticket for the um, council election, has apparently explained to the uh, candidates, which I believe is Nathan Payne and a few others, um, the machinations of the Team Adelaide, which he set up two council elections ago. As we have a majority 
Council of Team Athlete, I would like to know whether any of the councillors, and I'm happy to hand over my, I don't have a computer, but my phone, my iPad, uh, to show that I have had no dealings with that government or government of this councillors now. I realise this, this motion is uh, not going to get up. Um, I could move night as night and day as day and it wouldn't get up. But I feel that this interference from a foreign agency in our by-election is untenable. And I want to make sure that none of the Team Adelaide members on council now have availed themselves of our electronic devices to affect the election and to contact a foreign government. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Martin, did you wish to speak? Uh, yes, I do, but I reserve my right for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, it's, it's very obvious what's being at play here. Um, you know, it's, they talk about, you know, themselves being victims, but I think the victim here is um, Councillor Abiyad. Um, you know, it's ridiculous um, and it's all political and it's driven by um, hate, I'm sure. Councillor, Councillor Kouros, we, we need to speak to the motion, thank you. Mayor, but this is just appalling behaviour um, from a senior councillor who is um, actually going out and uh, taking direct attack to a former councillor who I know that they were very good friends during the term of council and this is just nitpicking to um, find out and to what um, some something completely ridiculous, completely irrelevant, completely not required and completely not what the forefront of thinking of our ratepayers today who are suffering during this crisis. They are not thinking about what device um, a former councillor is using to support any candidate that is putting his hand up in the central ward. I think this is disgusting and repulsive behaviour. Uh -huh. Indicative. So, Councillor Kouros, talk I'm to sorry, that motion. Lord Mayor, I cannot go comprehend this, uh, this motion because it's absolutely, absolutely just uh, appalling behaviour because it does not actually have any relevance to what is happening today. And I'm sure, and I'm absolutely sure that Councillor Ab or former Councillor Abiyad, who was very diligent at his job, would never ever and has never abused council privilege. Thank you. I will go to Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy Lord Mayor. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Another motion that I just have to shake my head at and wonder. I think, I think we all just need to let it go, and maybe tomorrow we might have some closure um, uh, uh, for those of us who are sad to see Hussam go, and for those of us who are uh, maybe pleased to see him go. Uh, tomorrow we'll have a, a replacement for that position um, to cap off ten years of brilliant service to the to the city of Adelaide and and to close that chapter. But. It, I mean, it's sort of like it's sort of like um, uh, Batman and the Joker, Lord Mayor. And I, you know, one can't exist without the other, and we're just struggling to let Hussam go. I'll leave it to the other councillors to work out who's Batman and and who's Thank the you, Joker. But, Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. But this motion is most certainly uh, a joke of emotion, uh, most definitely. So um, I urge members to stop wasting our staff's time. Um, uh, look, I, I must be honest, I don't really use my council phone at all, other than just receiving calls from, and, and uh, to be honest, I really need to decommission it because it's just a pain having two phones. Um, uh, notwithstanding as well that it's a, you know, it's an obsolete model of phone, it's not very fast. Um, uh, and it certainly, it certainly um, uh, isn't, isn't good for making uh, Zoom calls to Saudi Arabia, because um, it's just not as big as my trusty uh, privately owned iPhone 11. So thank you. Um, I'll leave it there, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I move that the motion be put. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. I look for a seconder. Councillor Ho. Uh, members to the vote, those in favour of the motion being put. Carried. Thank you. 
Um, so we go to the vote on the motion. Members, those in favour? Those against? That is lost. Councillor Kouros? Have a division, please. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. With all those in favour of the motion, please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called. Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Moran. Members, that takes us to item 15.4, flooding on South Terrace, Deputy <coughs> Lord Mayor. Uh, this will be really, really quick, Lord Mayor. Um, no, no, I can't hear you. Sorry. Need to second uh, it? Yes, yeah, I'll seek a second it. Thank you. I've got Councillor Kouros, first hand up. Um, uh, uh, just very quick, in addition to um, uh, what I circulated uh, by email to councillors which and, and yourself, Lord Mayor, which was a, a photograph of the intense flooding that occurs around this neck of the woods um, at the end of Hutt Street along South Terrace and in the, the southern parklands. Um, uh, we do have problems with flooding down here. It is, of course, the Brown Hill... Um, Keswick Creek uh, catchment, which we know has uh, has problems, and we know that properties in that catchment are actually ineligible to get one in a hundred year uh, flood insurance, which is actually which is a big issue for property owners um, uh, across the catchment, which covers five councils from um, uh, Mitcham, Unley, City of Adelaide, West Highlands. <coughs> Um, and forgive me, I'm forgetting one. It might be the Adelaide Hills, I'm not sure. But um, uh, look, it is an issue. Um, uh, ensuring that uh, places don't flood is core business for council. Um, of course, this I'm not, I'm not asking for funding. Um, uh, I'm not asking for anything other than the administration's time in, in costing up an option. Um, and of course, asking uh, I, what I am asking for is uh, that that option be brought back to us. I'm not asking that it's even included in this upcoming business plan, um, just that we have it. Uh, ready to go for a time when we uh, when we can implement the funding uh, the, the solution um, uh, but until then I am asking that we do render our assistance um, uh, more thoroughly um, and above what's been offered previously to make sure we're protecting um, the affected properties uh, and the people that use those properties because it's just core business of what we do Sorry, did, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I have Councillor Kouros, did you wish to speak? Right. Thank you. I have Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Donovan. Councillor Martin? Yeah, yes, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor, in speaking to the motion, referred to the properties affected. Which are the properties which are affected? That's a question of the Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy oh, Lord I don't Mayor. care who answers. Sorry, just, well. Uh, there we go. I've unmuted you. It's uh, it's in the report, so read your papers. No, I have read the re uh, the report, but the report doesn't identify the property that you spoke to. Which is it? Oh, I don't have the uh, I don't have the I don't have the address. Uh, but it's primarily the corner of South Terrace and Hutt Street, I and of see. course the parklands which flood as well and preclude people from using them. Um, and of course. Uh, the effect is not just the effect of properties, water floods all up and down South Terrace, which is east of the section of South Terrace, east of Hutt Street, that intersection. And that whole intersection remains closed for some time until the water is drained. Uh, thank you very much. Look, Lord Mayor, um, may I just say that for um, someone who's constantly criticising others for raising motions which have no real meaning or substance, this one is a doozy. All of the matters which are raised in this have been dealt with by the administration. The details been provided, negotiations have been going on, plans have been approved, construction has occurred. It is just a waste of time. From somebody who could have picked up the phone, asked the administration, had an answer, and we would have been spared two minutes of painful uh, um, time listening to this um, pointless question, pointless motion. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I think uh, the, the point has already been made. Um, I'm very happy to support this because it, the work has already been done. So um, 
the uh, and and to uh, to Deputy Lord Mayor's uh, point for raising it. You know, of course, we always want to see what we can do immediately. But there is a uh, Brown Hill Keswick Creek stormwater project. There's a board. There's a in depth plan. In fact, there's a 20 year plan that extends far beyond the uh, the the immediate project uh, referenced in this motion. Um, there's a funding plan, there's, uh, there's extensive work that's already been done and that is scheduled to do. So I'm very happy to support it because um, essentially it's, it's, uh, it's all underway. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, um, uh, same, same uh, points that uh, Helen was making. This is just virtue signalling. It's already been done. If he'd read his past notes, he would know that. It's just sheer vote getting and it's, it's terrible politics. It's beneath the Lord, the Deputy Lord Mayor, although that's a conundrum. Um, <laughs> I didn't say it, Sandy. Councillor. <laughs> so, uh, this is a rubbish motion. We spent hundreds of hours, as Sandy, you know, dealing with this problem. Uh, Jeffcott Street's also flooded completely. Nobody can even get out of their cars, got to think. But, uh, uh, the young bloke is a ward councillor, uh, so I understand he needs to look after his ward. But this work has been done. This is a nonsense motion. Uh, votes don't vote for it. Really, but uh, see it for what it is, blatant politicking. And uh, I would say it's beneath the Deputy Lord Mayor, but it's probably not. Uh, councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, um I, I will support this. Uh, it is gesture politics, um, obviously, as has been said um, by uh, councillors Donovan and, and Moran. It's a motion that doesn't achieve anything because the work is already um, underway. And, and I'm sorry that administration have had their time wasted with this, but I am happy to support it given um, it doesn't do any harm. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if um, it helps uh, Councillor Hyde um, feel that he's ticking his KPIs, then I'm happy to go along with that, uh, Lord Mayor. I have Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I do speak in, in support of this. Um, uh, and, and I think these councillors that have just spoken about what a useless motion this is, I would say they better look at their own motions and what they're doing in council. And thanks to them, we'll be here until 3 a.m. again. Thank you, Councillor Abraham today. Uh, Councillor Kerra, just one moment. I need to unmute you. Okay, done there it. we go. It is, it is Lord Mayor, it is rich beyond belief here in Councillor Sims, Councillor Moran, Councillor Martin, uh, talking about motions, about matters that are already underway, that are redundant, that are gesture politics. Uh, Give me a break. It is so rich that if they kept it Councillor up... Councillor Kerra, we need to speak to the motion before yeah. us. If Councillor Kerra. If they keep it up, the rivers, the streets will be paved with gold. I urge them to keep it up. It is so rich. That's exactly what the city needs. Keep it up, guys. This kind of hip-hop... Councillor Kerra, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, what have we got here? Uh, I have... That is all I have to speak. I will go back to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, sorry, Lord Mayor. I said this would take a minute. And, it um, did, and it uh, didn't. I've, I've clearly uh, misled you all. Um, uh, I, I'm so baffled as to how uh, stormwater infrastructure has somehow fallen along factional lines um, in the council. God, we want to talk about lows. What a new low. Um, uh, just to Councillor's points, uh, yes, there has been work already done. Is that work adequate? No, the work is not adequate because uh, it's largely been complete and we still have flooding. Um, the Brown Hill Keswick Stormwater Management Plan um, is going to take 20 years. Um, it's not fully funded. I think it's about $17.5 million short of being fully funded. Um, uh, although we're uh, on track to do it, or correct me if I'm wrong, but or have already completed our components. Um, it's obvious that we need uh, more, uh, more infrastructure in place. Um, uh, the council approved uh, that building to be built. Um, I also understand that, uh, and actually, if you go down there and look at it, you see that it's not just the building referred to in the comment that, that uh, is affected. There are properties all the way along there leading up to St. Andrew's Hospital that are affected. 
um, uh, as well because they're inaccessible. They don't flood necessarily, but they're inaccessible. Um, uh, so it's it's bread and butter business of council. Um, uh, just my interpretation of the motion um, uh, for my colleagues that think that it's a nothing motion and it's and it's just business as usual if it gets voted up. That's not what I think at all. I expect uh, designs to be brought back to us and a solution to be brought back to us as to how we're going to fix this issue uh, going into the future. I'm not asking for funding for that, but I'm asking for us to cost it up um, uh, a proper solution to fixing this ongoing problem. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, members to the vote, those in favour? Uh, Councillor uh, Council Moran, I'm just a little bit, your hand is, thank you. Those against? That is carried. Uh, members, thank you. Sorry, Councillor Kouros? Can we have a division on that, please? Can we record a division on that? I will go to administration. Council members, a division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called. Councillor Sims, Councillor Canole, Councillor Ho, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Moran, Councillor Kouros, Councillor Abraham today, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Kira. Thank you. Uh, I, Councillor Moran, did you have something? Can we have a, a break now, Sandy? We're going for three hours. Some of us. Uh, um, we can have a break. I'll look to the members. Everybody's happy to have a break. Um, I was going to go do possibly one or two more and go through to 8.30, but if members, I'll just hands, we're okay to have a break now. Um, members, I think we, we will call this dinner break and we will have a, let's say, 25-minute break, 30-minute break. It's quarter past now, so if we're back here at uh, 8.45, um, uh, back online to uh, finish the items on tonight's agenda. Thank you, members.
All right, I'm going to do a call out to members in a minute. Come back, come back. Members. Oh, God. They've got the air conditioning turned up. They're trying to freeze me. Freeze me to death. Freezing in here. I couldn't. That was really. Okay. Uh, we've got about two minutes. Do we have, do we have, um, I don't think that, I think that that's actually when, um, I think that's, oh, I'm not muted. Yeah, I think it's touching the screen. Okay. So, uh, members, I think we've got quorum. Um, just... One, two, three, four, five. The gallery. Um, she talks about the um, role of Channel 44. It currently employs five full-time staff, engages over 30 freelancers per year, and has over 200 local volunteer and program makers involved in the station at any one time. And it has also played, I would argue, Lord Mayor, a key role in our city as um, a community broadcaster in terms of keeping the community connected. Um, there has been uh, an ongoing uncertainty for Channel 44 because of um, the decision of the federal government um, not to commit to renewing uh, their free-to-air broadcast licence, which means that on the 30th of June, Channel 44 will no longer be on television. And I think that would be a big loss for our city. And so there is a big campaign underfoot within the community to get people to call on uh, the Federal Minister for Arts, the Honourable Paul Fletcher, to renew the licence so that we can keep community television here in Adelaide. And uh, I think it's really appropriate for us as a capital city to take a strong position on this and to advocate for the federal government to renew the licence. And that's what I'm proposing that we do tonight. Thank you, Councillor Sims. And the seconder was Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin, did you wish to speak? I reserve my right, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I totally support this motion. Uh, it's a real no-brainer. 
and uh, commend Councillor Sims for bringing this to our, uh, our attention. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Abraham Zadeh. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I speak in support of this motion. I just wanted to uh, ask through you, Lord Mayor, whether if the uh, mover of the motion um, is, uh, uh, is wanting to maybe add something to the motion so that uh, when we do hear uh, back from the uh, Federal Communications Minister, um, we actually know what that correspondence um, uh, contains. Would, would that be possible? Uh, yeah, that's fine for you, Lord Mayor. I'm happy to include that, that maybe um, request that the Lord Mayor write to the Federal Minister for Arts and Communications uh, to advise of the above resolution and table any um, correspondence Response. received in reply. Yep. yep. Thank you. Yep. We'll just add that and table any uh, response. Yeah, that's fine. That cover it? Response? Yep. Thank you. Um, so I'll just seek leave of the seconder, which was Councillor Martin. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I can, I can, that's all I can see of you on the screen. Um, uh, so I don't have any other speakers. Um, I will go to Councillor Sims to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, it would be great to have everybody's support on this. As I say, Channel 44 plays such an important role in our city and uh, community broadcasters are really important in terms of providing an avenue for young talent, providing opportunities for people to build their skills, working in media, working in communications, and also keeping the community connected. I don't want to see our city being without a community broadcaster. And um, I think we've got an important role to play in terms of advocating. So it'd be great to have everybody's support on this. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Members will go to the vote. Uh, those in favour, please raise your hand. Those against, that is carried. Okay. Oh. Uh, Councillor Kuros, you are not on video, therefore you're not on the meeting, in the meeting at the moment, so. Sorry, forgot. That's okay. <laughs> yep. My vote wasn't recorded there? Uh, no, it, it okay. couldn't be because you weren't there in person. Thank and you. I accidentally pressed raise hand, sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, that takes us to 15.6, which is uh, engaging key stakeholders in the City of Adelaide, Deputy Lord Mayor. Sorry, there we uh, go. Move it as printed and seek a seconder. Okay, I have Councillor Kouros seconding. Deputy Lord Mayor, if you'd like to speak to the motion. Yes, another one which I hope will only um, uh, take a minute, but we'll see. Um, a very straightforward one here, Lord Mayor. Obviously, I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing work you do uh, meeting with our stakeholders, and I know you've been meeting with many of them uh, from many different sectors over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, this one uh, gives a little bit more um, scope, I guess, and, and makes our, our agenda clear, which is that um, the City of Adelaide should be are very keen to meet with property owners, businesses and potential investors um, in all of our various precincts to talk to them around uh, what potential plans they might have in the pipeline um, and how we can really work with them uh, to deliver those plans and, and ensure that uh, if, there's, if there's some simple things that we can do as the city um, that would assist them, uh, then perhaps we can do those things and unlock a whole heap of private sector investment um, uh, while doing so. And of course, the city has been uh, very good in, in the private sector. Um, we've seen a lot of good uh, public-private partnerships uh, with things like the uh, Central Market Arcade redevelopment, um, 88 O'Connell, which I'm sure is going to pay dividends for us in the future, um, uh, and as well, TPG, Tanking City, um, and the list goes on and on. So I think we've been dealing really well with the private sector um, uh, and hopefully uh, through your leadership, Lord Mayor, we can engage further, deepen those ties and, those and see uh, what are some things that we can do to unlock even more investment in our city. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Kouros, did you wish to speak? I have my right. Thank you. I have, uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Sims. 
Thanks, Lord Mayor. I just wish to um, move an amendment, or I'm happy for um, the mover to accept it as a variation. And that is um, after the words, oh, sorry, Jenny, could you keep it on the screen, please? Oh, yeah, you've, I sent it to you earlier. Great. Thanks. I can't see it. So it's just adding in the reference to resident groups, um, Lord Mayor, because I think if we're having uh, meetings with precinct property owners and potential investors, it's really important to uh, have uh, resident groups having a seat at the table as well. So just so that I'm clear, so residents at the same table? Yes, that's oh, right, yeah. yeah. Thank you, sorry, I'll just move this so I can see. I have, uh, now, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to accept that amendment? Other variation, sorry. Uh, that was... No, that was a hard no from me. That was a no. Oh, okay. Well, I'll move it as an amendment then, uh, Lord Mayor. Okay. Thank you. And I have Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin, I'm just checking your seconding. Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Sims, did you? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, uh, I do think um, it's really important when we're having discussions with uh, key stakeholder groups in the city that residents have a seat at the table. And um, this uh, motion from Councillor Hyde talks about meeting with precinct property owners and potential investors. But if we want to uh, really talk about how we're going to uh, unlock potential in our city, then residents are a key stakeholder they need to be involved in um, those conversations. And um, so let's give them a seat at the table. You, Councillor Martin. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I, I support that. Um, you know, one, one of the things that we overlook regularly at this council is the contribution that residents can make to a range of issues within the city, um, including development. And I'm mindful that there has been limited consultation with residents, for example, about 88 O'Connell Street. Indeed, most of the residents of North Adelaide know nothing about what's happening at 88 O'Connell Street. Um, and it would be helpful to include them to the extent that we can. Uh, I just think that this hard no from the hard right uh, from the Deputy Lord Mayor it is just the wrong approach. We need to be much more uh, embracing of our communities, not sort of trying to always segregate them into, you know, the private sector, uh, the pro-car sector, the anti-anyone who's not Team Adelaide sector. I think it's important that we have a much more embracing philosophy. I have Councillor Knoll, followed by Councillor Kouros. Um, a question. Um, count, sorry, Councillor Sims, have you left the meeting? I'm just checking. No, no, hanging in there. Um, just as a question to this, now, you, is this uh, in these particular precinct property and potential investor meetings, you're wanting the resident groups to be a part of that, that particular meeting or having meetings with the resident groups but uh, at, at a, in a more separate time. So that's a question. Uh, uh, well, um, Councillor Knoll, it says a series of round table meetings. So when you talk about round tables and involving uh, stakeholders, then I would assume that resident groups would have a representative there as part of a key, as a key stakeholder. Okay. And it's just when I, when I look at that, I mean, it's, depending on what sort of conversation you have and uh, because people when they, when you're coming along with uh you know like coming together it's just a general conversation i mean there, there are there are people then that are putting ideas forward um you know and and expressing maybe uh, just ideas um and speaking candidly and uh there are times where you're trying to formulate those ideas so i think it is it, it you do need to be a bit more judicious when you uh, decide who's going to be part of this conversation only because you may have an idea it, it may not be quite uh, quite workable quite right and uh, automatically uh, if you're it, it may uh, if, if you put a whole group of people together that have conflicting views um, in the first instance rather than necessarily having a refined uh, a conversation after having you know thought through things 
then you may automatically start conflicts or issues that may you know not necessarily be relevant uh, simply because you know I mean I have a concept um, and uh, you know and you and when you do present it to people rather than having a what do you think Lord Mayor or what do you think uh, the CEO um, you know that that's a, that's a separate uh, sort of uh, thing when we're talking about bringing the community together and that is the property owners and the investors etc uh, with together with uh, the community groups then we are talking about issues uh, about uh, you know where that involve all of them specifically and that's more than about uh, you know in, informing and guiding uh, and assisting uh, the, the members and and uh, our administration in where you're wanting to head rather than necessarily you know because you need times where each group can have a, have a word and express themselves and I think we do need to uh, draw a little bit of a line around that so that people can uh, bring forward sometimes uh, really uh, uh, different uh, uh, concepts um, with a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say quite that, that you're able to expand it rather than it becoming a straight away something that, that people consider may happen. And then uh, you, you may, it, it may have a, you know, you get issues unnecessarily. So I think there needs to be a little bit of a, a thought around that rather than it just being continuously all people involved because otherwise you are going to just have problems without necessarily having a, a, an informed and, and uh, you know a, a debate that is about the, an issue rather than just people's concepts and ideas. Sorry, Councillor Kuros, did you still wish to speak? No. I had, no? Sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. I'm do, I do apologise. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. I think um, I think the mover of the amendment has has sort of missed the point. Um, Franz has picked it up though. Uh, this isn't this isn't a, about a resident discussion. The resident discussion happens later. The resident discussion happens. Um, uh, when, uh, let's say, for example, um, uh, someone wants to invest in something um, uh, and they put in a development approval or something like that. That's when the residents get to engage um, on a topic. This is about having a frank um, discussion with uh, leaders in the city of Adelaide around uh, what, what happens if, um, or what, what do we need to do to unlock investment? It's co it, com it will completely derail the conversation to involve people that are extraneous to that um, uh, and people that in that in this particular circumstance in this sort of environment you're trying to create where you can have that frank discussion around investment uh, or people that have to be to be quite frank nothing to offer to that discussion now they have things to offer subsequent to it they have perspectives and views to offer in addition to it um, uh, but I, I haven't seen any resident associations come to me with meaningful suggestions uh, about the balance sheets of uh, construction companies uh, or, or uh, other such businesses, uh, I haven't. I just haven't seen that level of discussion. And that's because that's not their role. Their role is to advocate for their residents, and this is not an advocacy body. This is a this is a roundtable discussion about investment. Um, now, you show me a resident group that's willing to invest fifty million dollars into a project, uh, and we'll include them. But until you've got one of them, that's not what that's not what this roundtable is about. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, if not, I will go back to Councillor Sims to sum up. On Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, well, access mm -hmm. to uh, meetings in Town Hall shouldn't be based on people's financial capacity, Lord Mayor. It should be based on what they can uh, contribute. And I think residents have got a really important role to play in these kinds of discussions. The idea that we would be having a group of developers or investors in Town Hall without residents having a seat at the table to talk about future investments in the city, I think is a really bad look for uh, the city council. Um, we know that there is a lot of community disquiet about planning reforms that have shut residents out of these conversations. And if we're going to be talking about how we can stimulate new investment, then I think it is really important that residents have a seat at the table and that we consult with them as we would any other stakeholder. Um, and I don't accept the argument that they're irrelevant to these conversations. They are a key stakeholder. Our city is made up of residents. And if people are wanting to come up with ideas for how they can invest and stimulate growth in the city, 
then they need to be willing to engage with residents as a key stakeholder. And I think the absence of that sort of engagement is what has led to development that has often been unpalatable in the CBD. So I don't accept Councillor Hyde's argument that if you don't have the cash to cough up, you don't have a right to participate in the discussions. That's not how we should approach a democracy at a local level. Thank you, members. To the vote on the amendment, those in favour? Those against? That is lost. That is lost. And there's people waving, so <laughs> Councillor Sims. I'd like a division, please, Lord Mayor. Councillor, the decision has been called on the amendment. Would all those in favour of the amendment please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called? Councillor Donovan, Councillor Moran, Councillor Sims, Councillor Martin. Uh, members, I'll go back to the original motion. If there's no other speakers, Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, uh, uh, sorry, Councillor Martin. I actually couldn't hear Councillor. Oh, I, there we go. Sorry, Councillor Martin. You proposed. No, you seconded the amendment, so you've taken to have already spoken. Oh dear. Sorry. Um, I will go to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, and uh, of course. In these, in these roundtables that you've been having to date, they've been with uh, various sectors and, and what have you, industrial uh, uh, well, industry groups. And, and uh, I, I would be surprised to learn if, if uh, uh, resident groups in the city of Adelaide had a seat at those. Of course, there is a table for resident groups and it's the community forum that you hold on a, on a, on a frequent basis. And we engage with all of them, the precinct group forum. We all, we all know what it is, it's there, it exists. Um, that's their table. I don't see Councillor Sims proposing that we uh, uh, bring other private sector stakeholders into that discussion. Um, you wouldn't. It's not appropriate. That's not the forum for it. Um, uh, so just trying to trying to drag issues in that are that are really non-issues. So uh, apologies again, Lord Mayor. I spoke too soon. What is so simple, perhaps, is is uh, what appears simple. Is um, uh, but hopefully we can uh, see all councillors supporting this very, very worthy initiative. Uh, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Moran, I actually, we can't see you, so we don't know if you're there. Um, thank you. It's the, it's the big floral background that keeps taking you away. Uh, members, I will go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, members, I will go to Councillor Kouros. Sorry, Councillor Kouros. Can I have a division on that, please? Council members, the division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called? Councillor Donovan, Councillor Canole, Councillor Kira, Councillor Ho, Councillor Abraham Zadeh, Deputy Lord Mayor, and Oh, Councillor Kouros, his hands up. Yep, Councillor Kouros, thank you. Yep. Thank you, members. We'll go to item 15.7, COVID-19 small business assistance, Councillor Martin. Well, well, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, this is fairly simple, but um, I kn know that it'll be much too complex for Team Adelaide. Um, uh, look, I've had conversations uh, with a lot of... Uh, Councillor Kira looks so offended. I need a seconder, sorry. Uh, I don't oh, have a seconder yet. Uh, I need an electronic hand, please. <laughs> so, thank you, Councillor, Councillor Sims, I have. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I should start again. You have a seconder, you may speak to the motion. Okay, look, uh, um, you may not have heard this. This is very simple, but probably too complex for Team Adelaide. Um, I've been having uh, conversations with businesses uh, in North Adelaide, and um, the picture is uh, fairly grim, as it is in many parts of the city. And um, 
in fact, I had a conversation with a business person yesterday, Sunday, sorry, who was saying to me that they weren't sure whether they could open again. Um, they need uh, essentially financial assistance. And uh, he, uh, like I, uh, were talking about um, Prospect Council and the way in which it's helping small business, as indeed the motion uh, notes. Uh, while we had chosen not to help small business, but to help only our tenants um, in any cash sense. Now, this motion, uh, I commend to you, would do something uh, for people who, uh, other than um, being given the privilege of putting their debt off, which is all we're doing, uh, would allow them to be uh, receiving a waiver of rates. Now, at Prospect, what they've done is um, they've offered a complete wave of rates uh, through until September based on the eligibility for the job seeker rights. So if you've been closed and effectively 100% of your business is gone, you get 100% of uh, your rates waived. If you've been damaged to the extent that you qualify for job seeker, but your trade is down by more than 30%, then you qualify for a 50% reduction. Um, and additionally, in the case of uh, leases for their parklands, and there are quite a few in prospect, as Councillor Kouros would know, um, they are saying that those uh, areas of parklands will be rent-free for six months, whereas we said three months. So this is a, an advance on what the City of Adelaide did. And Look, we, we have spent no money, none of our own money, on helping vulnerable people, people who've got real issues with feeding themselves. Um, and Prospect has uh, helped out by offering vouchers to the value of about 400000 for people to redeem at local cafes and restaurants. So on the one hand, they're helping people who are vulnerable, and at the same time, they're helping local businesses. And this motion would do the same. It would ask for a uh, million dollars, which is barely uh, a, a little more than double of what Prospect Council, which is a very small council, um, with a lot less revenue than we have as the CEO knows. So a um, million dollars to stimulate directly business and to help uh, uh, vulnerable people. Uh, this is doable. Our ratepayers will love it. Team Adelaide, endorse it. Thank you. I have uh, Councillor Sims. I'm sorry. Councillor Sims as the seconder. I'll reserve my right, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kouros? Um, Lord Mayor, I just want a clarification. If I ask some questions, can I then speak again later if I choose to? Uh, if you ask questions and don't speak to, you can speak later. Yep. Um, could I just ask, um, what is the uh, financial impact um, if this is to go through to the City of Adelaide? Are you asking, sorry, I'll go to the CEO. So the financial impact of the motion in total? Yeah, <clears throat> through you, Lord Mayor. Um, at this time, we wouldn't know the answer to that question. Um, and, and that is something that, as, a, as an exec, uh, we are looking to provide um, options to you and details, um, which will be planning to come to you on the 14th of July. That's as we've stated in the uh, in the response to the motion. So I can't provide you an accurate answer at this time because there are a lot of variables and we need to do some work to unpack that. And what is um, the capacity to um, um, implement um, and fund this? Well, through you, Lord Mayor, you would understand that the City of Prospect has a very different income makeup, and you know a large proportion of their rate income comes from resident residential ratepayers, whereas our income is comprised of largely commercial um, income, and and that um, would have a significant impact um, on our on our income, and therefore would be a completely different proposition. And so that's why um, we need to provide you with some quality advice by way of doing some modelling and some scenarios, which we fully intend to do and provide back to you on the 14th of July. 
So uh, then do, um, actually, uh, what is the question? Um, how big is the uh, commercial rates portfolio in prospect? And what is Adelaide City Council's? Oh, look, in, in percentage terms, it would be something like uh, 10 to 15% of their, um, their rate payers would be commercial and 80, 85% would be residential. And you know, within the city of Adelaide, it's significantly different to that. It would be something like 45% would be um, commercial rate payers compared to residential. So, in fact, no, I might get um, Claire to, to clarify that because that's wrong. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it is. It's 80% um, uh, of our rates is right. approximately 80% of our rates. i just see yeah. if I can find Claire. She there? Sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, 80% um, um, roughly 80%. Uh, rate base is commercial 80%. and around 20 is residential. Right, so 20% is residential and 80% is commercial. And sorry, um, uh, CEO, can you repeat how much is prospect again? How much uh, is, is this com uh, commercial is um, uh, prospect made up of? Yeah, look, I haven't reviewed their annual report recently, but it was around about the opposite to us. Um, and so it's around about 10 to 15 per cent is commercial, um, 80 85 per cent is residential. And what process does administration or do we identify as vulnerable and needy? How do, how do we determine who's vulnerable and who's needy? Certainly, the, the word vulnerable would generally relate to. Um, people that are receiving Commonwealth assistance. Um, the word needy is a bit um, uncertain, I'm a bit uncertain as to what would qualify as needy. Right. So there's no clarification or no guideline that the council uses for vulnerable yeah. needy? Yeah, no, um, Claire? Yeah, if I could just confirm. So we consider vulnerable people, um, those um, in definition under the Commonwealth Home Support Program, which are those aged 70 years or older, um, aged 65 years or older, who have chronic um, medical conditions, um, Aboriginal Australians aged 50 and over, and people with compromised or weakened immune systems. So those are the definitions that, that, that we use um, in relation to vulnerable. Um, and then we also look at whether people live alone and what sort of support network um, they have around them. Um, so that's what we would use. Um, but obviously, um, if this is supported tonight, we bring that back um, to council just to provide some clarity. Um, and I think as Mark's already indicated, needy, I'm not sure um, how we would define that. So I probably um, need to come up with a, a way of doing that to enable council to understand the impact. And needy? Is that vulnerable comes under needy? I mean, I'm, I don't know. It's, it's, it's using two, two different... But yes, it's not a term that we use here within the organisation. So it's not a term that we would normally use to assess someone's, um, you know, what sort of assistance someone would need. So just to be clear, Claire, sorry, while I've got you, council is bringing to us, to administra administration is bringing to the elected members a model in which we can support our commercial ratepayers in the City of Adelaide to us to review. Correct? Um, well, I think that's what I heard the CEO say earlier. He talked about modelling and scenarios. All right, thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And look, I don't um, want to uh, delve into the territory of uh, cross-examination um, that others have traversed. Just a question about the um, implications of this. Uh, and I'm conscious, just to be transparent, because I work for a university, I'm just wanting to make sure that they're not going to be potential beneficiaries of this. Would their clubs be regarded as sporting clubs or community groups? Could I just ask administration to clarify the scope of this so that I can determine how to deal with the issue? Claire, can you respond to that, thanks? Um, potentially, yes, under part three, councillor. Okay, uh, in light of um, that, um, I will remove myself um, from the uh, discussion 
Um, and uh, I will request that I return um, to the uh, meeting when the matter is uh, concluded. So if someone could please send me a text and I'll, I'll leave the meeting now. Just one Apologies, minute. I didn't one notice minute. the matter um, earlier, but I think given there's a perception of a conflict of interest, uh, I should um, leave the meeting. Just a moment, Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims, I can just move you to the waiting room and then you'll be readmitted once the item's finished. Okay, I'll sit in the, the virtual waiting room. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Sims. Uh, Councillor High. Oh, sorry. Uh, if Councillor Sims is withdrawn because of a conflict of interest, um, I will need a new seconder for the motion. So I'll just look to the floor for a new seconder for the motion. Councillor Ho, is that good? Uh, Councillor Ho, are you seconding the motion? Yes, I will. No. You will? Okay. Yep. Uh, and Councillor Ho, did you wish to speak? Yes, I speak, to, I speak now. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, well, since for uh, since coming, it is a very difficult decision to make, and uh, indeed, like after the WHO announced the pandemic, and we have announced to give four million dollars to support our own tenants as well as some of the others, I have received numerous of complaints from my community, especially those business people in my in, in the precincts and they call it a double standard we on one hand we i mean really like the rates we collect from our rate payers um, i mean i really like coming from everyone not just our own tenants and besides it is not our money but our rate payers money our rate payers expecting us to use the rates to look after the core business not buying properties or not I mean, doing developments or whatsoever. It's basically just for core business as, as, I mean, as priority. At this point of time, at this point of time, many, many business are suffering, are suffering. They might not be able to survive until, you know, whenever we have a plan, whenever we could identify how big the impact will be. So I will actually speak to, I will actually support Councillor Martin's motion. However, when I'm looking at, I mean, the four different items on screen, right, and looking at the admin, admin, administration's comments, I am asking whether or not Councillor Martin will be happy to kind of remove item four, because like, I, I think that is kind of a difficult to achieve. But in general, I like to support the, the rate waiver. All right, thank you. Councillor Martin. Um, uh, well, look, I, I'm open to a variation of four, but my intention is to help constituents like uh, Councillor Hose, including restaurants, so that they benefit from the vouchers that are issued. So if you can see a way that I can vary that so that it favours um, our local businesses, then I'm happy to accept that. I just don't know how to do the variations though. And, and indeed, like also looking at the administration's comments about item one and item two, maybe we, you need to, as a mover, maybe you need to find a way to vary it as well. That's like just say, I mean, for whoever entitled to JobKeeper, then they might have like either 100% or 50% of the railway. Um, okay, well, look, uh, uh, I have used the wording that Prospect used. Um, in order to determine what is a, um, a small business enterprise that um, is able to receive it. And the intention of Prospect was to ensure that those who weren't receiving JobKeeper, but who had been closed fully, uh, got some benefit. But look, I'm, I'm happy if Councillor Ho would feel comfortable with uh, one, two and three, I'll delete four. Although, you know, I think it would benefit restaurants in our city. Um, thank you. I have Councillor Kouros. Councillor Kouros. So, sorry, one moment, sorry. So, so just so I'm clear, Councillor, so we're deleting four? Is that Councillor correct? Councillor Ho, as the seconder, would prefer it was not there at all. I'll delete it. Councillor Ho, yes, as a please. seconder? Okay, yep, so we have deleted four. It's just updating... One moment.
So members, the uh, varied motion is in front of you. Uh, I will look, so, sorry, Councillor Cross, you had your hand up. Did you wish to speak? I would like to speak, but do you uh, need to formalise the change here? Or? No, I think they have. So the mover and the seconder have agreed on that change. Um, I'm a okay to go? Yes. Okay. Um, I Sorry that Councillor Sims found that my questions were of an interrogation, but I think it's important to understand that what uh, this motion is modelled on, and it's modelled on the City of Prospects um, uh, model of, of relief for businesses. It's modelled on the fact that they are actually only uh, a 10, 15% of their rates are businesses. We are of a much larger capacity. And when you speak to business owners, and which I do on a regular occasion, um, and you explain this to them, they understand it very clearly um, what the implications are. And I would before um, I would love to give all the businesses a relief in their rates. And I think that's everyone's intention, but we need to know what that model looks like, how will it affect the council, how will it affect um, the services of running the, um, the council um, as a whole. Um, so I won't vote for this motion, not because of the intent, um, but because of um, further work is required in modelling this for support for businesses. And I think the approach of us um, having discussions about this in a more broader sense um, would be um, uh, much um, beneficial and much more productive and less destructive for the council. Thank you. Um, that, that, thanks. Look, um, the uh, Councillor Kuros has uh, quite astutely pointed to the concerns that I've got too. But I, um, you know, given, given that uh, we are, are looking at a motion that specifies uh, that we consider uh, the package of measures at a, at a subsequent meeting, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite amenable to this. I'm certainly amenable to the overall uh, uh, idea that we give uh, targeted relief and assistance. My concerns, and I think that this does cover that because we are being asked to have a report on this, but my concerns are around the administrative churn uh, involved in the uh, fairly significant means testing involved. Um, I think as Councillor Kouros pointed out, we have a very, very large business ratepayer uh, a cohort. Um, so the concern is what really this may, we need to know what we're biting off uh, before we uh, chew it. Um, I, I, look, just to the administration, um, if this is passed, we've got, we've got a specified uh, special meeting on the 26th of May at 5.30. Is that enough time for you to really cover um, what this will really fully entail? Because what we will need is, um, we'll need a fairly realistic appraisal uh, of how much this is going to cost. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor, it doesn't provide a lot of time. I might ask um, Claire to respond because it's largely Claire's team that will be pulling information together. So, Claire, can you chip in, please? So, apologies, um, the, our computer factor um, here over in CLC. So, I'm just stepping in at the um, about two seconds before Councillor Kira asked that question. So I'm not sure what I might have missed while the computers were down. Um, so I understand, Councillor Kira, you're asking if I'm going to provide some um, sufficient modelling for you around how many businesses and the costs that... Is it the time frame there enough? ...by the 26th of May. Yeah, that's right. Do we have enough time to really cover um, the... Yeah. My, yeah. my advice would be that um, we actually, we've actually only had a few requests around hardship. Um, and so um, rates for this quarter are due um, until early June. So my advice to council would be to wait um, a little bit longer and just um, understand the true nature of the hardship. Um, and then I think that's why we were proposing to come back um, when um, you know we've got a really good sense of how we can best help um, the um, 
those that need it here in the city. Um, there are still um, funds flowing through from federal and state um, uh, uh, proposals. So that's still flowing through at the moment to uh, the commercial and business sector. And the sector that we know is definitely under um, the pressure and suffering is the accommodation sector. And so our focus has been looking at ways in which we might be able to build a more longer term and sustainable um, approach to make sure that um, uh, those areas um, are supported. So we're still working through various options and as Mark's indicated, some scenarios um, and, and some modeling so you understand the impact of your decisions. I do think May the 26th is too early. Um, I'm not sure um, how much um, accuracy of, of information I'll be able to provide on the 26th in relation to responding to this motion. Thank okay, thanks, thanks, Claire. Look, that, that is the other side of the equation. Uh, we've got to be mindful that uh, the last thing we want is to be in a position where we're trading while insolvent, um, or at least we're uh, really giving uh, uh, any cause of headlines uh, of being unable to meet essential services in the city. Um, I think that there is a great, uh, uh, there is a great impetus coming out of this whole thing uh, for this organisation to now really shift towards becoming an efficient uh, deliverer of core services. Uh, this, this crisis has really highlighted this, and I think it would be um, remiss of us not uh, to see that through uh, subsequent, to, uh, subsequent to the current crisis. Uh, but given those comments from the administration, I, um, I think on balance, I I'll wait to hear back. Um, I won't support this because I think it is dangerously prescriptive um, at a time when uh, uh, things are really up in the air, particularly about revenue. Thank you, Councillor Crew. Uh, Kira, I have Councillor Canal, then Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Canal. Yes, and and I um, mean you know, I, I have I think I have the same concerns. It's just um, the the uh, the city is is still slowly coming back. Obviously, it's, uh, from all the indications what the governments have given us, uh, we are not sure of of uh, the implications that uh, on us. It's certainly not about not assisting a business. This is, but we have to understand the implications for ourselves and also so that we are clear what assistance we can give and what assistance is needed. And uh, you know, if we're looking at the, the, the city coming back, uh, back from the crisis, you are still one or two months away. We still have that opportunity to, uh, uh, to unpack uh, what's going on. Let us not forget, there are so many uh, or different ways businesses have been assisted um, whether it be the job keeper schemes and, and to all of those other sorts of things, they all impact these diff businesses differently. And therefore you really want to assist those that you will be able to come out trading um, so that they're, they're, we're able to help them back from, from uh, near death. Um, and I think we, ju we just need to map it out a bit beforehand because again, our organization, we've, we hear about our financial debts from some councillors and, and you know, all of the things that uh, on one hand we're, we're supposed to be helping. We are, not a, we are not the government, we're the local government and we are part of an answer, not the answer. And so our contribution does need to reflect our capacity because it's far more important that we assist business coming back and enabling them and, and, and promoting them uh, so that we are able to get that coming faster so let us just temper it for a moment. Let us look at it again. And it's easy for a rural council that has a few, a few shops on the main street to give them free rent because it's underpinned by other, other uh, income that is not affected. And ours is that income. And if we give, what, 650 uh, medium-sized businesses 12 to 200, uh, 20 to 200, we could be talking uh, a, a thousand businesses that we are doing this for is another $20 million. So let's let's just temper it, get the figures, let's do this right, then let's target it. And I think then I, I'll be happy with that. I'm happy to help, but let's let's not kill ourselves in doing it. Thank you. I have uh, Councillor Donovan. I will admit, just uh, listening to the uh, debate and um, considering we might uh, look at a variation for the motion and push it out to instead of 26 May, which uh, Claire was saying was probably unachievable with any reasonable kind of data that we look at pushing it to the uh, the meeting in June, if that would be an acceptable variation to the mover. 
Councillor Martin, I think that question was for you. Uh, yes, yes, that sounds uh, uh, doable. That's a good idea. Yes, I accept that, Lord Mayor. So that would be, just checking my calendar, sorry, one moment. The, that would be the 9th of June. So uh, that would be, so it, instead of special meeting of council, it just be meeting of council on June 9. Yep, that's fine. The amendment. I'll just check with your seconder. Councillor Ho, are you happy with that change? Sorry, I did. Sorry, so we're I'm... just changing the time, the, the date uh, for this uh, report to be prepared um, from moving from the 26th of May at a special meeting to a normal meeting of council on the 9th of June. That's okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay by the move and second. Councillor Donovan. So we'll make that. Have we made that change? Sorry, thank you. Councillor Donovan, did you wish to speak to it other than making that change? No, thanks, Lord Mayor. Okay. Uh, members, are there any other speakers? No, if not, I'll go back to the mover to sum up. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I, um, I thank uh, Councillor Donovan and Councillor Ho for their amendments. Um, look, I, I hear the caution uh, coming from people like Councillor Canole and Councillor Kira saying, let's wait. Councillor Kuros saying, let's not do something as destructive to council uh, finances. Um, but look, the, the simple truth is that businesses in our city, businesses in North Adelaide, which I know probably much better than the CBD, are on the verge of destruction. They are simply contemplating, can I open again? Is it better just to shut the doors and walk away? And this would provide some hope. Now, I, I understand that there are lots of uh, um, calculations to be done, and that's, that's what the report asks for. It says to the administration, give us a report for consideration. That's what I'm asking for. But we're not talking about, um, you know, the, uh, the sum total of council's annual income here. Um, if, you know, just using a, a rounded figure of $100 million, which is not far off what we receive in rates, if you assume that 80% of that comes from business, then the cost of providing this for three months, bearing in mind it's fairly limited, I'm proposing to small business, 100 people or less, so Coles, Woolies, David Jones, Meyer, all of the big chains are out of this. This is about small business. We are talking about something, in my guess, between 10 and 15, maybe 20 million. But I'm happy to wait for the administration to come back. I want this to give some hope to businesses so that they can say, look, you know, I have uh, one business that I was speaking to last week who are paying $35,000 a year in rates. 35,000, it's a small business. People are contemplating not reopening. Now, a measure like this may well be the difference between not opening and having a go. And if we can empower people by offering what is in the scheme of things a very small concession, then we should at least ask the administration to investigate it. And I know it, put pressure, it, put, it puts pressure on them. It, re it really does. But it is nothing compared to the pressure that small business in the city of Adelaide is, is feeling right now. So look, I just ask members to be open-minded. If it comes back in June and you think, well, no, that's unaffordable, or I, I don't want to support that, I accept that. But this is at least being open-minded, uh, sufficiently receptive to the possibility that we will at least consider it. Thank you, Thank Councillor you. Martin. Uh, members, uh, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Thank you, members. Councillor Kouros. Councillor Kouros. Can I call a division, please? Uh, division. 
Council members, the division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and leave it raised until I call your name. Thanks. Councillor Kira, Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Ho, Councillor Kuros, Deputy Lord Mayor. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll just let Councillor Sims. Oh, we'll just let Councillor Sims back in. Councillor Kira, your camera's off. And it appears that Councillor Moran has left the meeting. I'm not sure. Um, sorry. Oh, bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Charades. We need little signs that we can put up. Anyway, uh, we go to uh, item 15.8, Councillor Canole, uh, free public transport. Yeah, I present the motion and uh, look for a seconder. Members look for a seconder. Councillor, Councillor Ho, I need an electronic hand, but I did see your hand go up first, so I'll accept you as seconder. Uh, Councillor Knoll, if you'd like to speak to it. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I mean, I put this motion forward because it's, it's one of the tenants that I've, uh, when I came to council, that I, that I wanted to progress. Um, and uh, it is that, uh, obviously, in this, this time we have right now with the crisis, et cetera, it really uh, uh, focuses the mind on the things we need to be doing uh, to uh, re-engage the, the, the city and, and the, the city businesses, et cetera, and, and that which we offer in town uh, with the community at large. And, uh, and looking at it, uh, we already offer a, a free bus uh, service, which is obviously not operating at the moment, um, and also uh, uh, the tram, which, you know, so we're looking at that, we're saying, okay, um, if we're looking at the city and making it accessible uh, to the people that live in the suburbs, et cetera, and, and a destination, then uh, uh, doing something like this, uh, where we have 9,000 bus movements per day, um, you know, going through the city and utilizing that spare capacity, because it is, uh, it is something that as the buses bring people into the city, of course, and pick them up and take them home, uh, that in between there is a, a lot of a, a spare capacity within the buses. So, we can bring uh, that uh, to be useful uh, and use it uh, to make our city accessible uh, to, the, to the wider community and start to take away some of the impediments uh, that people see about coming to, to the, the, you know, the CBD and North Adelaide, of course, and uh, using all the services and everything that we provide and also the amenities that we have. So if we think uh, around that, then uh, if this is a, a good start uh, to, one, encourage more use of public transport. I mean, we're not here to punish vehicles. They, they're obviously, as long as people need them, they come to the city with them. But this is about enabling and encouraging people to uh, use this service, use it to get around, uh, the, around Adelaide, and uh, thereby, you know, uh, that, making it that accessible. I mean, uh, by increasing the amount of people using it, you're also increasing the safety within the city, particularly at, at, the, at the shoulder times uh, of the day and the, in the early evenings, et cetera, where people can use the buses uh, to get to wherever they either, they do park a vehicle or uh, get to the buses um, that, that take them home. So that gives them a lot more uh, choices to move around. And uh, you know, if we think about it, this is about a positive um, way of in, encouraging people uh, to find alternate ways to come to the city. And it also helps us to enhance our ability to uh, work towards you know, a, a green economy and a carbon neutral status. And by encouraging people to do that, it also then starts to open up and with some of the motions that we're going to be bringing forward today, um, you know, about the other forms of transport. And we're all for that, but it's now putting together a package of, uh, of transport around the, the city that gives you flexibility to, to take bus, try a, a bike or walk. And I move that, uh, 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 you know, bring that to you. Thank you, Councillor Canal. Councillor Ho, did you wish to speak? Uh, yes, I will. <laughs> Actually, thank you, Councillor Canal, for bringing this motion up to the chamber. And indeed, I have discussed this with Councillor Canal well, very much like from the first months after we got elected. And uh, finally is now into the chamber. 
Uh, very happy to see this happen. And indeed, I, I actually see this be part of how we actually change people's behavior. I mean, the way how they actually come to the city. Because we have we have been talking so much about like trying to encourage people come into the city with bikes or I mean or public transportations whatsoever, and just using like I mean, some for argument say some people living in the suburbs in Burnside, all right, they come into the city, park their car somewhere, and they all of a sudden they, they need to come from like, South Terrace to North Terrace, and I mean they can't. Not everyone can get on an e, e scooter. All right. If we can have all the buses in the CBD for free, at least people will start to find out how they actually use the public transportations in the city to get from one point to the other, from one destination to the other destinations. I, I actually comment, well, I actually thank Councillor Connor for bringing this motion up to the chamber and I urge members to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ho. I have Councillor Sims, then Councillor Kerr. Councillor Sims. Uh, uh, there we go. No, try it again. Sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Go. Sorry, can I can I reserve my right? I'm happy to speak a bit later. Uh, you can. Uh, I have Councillor Kerr. Uh, right. Hmm. right. I was happy to go after Rob, but um, look, um, I look, I, I have to speak against this. Um, completely understand the sentiment, um, but we we have to look carefully at what it is we're proposing here. Um, we're asking uh, the state government to change uh, its policy with respect to its budget and its transport budget. Um, when you say free uh, buses and public transport should be free, um, really that's actually a bit misleading. Um, what we're actually asking is for uh, public transport within Adelaide uh, to be 100% subsidised um, by government, uh, subsidised by taxpayers, 100% paid for through the government budget. Um, it would only be free transport if uh, all of the, uh, everyone at the uh, Department of Transport, uh, all of the bus drivers, all of the people who manufacture buses, if they were all volunteers that would be the way that it would be free transport. Uh, so what we're actually asking is for taxpayers to pay 100% uh, of public transport. Now, um, the, the, the problem there is for a, for a start, what you're going to end up doing is you're gonna have just a, a, you, you're gonna have a cascading series of local councils all requesting that they have free transport services. Um, it, it, you know, the, the, the Minister uh, for Transport uh, is going to have to consider all councils um, because why would we uh, have free transport and not the uh, not Prospect Council uh, or Burnside Council? And you've also got to be careful about this sort of stuff. There's, I think there's a reason why um, people do contribute something. I and mean, obviously uh, it's not entirely user pays when it comes to uh, public transport as it is. Uh, it is already heavily subsidised. But I think that, that paying for a public transport is important on the principle um, that one should always contribute something uh, to what one receives, to the services uh, that one receives. And one of the reasons that's an important principle uh, is because it makes uh, the people who, uh, uh, who receive those services, it gives them agency uh, in the services they receive. Otherwise, they become simply uh, just sort of supplicants, uh, okay? And they can be told, listen, you don't pay anything towards uh, your service, so don't complain. It gives uh, a level of accountability uh, to the services that are provided. Um, there's another uh, sort of outcome that may be detrimental. For example, what this does, what, if, if this took place, if you had public transport uh, completely subsidised by taxpayers, completely free, you're essentially saying that those who drive cars uh, must completely subsidise those who don't drive cars, who take buses. Um, if you're a young woman and you are working in retail uh, and you therefore have to come home uh, at night time in winter or on Friday nights, you may have decided to drive a car because it is safer. Um, you were then presented with a penalty. You are, you are essentially penalised uh, for driving. You are presented with an incentive to catch a bus, which you may consider more dangerous because catching a bus means that young women are placed uh, uh, in uh, proximity to uh, male, to strangers, to strange men. Uh, this is a calculation that is taking place out there in the market. These are some of the outcomes that may not be considered. I think it is important that we do actually think through 
the whole nuance of this stuff and not just stop blindly at the words free transport. It is a lot more complex. And I think that this is why you're better off uh, uh, leaving the state and federal governments to provide essential services where there is some me measure of contribution and you have a, a more balanced uh, a balanced uh, market outcome at play because you can have detrimental outcomes. So I just raised those as things that to illustrate uh, the gray, the shades of gray involved here. But mainly, I don't think this is I, I don't think this is a is a, is a clever a piece of advocacy. I think it'll just be a cascading series. Everyone will want it, and it's not going to get anywhere. Thank you, Councillor Kira. Uh, members, I do have to ask: Are you able to hear the bell when it rings? You're not hearing the bell. Okay. Um, uh, I have Councillor Martin. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. A, a question for Councillor Canole, because I'm not quite sure um, what, what free means. In, in the case of somebody like, um, uh, you know, someone travelling from Walkerville um, to the city, is he proposing that they pay the fare from Walkerville to the city boundary and then from the city boundary it's free? Is, is that what he's proposing? Or the whole journey is free? Uh, this is about an, a plan for the destination. So therefore, people pay their fares to get into the city, but as they're travelling around the city, they, uh, that is then... Uh, uh, that is then, in a sense, for free. Well, not free, but, uh, you know, so they can use the, the bus within the city uh, to get around to wherever they need to go. So paying to come into town and home, obviously all of those sort of things still continue. It's just as the tram, uh, you know, it is uh, enables them to use that for service. Uh, you know, you. Okay. Um, Sorry, so that, that is correct then. What you're saying is, you want everyone to pay the fare to the city, but once they hit the city, it's free and for all travel within the city, just like the tram is. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, look, you know, uh, um, being selfish, I mean, this is a great thing for the ratepayers of North Adelaide um, because it means not only is the city connector available and the tram when it comes, Lord Mayor, thank you for your advocacy on that. Um, not only are they free, but it means that they can jump on the G10 or whatever it is in O'Connell Street or the, uh, the M274 from Melbourne Street and it's free. So, um, you know, as a, uh, a North Adelaide Ward Councillor, I can do nothing but commend you. I, this is just a very good motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I wish to join in the praise of uh, Councillor Canole um, I think this is a great initiative, um, Councillor Canole, and one I uh, support wholeheartedly. Um, and uh, I think, you know, this is precisely the kind of thing that, that we should be doing. Um, you know, Lord Mayor, I'm a big believer in the Pantene effect in progressive politics. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. And, uh, you know, I uh, put forward a, a very similar motion uh, early last year and uh, there wasn't support for that at that time because people said, oh, this is beyond our remit and we can't be, uh, you know, dealing with issues to do with public transport. But I'm very relieved to see that there is a change of heart tonight and that there is support building for this because I think we have a responsibility to try and encourage people to come into the city in an environmentally sustainable way. And uh, as Councillor Canole has said, um, this is a green transport option. Um, and uh, public transport should be something that we encourage. There are lots and lots of benefits of, um, of public transport in terms of helping us achieve our goal as a carbon neutral city. And um, so I'm really delighted that uh, Councillor Canole has taken this on and uh, I support him 100%. And, you know, I'd love to see um, public transport... Oh. oh, sorry. And, uh, sorry. sorry. I I'd love to see... Um, public transport access being improved to our city so that we can get more and more people coming into town um, and being able to take alternative forms of transport rather than just uh, cars. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I do take Councillor Kira's points. Uh, I think on balance, this is a good motion though. Um, and what sealed the deal for me was Franz's example um, when he told me some time ago 
that uh, if I was living in an apartment on Wakefield Street and I wanted to catch the bus to the central market, it's going to cost me, oh, what is it? $5.60 now, I think, actually. Um, it's going to cost me that much to get down the street. Um, and it's also going to cost me uh, that much if I want to go to Unley Shopping Centre. And in fact, someone made the point to me yesterday when I told them that example that if they wanted to go to Mount Barker, it's actually going to cost them $5.60 as well um, uh, because that's an hour trip. So that doesn't really make sense to me. We want people that live in the city um, uh, or are otherwise in the city, let's say they're at a doctor's appointment somewhere and they want to go shopping in the Central Market or Rundle Mall or anywhere else for that matter. Um, we want them to have a, a very easy uh, and cheap option uh, to get to where they need to go to spend money um, in the city of Adelaide. So um, uh, I think uh, on balance, I do take Councillor Kira's points, but on balance, um, I think this is a very fair one, not least of all because these buses are running and they're running empty. So what's the point? I think I think the um, uh, the cost the cost in foregone revenue is quite possibly actually not going to be that high, and I'd be very keen to know um, uh, if hopefully Dipti engage uh, the City of Adelaide in working up the modelling. I'd be very interested to know what that uh, foregone revenue actually comes back as because I I don't think it's going to be very much at all. Um, uh, so I commend the motion and I thank Franz for bringing it. Thank you. I have Councillor Donovan, Councillor Kura. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I too uh, would add my support and just to correct um, a, uh, an assertion that was made previously that those who drive cars would need to subsidise those who don't have to drive cars in an instance like this. That's, that's actually incorrect. Um, the reality is that uh, the cost of managing uh, the transport system for high car use versus public transport use is vastly, vastly more costly. And that's well researched, well evidenced. And that's due to the, uh, the cost of road maintenance when you've got obviously a whole lot more individual cars that are needing to be run versus, um, versus the, uh, the space of public transport much more efficient. It's the congestion costs, road construction and maintenance, parking costs, that's actually also the huge cost of accidents that occur in when you compare cities with uh, heavier car usage compared to public transport. Um, so uh, in fact, public transport and certainly walking and cycling is, is much more cost effective. Um, and oh, I mean, you can add to that land use and economic efficiency um, and those, those figures are well researched. So I'd absolutely support um, Councillor Canole's uh, motion here. And the other point being, of course, if any household can reduce their car usage by choice, uh, it, it increases their discretionary, discretionary spending. So in the case of uh, households within the CBD, if through um, additional public transport, through adding other transport methods like improved cycling and walking infrastructure, if uh, a household chose to reduce a car, uh, they actually have a whole lot more discretionary spending, which can then go into city businesses. So that's a win all round. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kouros. Sorry, uh, Lord Mayor, I just don't want to add more um, to this night um, and make it any longer, but I just have to say that I commend this motion. I think it's an excellent motion um, that uh, Councillor Canole is bringing through. I think it just highlights even further that the support that the businesses need for people to move efficiently throughout the council, Adelaide City Council, coming going from north, going to south. If it's for free, they would move more more uh, easily and visit more businesses throughout the city. And this is just what they need. If the, the state government can take anything on board from this tonight, and that's the fact that 80% of our rates are coming from businesses. There goes to show that we have got such a big business community here, raising, going from the north, going from the south and central. So to have people moving more freely throughout the city um, just can really support them, um, especially during um, you know recovery um, of uh, of you know trying to get our businesses back on track, the businesses back on track. Thank you, Councillor. Sounds like Abraham's today. That, that, uh, oh, there we go. Well, I gather that there, since everyone's talked, I might as well uh, say my bit. Uh, I agree with, uh, 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 with everything that everyone has said. I say, uh, let's get the people moving and the economy booming. Thank you. 
Uh, I will go back to Councillor Canal to sum up. Councillor Canal. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone, uh, for the for the positive feedback. Uh, I mean, quite simply, we already pay eighty percent of the buses. It's uh, so that, that service is paid for already mainly by the the, uh, the the taxpayers. There are enough other cities that have free bus services, and also this is about encouraging more people onto the buses. This is about using the city as a destination and putting together with apps and things like that. We've been using it better. I think you think that. This is about encouraging more public transport, and that's a way to do it. And this is a way to make the city a more desirable location for people to come to. We knew we need that to, to consolidate our footprint. Thank you, yeah. Council Canal. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Councillor Martin. Oh, division, please. A division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called. Councillor Abrahams today, Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Canole, Councillor Ho, Councillor Kuros, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Sims. Thank you, members. Uh, that takes us to 15.9, Amendment to Standing Orders, Councillor Martin. Um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, you want me to find a seconder for this? I'm looking for a seconder. I have Councillor Sims. Thank you. Now, look, Lord Mayor, this, um, uh, and I know you'll disagree, but this is a sensible motion. Our last meeting concluded at 3.20 a.m., the one before that after midnight. Um, and tonight, uh, my guess is we're headed for uh, the witching hour again. And while uh, I know people say, oh, well, you know, people meet at all hours of the morning, what does it matter? It, it matters a lot because the, uh, the quality of the decision making, and I'm not asserting this, this is a scientifically proven fact. The quality of decision making decreases with the hour. The decision that is made at 9 p.m is never of the quality of the one that's made at 3 a.m. And let me tell you, at 3 a.m. at our last meeting, we were making decisions about spending literally tens of millions of dollars of ratepayer money. And people were getting impatient. People were saying, you know, don't ask questions, just approve it. That's what happens when you have meetings that go till three or four in the morning. Um, and the irony of that last meeting at 3.20 a.m. was that the meeting that was scheduled for the week after was cancelled. The meeting that was in our diaries was cancelled. Now, I know you say that was only a placeholder, but we could have adjourned at midnight or 10 p.m. and come back the week later. It would have made no difference apart from the quality of the decision making. So there was no reason for us to be sitting in the room until 3.20 a.m. Um, except... Uh, whatever it is that um, makes this council think that it's okay to meet until that, ear, that hour. Now, uh, I know, Lord Mayor, you will say, oh, well, we meet late because you lot um, um, put up too many motions. Um, and and uh, th that's wrong on two counts. Uh, the first is, it is our job, uh, you know, even when the Deputy Lord Mayor does his virtue signalling and puts up stuff that's not important, it's still his role. I accept that. Um, and we are here for the purpose of improving the lot of our ratepayers from our own perspective, from our own perspective as elected members. And the second thing is that it's not true. Um, and, and I've I told you previously, I checked uh, in March when you first raised this, and in March 2019, there were, over the course of two meetings, five motions more than there were actually in March 2020. And uh, I, I checked May, and you're right on this occasion. Yes, um, there are uh, seven more on this occasion. But um, in, uh, in June, um, uh, there are, in 2019, 17 motions there were at that meeting. So there's a challenge to elected members. Um, 17 plus will be more than we actually 
uh, debated during the course of June 19. Did that work? <laughs> Oh, Sorry. <laughs> I can't hear anything, Lord Mayor. Uh, um, so I'm, I'm just uh, wanting to make the final point, and I'm sure you'll indulge me in this, uh, is that uh, we have an obligation to our staff, uh, many of whom are having to travel home at late hours. A and I, I am concerned about that, about their safety, but more particularly, uh, I, I'm concerned that we're pushing too hard. If you work a full day and then you work 10 hours at, uh, at night, that is a big, big workload. Thank and I, I ask members to seriously and... consider this. Yes. I have Councillor Sims as the seconder. Uh, did you wish to speak, Councillor? With my right. I'll Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kerra. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, I heard that bell. It's, it's like being at a prize fight. Um, I'm so sorry. We were just, it hasn't been working all night, cause, so I thought I'd try it with my microphone. I'm so sorry. Like, yeah, just picture a giant gong back there. Um, <laughs> um, look, um, let it be known, let it be known that Councillor Martin brought forward to the Chamber a gag motion, Lord Mayor, a gag motion. G A G gag and and being uh, Lord Mayor, being the leader of his faction, uh, it's quite fascinating that it would seem his faction doesn't seem to understand democracy. Um, what you know, tr trying to gag the ability of elected members to speak at a meeting. Uh, let it not be forgotten. And I spoke about you know uh, how it you know. Uh, how rich it is for some of these motions, some of the hypocrisy coming forward. This is the ultimate. The streets won't be paved with gold, they'll be platinum. We will have platinum streets with this kind of, if this kind of richness continues. Mm -hmm. Councillor Martin led his faction in deliberately, deliberately prolonging the last meeting for as late as possible. They did this. Councillor Martin relentlessly pursued calling divisions when unnecessary. Okay, look back at the, uh, look back at the meeting. They called divisions completely relentlessly, completely deliberately. Councillor Moran flooded the chamber with a whole bunch of motions. She then left the chamber before the meeting finished. And then to top it off, the absolute icing on the cake, you know, the wedding cake, had Councillor Moran sent an email around uh, the next day to admit two members and administration gloating about what a wonderful meeting it was and how great it went on for so long. This faction has been a bunch of bullies. They are Councillor Keller, Councillor Keller, don't forget they, we're talking they, they to the nation. Bullies. They are a bunch of bullies. Councillor Keller. Or to draw the attention away from their own bullying behaviour. We all Councillor know. Councillor Keller, that's three it's times, gone. please. And it is utterly hypo hypocritical to see this. We all know why they're doing this. They just want to return back to fortnightly meetings so they can bully every fortnight instead of every month. Councillor Kerr, thank you. Gonna, we're not going to buy it. I have... Uh, Councillor Martin, was that a question? Uh, yes, look, I'd ask Councillor Kira in the context of there being an inquiry into the culture of the organisation, to withdraw the suggestion that I've been bullying people, that I continue to bully people, uh, it, that is really damaging. We have a legal firm investigating us and, and he's making that allegation without any substance. Please yes. withdraw. Councillor Kerr, you withdraw your remark? No. Uh, I'll go to the Deputy Lord Mayor and then, oh, Deputy Lord Mayor, and then Councillor Sims. Uh, well, thank you to Councillor Kerr for waking me up. Um, uh, I do have, I do, I do just have a question, um, and it's one on process, um, Lord. Mayor. I'm just a, I'm just a little bit hazy um, about how this might work in practice. So once we approach, um, uh, sort of, I guess the the end of a council meeting or the allotted time, will we still need a motion of council in order to adjourn it? Yes, that's correct. So um, regardless of if there's a uh, a cap on the time, um, then they would still need a motion of the majority of the chamber to adjourn the meeting. Okay. Um, That's correct, isn't it? Yes. Comparing, comparing that to how we operate currently, do we need a motion to adjourn meetings right now? That's uh, if, cool, we wish, if we wish to adjourn the motion uh, to the meeting, then a councillor could fo put forward a motion to adjourn and it would be voted on by the chamber. Okay. Is a councillor um, free to sort of do that at any time or? Yes, they are. Yes. 
So what, what, what's the difference between what this change to the standing order would be and? I'm assuming that's a rhetoric question, but I oh, have. No, well, it's a legitimate one. It's, it's, it, it's le is there a difference? It's like, it, how is this going to change my life other than, other than it, it appears in the diary uh, ending at 10.30 instead of 1.30, but we still decide at the end of the day. Uh, that's the only thing I can see changing. Is, is there anything else that changes other than the ink on the page of the standing orders? I'm, I'm confused. Thank you. Again, I'm assuming that's rhetoric. Um, I will go to Councillor Sims. Thank you, Thanks, Councillor. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, um, uh, Councillor Hyde um, is maybe having difficulty understanding what's been um, proposed here. It has been a long night. So I'm happy to explain um, it uh, to him uh, through you, Lord Mayor. Uh, my understanding of this is that it sets a default um, finishing time uh, for the council, which to me just makes perfect sense. I mean, ideally we would move away from the monthly um, meeting regime because I don't think it has been conducive to good decision-making. But I recognise that um, there are a few members of council that are wedded to that um, for some reason and they do not want to shift. So I think what Councillor Martin has proposed is a, uh, a really good, um, a really good compromise. It basically says, look, this is the default time that a meeting goes for. If you're still running at the end of the meeting, well, you can have an extension if you need, but the expectation is that you reschedule. And um, we've got provision in our standing orders and in the new structure um, for us to uh, do that. We have a sort of default meeting on a Tuesday anyway, so let's carry the, the matters forward. Um, I'd certainly prefer that rather than being here um, till the early hours of um, the morning. I know there's there's kind of a bit of a narrative around Town Hall that the reason why we're meeting so late is because of the huge numbers of motions that come from the independent members of this council. But if you look at um, the, uh, the motions that have been lodged tonight, actually, um, the uh, frequent flyers when it comes to motions are actually the Team Adelaide members. Councillor Kouros, Councillor Hyde, uh, the leader of the faction um, is someone who is very active in terms of lodging Thank motions, you. often so um, motions around topics that are, are totally superfluous and are already underway. Um, and we've got quite a few of those um, coming down tonight uh, that relate to projects that administration are already working on. So it's not true to say that there's one particular group of council that um, you know, put forward a lot of motions. I, uh, I've put forward a lot of motions, Lord Mayor. I'm happy to cop that on the chin. I see that as being part of my role as an elected member to uh, put forward ideas on behalf of the community. And I, I make no apologies for that. Um, but I do think these council meetings shouldn't be an endurance uh, session. Um, they shouldn't be a, um, a midnight marathon. Uh, it's one thing for us as an elected body to decide that we're going to do that. But I do um, feel sorry for our staff that are forced to sit there for hours and hours and hours. Um, you know, we'll have to start having uh, people bringing along sleeping bags and stuff like that because I just think it's very unfair to uh, expect people to be there until 3 a.m. And there is a safety risk in terms of leaving town hall and so on at that time. So I'd implore councillors to move away from the, the hyper-partisan lens that Councillor Kira has applied and look at this as a, a, a common sense compromise motion and support it on that basis. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Um, I have no more hands. Um, just, just in response to that though, Councillor Sims, the moving of the motions in the previous term of council, we would be lucky to get three or four uh, in a council meeting. It was a uh, it was a an exception rather than the rule. So, um, uh, and we are all experiencing um, lots of motions, regardless of where they come from. There are an extraordinary number of motions on the agenda as it's come forward. Um, in terms of this, uh, I think, just to clarify, we even if this does go through, members, we still would need a motion of council to adjourn the meeting. That is the process that we would have to do. Um, I will go to Councillor Martin to sum up. Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, uh, I hear what you're saying about 
the large number of motions being an exception rather than the rule, but I invite councillors to have a look at uh, the agenda for the previous couple of years, go through them, you'll see exactly what I see. That is, there is no change in the number of motions per month. What has changed is we now meet once a month instead of twice. And where meetings, and if you check the minutes, meetings concluded at 9, 10, 11.30, they now conclude, as we saw in the case of the last meeting, at 3.20 a.m. That is the big change. And what this says is, look, five hours is enough. At 10.30, your brain is not processing things as well as it should. And we've seen that. Councillor, uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor says, I'm confused. I don't understand. And it's a very obvious motion. It says 10.30 is the limit. And in uh, uh, consistent with other councils who have very similar rules on their standing orders, consistent with other councils, we're proposing that there be a motion uh, to extend the meeting. Now, look, uh, Lord Mayor, I, I'm not going to talk further about the health and safety issues associated with this, especially for staff, other than to say, I am just stunned that the, uh, the union representing staff hasn't raised this. And it must be a bit of a red rag to them when they're engaged in a dispute with us that we're driving staff to these extraordinary uh, hours. But I just want to ask members to reflect on this. Um, when you have completed a full day's work and you come into council and you work 10 hours and you go home at 3.34 or go to bed, um, the council is actually asking your business, your employer, to carry the cost of your inability to perform at peak level the next day. That is to say, this council is saying um, that, I'm sorry, Lord Mayor, I, did I say something funny? I'm sorry, I just saw you laughing. I thought I said something funny. Um, uh, I, I just think that's an unfair burden on employers. Uh, to say, even if it's your own business, you're going to be performing below par for the next 24 hours because the council, for some reason, which yet escapes me, um, uh, will meet until three in the morning and then not meet next week, might have a week or two off. It's a very strange circumstance. When every rule will, would dictate that if you haven't finished it by 10.30 p.m., you're not going to be making good decisions after that hour. You are better coming back on another occasion. Um, look, I, I know this won't be supported. Um, I, um, I said to someone today, um, this is the, uh, the death wish of Team Adelaide. However, I, I hope that enough will support it, that it does, um, does get uh, carried. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kira, I'm, I'm not sure if you've put your hand up. Just sorry. a question. Just, just a question that just occurred it's to me. It's been summed up, Councillor Kira, so oh, I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I can't ask a question. No, I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, uh, members to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is lost. Division. Ah, oh, Councillor Martin. Division, please. Yes. Sorry, I was his hand off. That's all right. Council members, a division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called? Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Kuros, and Councillor Sims. So, members, we go to 15.10. Uh, Councillor Martin. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I assume that the, uh, the motion is read and understood? Uh, yes. Sorry, Councillor Kouros, I need a, an electronic hand. I can see you waving. Sorry. Um, I just want to uh, declare that uh, I have a conflict. Sorry, are we, we're on 15.10, correct? We are. Yep. Yeah. 
So I just want to uh, declare um, that I have a conflict with this item uh, on the basis that we uh, have family businesses that uh, run restaurants on O'Connell Street. And in this motion, it is mentioned in the, um, in the, in the motion. Thank you. And uh, are you voting or staying? So at this point, I want to stay in the meeting. I may participate in the debate, but I will not be voting. Uh, um, so, uh, sorry, Councillor Kouros, you have to say which conflict it is. It's um, an actual conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kouros. Uh, I have Councillor Sims as a seconder. Councillor Martin. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I'm pleased administration um, has done a lot of work on this already. Um, uh, that was um, not apparent at the time of lodging this motion. Um, and the origins of it are principally what's been happening in Europe, uh, in countries uh, like uh, Lithuania, which has turned over its public streets to its hospitality industry, and also in places like Canada. A and it is designed primarily to assist uh, businesses by making available the outdoors when um, uh, social distancing rules mean that indoors, there's just not the, uh, the space available. So for example, um, if you had uh, a restaurant, uh, which was in, you know, a, a, a crowded dining room and people love crowded dining rooms, you might get 40 diners, social distancing in some cases I am told would reduce the number of diners to perhaps 10. Um, and for some restaurants, um, the prospect of going outdoors is fairly limited. Um, you know, if you have two tables and there are a number of restaurants in O'Connell and Melbourne Street who have very few tables, then they would simply not be able to attract enough diners to get the throughput to pay the bills. And uh, as uh, Councillor Kouros has declared a conflict, I can mention her business, uh, Literally, for example, just has a couple of tables outside. And so this would allow in that case, um, uh, the administration to consider the possibility of one of the properties next door, which is not using um, its public realm, um, one of those properties to be used for outdoor dining. It would instantly increase the capacity, the throughput of restaurants. Now, um, three or four tables outside are simply not enough. Um, physical distancing means that four, uh, square meters, four, four square meters per person, I'm sorry, Lord Mayor, it's getting late, um, uh, just wouldn't uh, hold up as a socially distanced appropriate um, separation. So um, the idea is that opening the public realm would help our businesses. And I can see this working in the city, uh, in, for example, areas outside of restaurants in Guja Street, uh, outside of restaurants in Hutt Street, um, and indeed even in Rundle Street. Um, but I'm also talking about um, in the hands of the administration looking at um, partial and full street closures. Um, it, you would remember, Lord Mayor, that uh, Splash um, or one of our programs anyway, uh, conducted what were called city parklets. It was enormously successful. We simply took away parking spaces and turned them over to public realm. So uh, in conclusion, we need to do everything we can to help small business. This is a small, fairly cheap measure that allows restaurants to expand their throughput by using public realm. Thank you. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm really supportive of this and I, I thank uh, Councillor Martin for his leadership on this. I think, um, Lord Mayor, this reflects the trend that we're seeing uh, internationally and within our own country around, in terms of cities' responses to COVID-19, then looking at how people can reclaim the, the streets and rather than city streets just being places for cars and car parks, actually looking at what we can do to use that infrastructure to support local businesses or to support a healthy lifestyle, people movement and so on whilst complying with social distancing. And I think this is a really um, positive uh, measure. 
Um, I shared uh, an article, um, one of the many articles um, regarding this featuring Councillor Martin um, on my Facebook page um, and uh, was inundated with positive feedback from the community saying, you know, this is the kind of um, thing that um, we uh, should be supportive uh, of doing. And, and through you, Lord Mayor, I can see Councillor Kira um, and uh, nodding in agreement. Yes, you're right, Councillor Kira, my Facebook page did receive very strong support for the idea. Um, and I think that's because um, there is support across a broad cross section of the community for this kind of approach. I think also, Lord Mayor, we've got to do what we can do within our authority to support small business at this time. Um, and this is something easy that we can do. And we've seen the success of road closures in other parts of the city, you know, places like Lee Street and councils had a terrific um, role to play, I think, in, in terms of really activating that part of town. We could do that on places like Rundle Street, Hutt Street, O'Connell Street, even at, at a short term measure. Um, but I think that could be a really effective um, activation. So I'm excited about the potential for this. Obviously, at the moment, when we're only having 10 people um, outside uh, at restaurants and so on, um, it, it, the idea of, um, of, of this happening in a big scale is, is, um, is difficult to imagine. But in a few weeks, um, I think things are going to hopefully change and we'll move into a space where restrictions are being eased and there will be more people being outside, more people wanting to dine out and um, they'll want to do so in a way that complies with social distancing. So I think this is a great idea and I encourage everybody to get behind it. Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I just would like to move an amendment. I've just sent it to Penny earlier. If we can get it on the screen. Is that, is that there? Did, would you like me to read it out or? Um, really straightforward. I'll just let everybody have a quick read. Okay. I'll we'll just, uh, oops. There we go. I'll look for a seconder. I think I've got Councillor Abraham today. Are you seconding? Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Okay. Um. Uh. I think. Uh, I think this will actually clear up some. What. What I would say was confusion of an otherwise decent idea. Um. Uh, just in the community, I know that. Um. When we were when people were talking about closing streets and what have you, it it sent some people into a frenzy. Um. Uh, because there's limited trust in council and there's limited trust in, um, in what we will do and and people. Uh, foresaw that council would come down upon them and say, uh, oh, we're going to close your street off, uh, put some tables and chairs out there, um, and that's how we're going to do it. So that's why I've actually sought to um, uh, talk about appropriate city streets more clearly and also the consultation and the endorsement from the traders local to each activation. Um, uh, I, think that's, I think that's very important um, uh, as well to make sure we've got their buy-in because we don't want to just be closing off streets and saying, hey, chuck out some plastic tables and chairs, um, uh, and then it's not um, uh, taken up. Uh, the other thing is uh, presenting it as part of the recovery work. Um, currently, the motion is, is more or less sitting outside of the recovery work, um, uh, but I think it would be best to consider this uh, all together as one, as one sort of a package so that we can consider many different options um, and have it alongside um, all the other bits and pieces that come into the recovery work um, that we're doing. Um, the, the other thing which I thought necessary to clean up as well is the um, just the, the reference to footprint currently all allocated to outdoor dining areas for food sellers, um, so on. Um, that, that is overly prescriptive to my mind because it actually refers to a permit um, and then you'd have our customer service and, uh, potentially scurrying around looking to, to, to fix permits or change permits and what have you. And if it were to be interpreted that way, and that's how I interpret it, that's a big administrative burden um, and it's unnecessary. But we as the city do have the power 
um, uh, to undertake other activations and without tinkering with existing permits, um, uh, have something that sits alongside it and separate to it um, that we're just able to issue ourselves um, as the relevant authority. So um, also, uh, Lord Mayor, I thought it was uh, pertinent to acknowledge the laneways where I think this will actually work best. Um, uh, the laneways are important and I know that you acknowledge them um, uh, in, in some of your public commentary on this. Um, uh, and lastly, I just wanted to thank uh, Director Hill and his team um, uh, because I saw this uh, was floated as a suggestion in one of our previous committees or workshops uh, where we were talking about some of the recovery and reimagine work. Um, so it is good to know that uh, that all of this is underway um, already, and I hope this provides some clearer direction um, and some clear will from that willingness uh, to go down this path. Thank you. Councillor Abraham today, did you wish to speak? Reserve my right, thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor Kira, then Councillor Sin. Councillor Kira, hang on one moment. Thank, okay. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Uh, look, I, I support the amendment. Uh, I do commend Councillor Martin for bringing this initiative forward, and I, I do support the sentiment um, uh, behind this. Um, I think I think this amendment is is fine. I don't see that this um, that this uh, 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 detracts from the original motion. I, I think that it is important that traders have some say. There are nuances and issues around this. Closing uh, a street like O'Connell Street, there are pressures that are presented on traders uh, where they may feel they are obliged to uh, put up a marquee, uh, they're obliged to provide heating. Uh, it may be all these extra costs. It, it, we, we, we need their input. Um, and uh, closing entire main streets may not be the solution, but I think that this envisages that it may be part of the solution, but let's at least, we really, uh, given it's about helping traders get or to get them uh, on board and get their input. Thank you, Councillor Kira. Councillor Sims? Oh, thanks, Lord Mayor. I was actually putting my hand up because I saw Councillor Martin had his, had his um, hand up some time ago when Councillor uh, Hyde um, moved his amendment. So I was trying to draw your attention to that. Oh, sorry, I, um, I, so I, I'm, I'll, I've got a thing in front of me that shows me that's all, all right. the... Um, so I, I think I did the electronic one. I think Councillor Martin might have done the physical hand. Uh, so I was just highlighting Councillor Martin's uh, Thank you, Councillor Uh And I have Councillor Kouros, then Councillor Martin. Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I believe this uh, amendment I can vote for. Um, this uh, doesn't actually give me any um, conflict. Um, can I, uh, do I need clarification on that or is everyone satisfied with that? Okay. Um, uh, I see Councillor Martin shaking his head. So, is it is there something? No, sorry, I, I have um, governance with me, and they're nodding. You, you are absolutely free to discuss this one. Okay. Um, so, I believe that this amendment is a lot more clearer. Um, uh, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor is correct. We need the traders to come on board. Um, businesses need uh, have got different models um, for their business, and. Um, um, giving them the added pressure of um, having a lot more tables and chairs outside the premises, closing off streets um, is a, a different model altogether and they would need to be supported by council for this. Um, so, I mean, I get Councillor Martin's intent, I 100% get the intent, but this um, is still delivering the same thing, but it allows the traders to be more on board and to collaborate more with council and maybe align it with something, I mean, Rundle Street is closed. Um, during the fringe, it works during the fringe, it's got a lot of activation and activity and and, um, and it brings an atmosphere um, to have this in the middle of winter um, with it raining and, um, you know, freezing cold and, and you know, allowing, uh, closing off the street just wouldn't, wouldn't work um, for the traders. It actually would bring a damper to it. Um, so I, I just think that it, it is something that we probably could even continue beyond winter, um, you know, adding more festivals coming into this. Uh, hopefully, we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. We don't know what the future holds. But I get the, like I said, I get Councillor Martin's intent, but this at least makes it more uh, clearer for traders and, uh, and for administration to work with the traders in over the winter months um, when we maybe um, will need to look at the recovery process um, of COVID. 
Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, uh, I am flattered um, that uh, the team has chosen to amend rather than vote against this. That's a, a step forward. However, uh, the amendment actually uh, takes something away from outdoor dining venues. What this amendment does is take away the possibility of offering where possible to extend the footprint currently allocated to outdoor dining areas for restaurants and cafes. So uh, places like uh, Litterly, uh, Councillor Kouros's place, would be restricted to the existing three or four tables outside. Um, this merely provides the possibility of street activations. So it's an entirely different motion. It's a Splash Adelaide motion. Uh, whereas my motion was designed to say to restaurants during this recovery period, we would like you to have public realm to put your tables and chairs to increase the number of people who can patronize your restaurant and increase your throughput. This is just a, um, a spoiler motion. It's about spoiling the opportunity for restaurants and cafes to survive in this crisis by linking any opportunity for throughput to activations on appropriate streets and laneways, um, subject to being presented with other recovery initiatives by the administration. Um, this is a killer, this is a killjoy. It is what Team Adelaide does best. It kills stuff. It doesn't enable businesses. And the intention in this was simply to say to restaurants, here is a lifeline. You're limited to the number of patrons you can have. We're going to make available to you outdoor areas. This says, uh -uh, that's gone. We're now back to street activations in the hands of the administration, when the administration chooses, in a report that's yet to come to council. If I was a restaurant owner, I'd be saying to the Deputy Lord Mayor and the Council of Kouros and those who think this is a good thing, you've done the dirty on me. You've actually limited my chances of making money. And restaurants in every part of the city, from Gurja Street to North Adelaide to Hutt Street, have lost the chance of additional patronage. Now, there'll be all kinds of words to uh, uh, denigrate what I'm saying and to deflect the criticism, but nothing will take away from the reality that every restaurant and cafe has, with this amendment, lost the chance of throughput. It's a killer, it's a killer. And it just irks me that it comes from people like Councillor Kouros, who know restaurants, who have restaurants, um, who know how important it is to get those tables, to get the throughput. And they're saying, no, nah, we're okay with street activations. I am so disappointed. Thank you. Councillor Kouros, you had a... Yes, I have a point of clarification. Councillor Martin does uh, not know what model um, our the businesses are run on. He's a, not a restaurateur. He's a, uh, an ex-owner of a second-hand bookstore, so has no right to comment on what benefit this has on any business that I'm associated with because it's not for him to put, be in the position to clarify that. And Councillor Martin. Well, Lord Mayor, Happily, I'm able to respond to Councillor Kouros uh, and say to her, she does know what she's talking about. I, I did own a restaurant in Melbourne Street. I am f familiar with hospitality, uh, not to the extent that she is. She has a, a vast restaurant empire that okay, would benefit you. from this. Thank you. Ah, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, I, I'm not supportive of this um, amendment either. Um, mainly because I think this does, um, as Councillor Martin has said, sort of miss the point um, somewhat, um, because I think really there's an opportunity here to increase the support that we provide to um, small businesses. There was a big push um, 12 months or so ago around removing outdoor dining fees. Um, that was uh, announced with a great amount of um, fanfare, but it hasn't had any impact, um, as far as I'm aware, in terms of um, creating uh, positive outcomes for um, small businesses. And I'm talking about the, the, the prior to COVID-19 um, dynamic, obviously, but it didn't really have an impact. And, and in fact, it's funny, 
I still have businesses saying to me, when are you going to waive outdoor dining fees? I think well, we've done it. Um, but people are not necessarily aware because it didn't have a demonstrative impact on um, the work of their business. Um, but uh, this is something that I think would have a, um, a demonstrative impact. Um, and so, you know, I'd encourage people not to dilute the motion, but to stick with the original motion. Um, if this amendment is carried, um, then of course I will support the substantive because it is moving us in the right direction. But um, I think it would be a shame to see this diluted. It is an opportunity to provide some additional support um, and uh, maybe something that might actually land in terms of um, uh, having an impact, a positive impact. Uh, I have Councillor Canal. Just really short. Um, now, restaurants and everyone else I gather is limited to 10 patrons at any one time. It's not about space. Moment. It's not about space. It's winter. It's 10. And that's it. No one's going to open for 10 because they just can't afford it, particularly without alcohol. So we're, we're talking about imaginary uh, uh, benefits. Well, it's, you know, it, we, we've got to deal with what we've been given, the three-step plan. I've got it in front of me and I'm thinking, and next month, we're all good. We do 20. Now, if we're loud inside, that's even a win. But there, it's all very prescriptive. So therefore, uh, we are limited to what we can influence. So yes, put out something and yes, work get the, the restaurateurs and then the other business people who have got this, let them work together, but let's not overstate this uh, effort, which, which uh, we're, not, we're limited outside our capacity uh, to 10, 20, we get to 100, we're all good, at least a few pubs can open up and things like that. But the point is that's the reality. And this stuff we're doing and this time we're wasting achieves nothing because we've already been told what we're allowed to have. And if we use that as a guideline and work towards, as a council, when you can have 20, that we start seeing what can we do to get, get the maximum out. When we do get to 100, well, then we can start to use our city and, and enable and work together with the, all the various businesses that are supplying that, this, this uh, opportunity and, and you know, the service. Uh, that's real. And this whole 30-minute exercise is talking about nothing. So please, let, you know, I mean, this is what we call waste. I mean, at least this is a, a talking towards working with the people that are, you are trying to help and at least let them lead because that's what they need. Um, and let's just get on with it. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Councillor Martin, I'm assuming you have a question. Um, yes, I do for the administration. Um, if um, uh, this change were adopted and um, 20 people were allowed in restaurants, um, would the four metre rule apply and would it necessarily mean then that only restaurants that were 80 square metres in dining area would be able to have 20 people? Is that correct? CEO. That's eight metres by 10 metres? That's as I understand it, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, Ian, have you got any comments for us, please? Well, it says I understand it too, CEO. You got Ian? So you might be able to answer that one. Yeah. Hi, thanks for unmuting me. Could you repeat the question, please, Councillor Martin? Sorry, sorry, just a moment. Uh, the, the question was about the numbers of people, so Councillor Martin. Oh, I, I think the CEO uh, well, I might... Uh, I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, as I understand it, to Councillor Canal's point that this is a waste of time, in the next step, is it true that the four metre rule applies so that if 20 people are allowed, then any restaurant uh, which can uh, consider um, having 20 diners must be minimum 80 square metres interior space, that is eight metres by 10 square metres? Um, I don't have the information in front of me. Um, what we um, are doing is um, making sure that um, as and when uh, the state government release each step that we're sharing it through our relevant channels. Um, we've had a lot of outdoor um, dining um, establishments contact us in the last two days in particular. 
um, about how they can expand their current outdoor dining offering um, to comply with um, the current stages um, announced by state government. So um, I'm not familiar with um, what it means from an indoor perspective, but we've certainly been working closely um, with um, outdoor dining um, and hospitality around the external space at the moment. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, sorry, Councillor Kuros. I have a question uh, to administration, if that's okay. I just uh, want to, to understand in regards to this motion, it means that the people that have, re have already inquired to administration regarding furthering the outdoor dining um, is something that you will be working closely with them and that's what this motion is, is asking you to do. And so if uh, traders will still have the benefit of being able to operate outdoors with the support of the council through the COVID? And is that how you read the motion that, that just gives further assistance with the traders and administration to have this happen? Sorry. No, I'm that's all... okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to wait for... Okay, yeah. Um, so um, I didn't take this to mean we would stop any work we were currently doing with hospitality um, venues around their ability to expand on footpaths. It does become challenging where, um, you know, there's a, a, a section of the street where there might be, you know, um, outdoor dining, outdoor dining, outdoor dining. And so for them to expand, um, obviously they'd be tripping into each other. So in those situations, definitely a bit more emphasis on being able to expand onto the street or closing a road would mean the whole street benefits. Um, but we we're already um, making sure that we're um, facilitating expansion where possible. Thank you. Uh, sorry, you. Sorry, and this is in collaboration with the traders on their request and with their assistance in doing so. If they, if that's the model of their business. Can you unmute? Um, yes, in the last two days, I think we've um, helped about seven businesses um, and uh, through the permit. Yeah, um, they've already been in touch. So obviously our outdoor dining office is working closely with them. That, oh, sorry, sorry Councillor Kuros. In your experience, um, to be able to have the streets closed off in the middle of winter, um, would that, uh, is something, is that something that uh, would bring on extra pressure to um, traders and to uh, council to administer? Um, we trialled some uh, winter outdoor activation in East End last year yeah. um, uh, yeah. through Ebenezer and Baden, which yeah. proved um, that actually um, many people have said to us that um, South Australians don't hang around on streets in the dark and wet and cold. Um, but what we were able to do was um, bring those areas to life. That coupled with um, some indoor music through the Umbrella Festival actually worked quite well. Um, I know, as has already been alluded to tonight, that um, Ian, uh, Director Hill's uh, Recovery and Reimagine team um, has some uh, good ideas about how to um, help um, bring those streets um, to life in a way that makes sure that the um, patrons are um, you know, more comfortable than perhaps what they normally would in the okay. South. I'm go going to go back to Councillor Martin. Last question, and then I'm going to ask the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm just trying to understand uh, the uh, Councillor Kouros um, has asked questions um, that have left me confused. The uh, previous motion allowed for the extension of footprint, and as I spoke to it, extending beyond the boundaries of existing hospitality venues. Um, were you saying, um, Claire, in response, that this motion will also allow that? Is that what you were saying? This amendment? Sorry, Councillor, what I'm saying is what this is saying is, um, Sorry, I've got the grey blob on my screen. There you go. So what, what this amendment is saying 
um, city streets, laneways, consultation, traders. Yep. So um, what I was saying was in terms of working um, to expand all existing permit holders, um, maximise the opportunity on footpaths, that we're already doing that. So that's all I'm saying. This wasn't didn't mean that that work would necessarily stop. No, no, I understand that. But the previous motion is about extending footprint of existing licenses. I'm asking directly, does this motion, this amendment here, allow for that occur, to occur? That is for restaurants and cafes to say, I want to use more footpath, even though it's not out front of my place. No. What this says is having regard to the eventual reopening of hospitality venues, ask the administration to provide advice on the feasibility and costs of outdoor hospitality activations on appropriate city streets and particularly city laneways in consultation with and with broad endorsement from the traders local to each individual activation. And that it asks us to, um, that that is presented alongside other recovery initiatives that we're already working on. I think that's what this one says. Councillor. Thank you, Director. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's also um, obviously that they are um, trying to expand their footprint so they can actually have some, uh, they can maintain the social distancing. It's my understanding that the social distancing will be in place for some time to come. So to Councillor Martin's question of earlier, yes, it would be an 80 square metre venue that would allow 20 people once the restrictions lift to 20 people. Um, I will go to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy no, Lord Mayor. this doesn't preclude people from approaching administration and asking them just in the same fashion that they've been doing beforehand. It doesn't do that at all. Um, uh, what it does is fix a number of other issues that there were with the original drafting, which would have detracted from the implementation of the motion. Um, uh, and furthermore, I'd just like to, to, to say, um, I did thank Ian, and of course, we're all very grateful for Ian, but of course, uh, I think it was Claire who was leading the stuff around the permit and the outdoor dining stuff. So um, uh, thank you to Claire um, for your ongoing efforts in that. And um, I look forward to hearing of more successes uh, where your team is helping people um, implement these options as they've been doing for a, a number of weeks already. So keep up the good work and uh, yeah, we'll commend the motion. Thank you, members. To the vote on the amendment, those in favour, by your hand. Those against, that is carried. That becomes the substantive and Councillor Martin. Um, I wanted a division on that, please. Thank you. Council members, a division has been called on the amendment. Would all those in favour of the amendment please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called? Councillor Connell, Councillor Ho, Councillor Kouros, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Kira, Councillor Abraham today. So, members, that now becomes a substantive. Uh, I have got Councillor Kouros, followed by Councillor Martin. You'll be summing up Councillor Martin, but Councillor Kouros, I have you first. Sorry, sorry, that was an error again, sorry. Okay, thank you. Is, is this you summing up Councillor Martin? Yep. So just before you sum up, I actually think that um, listening to the debate that we're all in furious agreement that we want to help all of our hospitality providers wherever we can. Um, I think it's fantastic that the administration is working. They are working as one team. Um, very hard to sort of say Ian or Claire or, or even Clinton because they're all working together on the entire recovery and reimagine program. It's not just one person or the other. And there's a whole team in the administration working behind them. Um, you're absolutely right in terms of Splash. Splash did deliver Lee Street and Peel Street and the Weymouth Street parties and the Ebenezer night markets and um, the Rundle Street closures for the fringe. Um, and so the team is absolutely uh, the right team to be facilitating any of these closures and the activities through the streets. Um, great to know that we're already facilitating the expansion of outdoor dining um, that will allow for social distancing and for these hospitality 
uh, and um, places to open. And uh, obviously, we have to move towards further further lifting of restrictions before we can do terribly much more because of the uh, uh, the 1.5 metre or 4 square metres per person rule that is currently in place and not likely to lift in the next stage. Um, so I uh, thank you, members. I will go to Councillor Martin to sum up. Councillor Martin. Well, look, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. And look, your excuses for this amendment from Team Adelaide does nothing to diminish the damage that's been done tonight to small businesses. Um, this motion here is diametrically opposed to the last one. This one simply allows whatever is being said in this room. This motion, the words of the motion, simply suggest that hospitality can expand on the basis of feasibility and a cost uh, study in activations on appropriate city streets and laneways, all as part of a plan that's yet to come to council. Now, the motion that was before the council was to ask the administration to come back to us immediately with advice on offering to extend outdoor dining footprints tied to the permit system. And the permit system, you know, as I know, is vital in determining the standards associated with outdoor dining. Tables have to be of a particular dimension, of a particular material, in a particular place. And so this would have facilitated the easy expansion of existing venues who cannot possibly meet social distancing rules by having, even today, a 40 square meter area in which to offer dining, or next week, 80 square metres, or the week after, 120 square metres. This is, sadly, just the sort of illustration that everybody needs to see, to see how divisive this factional political game that is being played by you, Lord Mayor, and your Team Adelaide faction Councillor is. Martin, that, Councillor Martin, if you are summing up on the amendment, please sum up on the motion. I am summing up. I, I am saying to you that Council the overturning of that motion and your apology for it is uh, Councillor Martin, damaging point the of business. order, I was not apologising. Apologizing. I was actually saying that we all seem to agree that this is a good idea, that we work with our traders in the city. And that's a misrepresentation of what's occurring, Lord Mayor, and that's the problem. It's Councilor a misrepresentation. Martin, if you would like to speak in summation of the motion before us, thank you. Oh, Lord Mayor, I am doing that, and I understand your game. You're not. You're casting aspersions at what I actually said. I am not. I understand exactly what you said. I saw it. We all heard it, and any objective observer would see it. I'm saying to you that this is an obliteration of the previous motion on factional lines, and you're papering over the cracks. And it really is to the detriment of our businesses, and I am really sorry for them sorry for them that this is the standard of politics in the city of Adelaide. Members to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Members, we have before us 11, 15.11, uh, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, um, the uh, supporting the homeless. Deputy Lord Mayor. Sorry, am I unmuted for a reason? Yes, you are. Uh, Fifteen point eleven. Your. Oh yes, I sorry, I I had I had it muted for the last few minutes of that last one. Um, uh, I move it as printed and seek a seconder. Okay, I've got a seconder in Councillor Kuros. I reserve my right. Councillor Kuros, did you wish to speak? <laughs> Surprise that he's reserved his right there. I think he's out of a breath or something. Um, you know, I just think uh, that uh, um, we're, you know, what we're bringing forward is um, supporting the homeless. I think it's um, quite important. I think it's what we all advocate for. Um, and uh, we in that space and, um, and I commend the Deputy Lord Mayor for bringing that through. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sims, I have you. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I wish to move an amendment, and that is uh, simply to strike out point two. If 
one, just for a moment, uh, Councillor Sims, just while we do that on the screen. And I have a seconder in, in uh, Councillor Martin. Got it? Yep. There it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sims. You wish to speak to it? Thanks, Lord Mayor. Members may recall uh, around um, March last year when uh, Councillor Hyde initially proposed this, um, this funding, um, I moved an amendment at that time to say, let's just give the money and not make it contingent on uh, state government funding. Um, and that uh, amendment was uh, opposed, unfortunately. And then um, when in the context of uh, budget discussions, administration proposed that uh, that be reallocated, um, there was a uh, concern expressed by um, elected members. Obviously, uh, myself, uh, Lord Mayor, expressed concern. I've been consistent on that. My view was always that the money should be given um, regardless of um, what uh, other entities are doing. Um, the Deputy Lord Mayor came out and said, oh, no, we, we definitely need to give that, um, that funding. Well, um, the reason the funding was uh, being withheld and was potentially going to be reallocated was um, because uh, the state government had not matched the funding. And my fear, Lord Mayor, is if uh, Councillor Hyde's motion goes forward as is, we're going to find ourselves in the same position again in 12 months' time. And again, there will be um, a push to uh, claw back the funding and again, elected members will express concern. Um, my view is, let's simply give the um, money to uh, the um, uh, organisations working to support homeless people to deal with the findings of the Dame Louise Casey report. Let's just give um, the funding and not tie it to um, the state government's actions that we can't um, control. Otherwise, we're going to find ourselves having the same um, discussion in 12 months time. We know that homeless people are in particular going to be impacted um, by uh, the economic downturn that we're going to experience as a result of um, COVID-19. And we really need to do what we can do to support them. And uh, I think ensuring that we provide consistent funding is an important part of that. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Martin, did you wish to speak? Um, only to say that I endorse uh, the sentiments of Councillor Sims. Um, if the city really wants to demonstrate credentials in the area of the homeless, then it must start acting independently and offering not only funding uh, and staff, as we do or have done on occasions, um, and moral support, um, but it must uncouple its desires to always see any measure that we perpetrate um, backed by state or federal funding. Um, we have the capacity to do these things. We have the money. Um, we lack the will. Um, and Councillor Hyde's, uh, sorry, the Deputy Lord Mayor, your Deputy's uh, motion ties us to that same old pattern. Unless the state government comes up with the money, we don't. It's kind of conditional um, uh, politics and uh, governance. It's very odd. Um, Councillor Sims's motion uh, or amendment is level-headed. It seems entirely sensible. Thank you, members. Anybody else like to speak? If not, just as a, a small point of clarification, Councillor Sims, um, I don't think there was anybody trying to claw back funding. It was simply that there was no mechanism to allocate the money other than through the motion of council and at the direction of council. And without that direction, we weren't able to allocate that money to projects. Um, so just as a small point there, um, I will go to Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, sorry, Councillor Sims. My apologies. Sorry, there we go. Sorry, thank Council you. Sims. No, that, that's fine, Lord Mayor. And look, thank you for your clarification. And I meant uh, no criticism of um, administration. They were doing what the previous motion had uh, had dictated. Um, but uh, my point is that if we don't remedy this, we will repeat that the same pattern again in 12 months' time. 
Um, and look, you know, Lord Mayor, we're a separate level of government here. Um, we're not simply the handmaiden of the state government and we should be acting independently and showing independent leadership on homelessness. And uh, let's provide them with the funding, no strings attached, um, rather than tying our advocacy and our work to what another arm of government does when we can't control their actions. Thank you, Councillor Simmons. Members, to the vote on the amendment, those in favour? Oh, sorry, sorry, can I ask that again? The, the, I wasn't sure where the hands going up. Jenny, did you get that? No. Sorry, members, those in favour, could you leave your hands up just for a moment so that we can see them? Okay, those against? That is lost. Councillor Sims. Division. Council members, the division has been called on the amendment. Would all those in favour of the amendment please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called. Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin, Councillor Sims. Thank you. Uh, members, it now goes back to the substantive. I'll go to Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Deputy Lord Mayor. There we go. Deputy Lord Mayor, sorry to sum up. Summed up and I, well, I just want to thank members for their support of this excellent initiative. And I really hope that this money um, is spent um, uh, and that it teams up with the state government who are ultimately responsible for this. And, and just as I uh, brought, I guess, stage one of this motion over 12 months ago, and, and we had the same argument then, and I'm not going to rehash old um, old arguments because they haven't changed at all. The fundamentals of the system are the same. Um, uh, but yeah, I just appreciate members' support um, uh, and I know know the organisations that this will go to help and the backbone policy work that it's going to fund um, is going to go a long way uh, to helping things, particularly in South Ward, where there are lots of um, social issues like this at play. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Members, uh, to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Um, sorry, Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Abraham today. Division, please. Thank you. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called? Councillor Martin, Councillor Donovan. Oh, Councillor... Sorry, Councillor Martin, I thought you voted against it in the last one. That's all right. Oh. Okay, sorry, could we raise hands? Please raise hands, thank you. Councillor Martin, Councillor Canole, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Ho, Councillor Kuros, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Sims, Councillor Kira, Councillor Abraham today. That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, members, with that, we go to item 15.12, Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I put the motion to the council. Take it as read. Take a second. Okay. I have a seconder in the Deputy Lord Mayor. Did you wish to speak to it, Councillor? Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, it, this is important because there are many narrow streets and laneways uh, with inadequate footpaths throughout the city. Uh, the, uh, the width is impacted by power lines in amongst other things. Um, and by having a strategy, it allows us to align the undergrounding with other works as they are carried out. Council previously had a strategy, we don't at the moment, um, and most of these streets would be ineligible for the PLEC funding, most city streets, whilst we might still be able to uh, apply for that. Um, as I've indicated in the motion, uh, we need a strategy to work over time on all of the other little streets to uh, to work toward improving those. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, just a moment. There we go. Mm. There we go. Yeah, I just want to thank Helen for bringing this one um, through. Obviously, there's I think there's a couple of streets that we've met with where this is an issue. Um, and even if I can cast my memory all the way back to Oh gosh, is it Stephen's place as well? I think 
where basically there's just lots of small cluttered streets in South Ward um, and very keen to see what the South Ward Streets and Movement Study um, is going to bring to us and, and particularly the, the, the sort of short list of, um, of quick wins and suppose of things that will be fixed. Uh, but power lines are definitely a big one. Um, they're also a very, very expensive one. Um, uh, so we're going to need to find a way out of the wood eventually. Um, and all great journeys start with a single step and hopefully this is that step. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I also um, support this uh, motion and thank Councillor Donovan for putting it forward. I know it's an issue of real concern in South Ward. Um, and I think doing this would really enhance some of the beautiful heritage um, buildings that we have in that part of the city. Um, and it would also um, assist in terms of pedestrianising uh, our streets by opening them up. Um, so I think it's a great initiative and um, yeah, I hope we can get it happening. Councillor Martin. Yes, thank you. Um, look, I also uh, commend Councillor Donovan for raising this. Um, it has been an issue uh, for successive councils uh, and the Lord Mayor would remember Councillor Clearahan uh, was a champion for undergrounding of power lines, raising successive motions. Um, it has never been, I have to tell you, um, in her view, uh, a high priority for the administration. But uh, making it a priority would mean that we could develop a strategy so that even if it were one or two streets a year or one small cul-de-sac, at least there would be some advancement. It is especially important in North Adelaide um, where we have um, substantial uh, uh, residences and rows of residences uh, that have uh, heritage value, um, which are in many cases, um, cornerstones of the heritage of the city, um, which are overshadowed by um, power poles and power lines. And this extends also to the edges of parklands, which was a particular point that Councillor Clearahan used to make. Um, even if we remove them from one parklands facing street a year, it would be an advance. Um, I do hope that uh, if this is adopted, that the administration brings something back quickly. Um, um, I know that um, it's a big job, but hopefully by uh, the end of this term, um, a roadmap would be really use useful for undergrounding of power lines. Thank you. Um, and yes, wouldn't it be wonderful to see all of our power lines underground over the next uh, 10 years or so? I'll go back to Councillor Donovan to sum up. Summed up. Thank you, members. To the vote, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Members, that takes us to 15.13, which is continuous parkland trail. I'll go to the Deputy Lord Mayor, if I can unmute, there we go. And you have a seconder in Councillor Abraham today. Oh, sorry, actually, no, don't, don't pull a face. I actually have just looked at the hands over there. So you have a seconder in Councillor Kuros. Sorry, I can see the hands, they're in order. Glad we sorted that out, Lord uh, Mayor. Uh, um, uh, uh, look, uh, I think this one is fairly straightforward. Obviously, it relates to um, uh, the very good deputation that was given by Mr. Jason Redman earlier, um, uh, who's also met with um, Councillor Donovan as well. Um, uh, and uh, this was actually drafted in, in um, not long before uh, Councillor Donovan sent around the presentation that um, uh, Mr. Red, Mr. Redmond has produced. Um, so I hope you've all had the chance to have a look at that. Uh, it's a very promising project. Um, uh, it does, I think, uh, to use the word, and I, I want a different word, but I'm going to say reimagine. Um, uh, it does reimagine to a degree um, our parklands and their use and, and, and expand on it in many ways. Um, I think it will uh, yeah, if realised, and we're a long way from that necessarily, but if realised, it's it's um, 
really going to uh, heighten the way that we view uh, the parklands, the standing that the parklands has in a in a Ghana sense, in a in a colonial heritage sense as well. Um, the use uh, for obviously cyclists, runners, um, uh, and other people undertaking physical activity um, uh, would be greatly increased. Um, uh, and there are vast uh, other other benefits as well um, that will come with it. Uh, so I'm thinking of things uh, such as uh, digital wayfinding and what have you, but also talking about what the parklands used to be used for in, in, when I come to colonial heritage, um, the many different things that used to happen in the parklands and you can incorporate digital or potential virtual reality elements into that. Um, uh, one thing that you know springs to mind is the ostrich racing that used to happen in Victoria Park, um, which no one really knows about anymore, but all those weird and wonderful um, uh, parts of the cultural and social history of the parklands that we don't necessarily know about um, can be incorporated uh, into this um, uh, through information and wayfinding, potentially tours. Um, uh, with uh, Ghana, there's, uh, there's potential for um, uh, uh, education um, using some of the more bush and scrub-like areas, some of the native vegetation parts of the parklands, um, uh, where perhaps you could bring in school students, primary school students, um, uh, um, uh, so so the, the, the opportunities are, are almost endless. Um, yes, it does come with a price tag. Everything comes with a price tag. Um, uh, but I think this one will, will actually pay itself off um, uh, ahead of time, to be honest. I think it could be a, a very, very good investment. Should we be going it alone? No, the state government should be coming on board as well. Um, uh, and I hope that our administration will engage uh, with, with Mr. Redman and, and others around this, uh, present something workable to us, uh, perhaps in a workshop setting and alongside other recovery work. Uh, and so then we might be uh, have a serious discussion about funding a business plan uh, and then getting that done and taking it from there. So thank you. Thank you. I have... Just one second. Councillor Kouros is seconder. Councillor Kouros, did you wish to speak? Yeah, I will. Um, I think, um, just very briefly, I think um, Deputy Lord Mayor summed it all up. Um, I think bringing a, a more deeper connection to our parklands is uh, it's really important and it, and it just brings so many benefits as he um, quite rightly um, outlined. And I just think, it, I hope, that the state government can see this as a very benefit, something that's very beneficial for our city and comes on board. We know that there are a lot of uh, um, people that, that were approached on this um, and they um, have expressed their support for it as well. Um, and uh, I believe that, you know, um, if this motion gets up, it will be a real great um, benefit to our city. Thank you. I have Councillor Sims. I support this uh, proposal as well, Lord Mayor. I first became aware of this um, when Councillor Donovan um, sent it around uh, to everybody. And I thought, you know, it's a great and exciting idea. And um, then Councillor Hyde took up the idea um, and that's great uh, as well. And um, he's proposing that um, administration look at it and talk to some of the proponents. And, you know, I think, I think that's good. Um, anything that gets uh, people in the community to um, move through the parklands and encourage um, cycling and um, pedestrian movement and encourage understanding of our parklands and enjoyment of our public space, I, I think is a really good thing. Um, it would be amazing if uh, this was uh, accompanied by a comprehensive bike network that actually runs through the CBD. And um, if we had some temporary uh, bike lanes, thank you, you know, in the meantime, Sims. but thank you, sadly Sims. that's not thank to be, um, Lord Mayor, but I, I no. do um, support this as a, a positive initiative. Thank you. Councillor Martin. Oh, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. And uh, thank you to Councillor Donovan. Um, and yes, look, this is a, um, a great idea. Um, it is uh, one that was first advanced in uh, the previous term of council. In fact, it formed part of the Parkland strategy, um, championed by uh, Councillor Hender, who uh, you remember, Lord Mayor. Um, it was her vision that there would be a continuous cycling and walking path around the entire Parklands um, 
and perhaps the administration, if this is successful, um, could draw that work together uh, as a means of uh, fulfilling this uh, at a, um, a faster pace than might otherwise be possible. It's a grand plan. I supported it then. I support it now. Thank you. Deputy Lord Mayor, to sum up. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And um, I guess just, just the difference and the point of difference between this um, and the previous proposal is that it's not, it's not just a cycling path. It's not just a running path. Um, it has many, many other things wrapped around it which are going to offer auxiliary value um, uh, and will actually be the attractor for many people, um, not necessarily the fitness or well-being um, uh, elements of it. And that's why, um, despite the, pr the price tag for, for the uh, relative underpasses and or bridges that are necessary are uh, being quite high, and that price tag would exist for a normal uh, continuous trail, uh, by spending a little bit more and investing in all those other elements around it, um, uh, one of which is public art as well. I forgot to mention public art, very important. Um, uh, not like that horrible phallic thing that we're going to ship in. Um, uh, into, into hey, North hey, excuse me. Come on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's just how it was described publicly. Um, uh, but other uh, attractive pieces of public art, um, uh, there's so much more around it. And that's what, that's what makes it so much more valuable and why I think it has a, a lot better chance um, of getting off the ground and actually having a, a, an overarching benefit to tourism and the state um, and also how other Australians and people from interstate view our parklands as well because um, talking to interstaters you know there's, there's this vague awareness that Adelaide has some largely unused hectares of scrub surrounding its uh, small CBD um, and it's dark at night and it's just a very Adelaide thing because um, you know it's quiet uh, you can hear the possums rustling around. Um, but if we actually had something to be proud of, oh, which is the other thing, to Councillor Martin's point about the renaming of motions, I did actually originally name this one the Pride of South Australia, colon, a continuous parklands trail, um, which I know it was changed. Um, uh, notwithstanding, part of it was tongue in cheek, but I think this could genuinely become the Pride of South Australia, something we are uh, immediately recognised uh nationally and internationally as having so i appreciate all of your support thank you members to the vote those in favor those against that is carried uh, members we're going to take a short comfort stop uh if i just uh, perhaps 10 minutes uh, meet you all back here in 10 minutes at half past 11.
this and ah. oh yeah good well uh, we've got a couple more minutes <laughs> just yeah <laughs> just one one minute nearly We're not streaming yet, are we? No, no. Helen, I thought it was a photo because you weren't moving. <laughs> she can't hear me. Okay. Members, I think we've got um, Corin. Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, let us continue. I have just a moment. I'll just bring up so I can see that. Uh, we have uh, 15.14, uh, Councillor Kuros. Am I on? Oh. Yes. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I'll take this motion as read. Um, and basically, what. Sorry, I'll just get a seconder. Thank you, uh, Councillor Knoll. Thank you, Councillor Cross. Um, what I'm looking at uh, putting forward to a, a Council is. Um, bringing more vibrancy to our city um, and uh, festivals are a big part um, of our city and of our economic development of the city as well. Um, I'm noting that we, you know, run intensely, the, you know, the, the festivals from January to, to March and we kind of go in a little bit of a lull over winter and 
um, this is where we actually um, need to come in and bring this vibrancy through this period, especially when we're, you know, in a very um, vulnerable and difficult economic times to support our businesses. Um, so I'm just asking for um, administration to investigate ways in which we can host more events and not limited to just the central part of the city. Um, we're looking at, um, you know, more events throughout the year, all year round, not just in winter, not just in one section of the year, but for the north and for the south, um, to bring trade for the traders um, and to, to fill those bums on seats and tables and chairs that we all are quite passionately about um, having for outdoor dining, but to have a purpose for people to come in here and fill them, fill them up. Um, so I, I really um, have felt that we, um, you know, sort of neglect the north and the south part of our city um, in, in festivals. Uh, I feel that we could do more. Um, I would love administration to investigate um, a lot more that can be done. I know that we've got the winter warmers um, coming up and there is some ideas there and I, I look forward to them and I look forward to, to having them out there. I just wanting just um, a, a lot more throughout the whole year. Thank you, Councillor Connell. Did you wish to speak? I'll reserve. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I can't support this motion. I'm a bit unsure about what actually uh, um, Councillor Kouros is seeking to achieve here. Um, our administration already does work in terms of um, activations and, and festivals and so on. But I, I don't think um, the idea of pursuing festivals in the middle of winter when we're going through a pandemic is really sensible. Um, at, at this stage, um, we're, going, we're moving into stage one, which allows gatherings of only 10 people. Um, in a few months, uh, in the middle of winter, we may have gatherings of up to 20 people. Um, in that context, I'm not really sure why we would be asking administration to uh, spend huge amounts of time in um, looking at, at new uh, winter activations or what exactly we would be asking the state government to provide support for at this time. So I'm totally supportive of activities and events in the city, but I just think we're in a very difficult financial environment. Um, and uh, if we can't actually have people coming together um, because of social distancing requirements at the moment, then this seems like some redundant work at this stage, something I'd definitely be keen to look at in the future. Uh, thank you. I have no other speakers. I'll go back to, sorry. Okay, thank you. Councillor Martin, I wasn't sure if you wanted to speak or not. Uh, well, Lord Mayor, I, I press the electronic raise your hand. Is there something else I should do? No, no. <laughs> That's fine. You just did this, so I wasn't sure whether you were saying that you made a mistake. Oh, no, no. It was I had my raise your hand electronic device up and you were saying no more speakers. So I, I okay. thought I should. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Um, um, now, look, uh, I, I agree with uh, Councillor Sims. Um, uh, we do have real issues associated with public gatherings. Um, and... Uh, those issues are such that events are being cancelled, including SALA, which was something uh, with which council was closely involved, um, it, including the Umbrella Winter Festival, um, and possibly including sporting events like the three-day horse trial, although Councillor Kuros would be better aware of that than I am being on the board. Um, these, these events, which attract large numbers of people, are at best doubtful, not just this year, but perhaps for next year. And indeed, uh, SCOMO keeps telling us that social distancing is with us for a very long time. Uh, it may even be that international travel won't be back for a long time, which is, of course, bad news for hospitality and particularly for accommodation, which relies on it so heavily. Um, if Councillor Kouros had framed a motion that was aimed more at hanging on to what we've got, finding ways in which we can reinvent the festival calendar to ensure that they remain viable, rather than 
sniffing around uh, possibilities that may or may not uh, one day be possible. Um, I want to know now how we're going to do the Adelaide Festival, how we're going to do the Fringe, how Oz Asia will happen in that social distancing environment. And so um, this is inopportune uh, and, and therefore I won't be able to support it. Councillor Kerra. Hmm. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, this is a good initiative. Um, I'm, I'd like to wholeheartedly support this. Uh, we all want, we all want and need, uh, well, we all agree that there ought to be more uh, activities and activations during winter. Uh, it's a bit lopsided right now. I say to the naysayers about this, to the naysayers, this motion uh, requests an investigation, therefore a report. Let's credit the administration with uh, the, shall we say, common sense to include in their report uh, a consideration of whether or not it's anything is feasible this year. Um, that really just goes without saying. We're not talking just about this year. It's about getting the ball rolling uh, for potentially next year and subsequent years. Uh, but let's find that out from the administration. I'm sure they're sensible enough to, to, uh, to have those, uh, those considerations in mind. So to the naysayers, look, if you don't want to get behind this, get out of the way at the very least. Uh, Councillor Canal. Yeah, just shortly following on, and uh, Kira, Kira, Councillor Kira got onto that qu quite quickly. And it is, it takes time to organise things. It takes time to organise events. It, it takes time to actually plan the calendars. And so, a good time to start is when you're when the world is down. We're here. Um, it's now a time for us to re reimagine that uh, where we're going, and so that we have the plans in place so that you have the ideas to go forward. And really that's all this is asking for. And, and truly, uh, it's just, again, affirming the sorts of things we need to be doing. A, a, a citywide business model uh, could be uh, involved in these sorts of things as well. The point is, is that that's what you're doing. And it takes sometimes a year to two years to get these things planned and have it in, in the space and, and fleshed out sufficiently that you can make it work. And, you know, it's a great time to start thinking about the future. Uh, we already have the pandemic. We don't have the solution. So let's go on it. Thank you, Councillor Canal. Councillor Kuros to sum up. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I guess if I can help um, uh, Councillor Sims and Councillor Martin, I'm really, um, I would uh, or have assumed that COVID restrictions will be taken into account if something was to happen this year. But what I'm asking administration to, to do is exactly what Councillor Kira and Councillor not not cannot said that it's basically for to get the hats on and thinking hats on to broaden the festivals for the northern and southern parts of the um, city whether it's incorporated with the Adelaide festival whether it's incorporated with the fringes on or whatever it looks like wherever it can be is to really bring the focus to the whole of the city holistically not just centralized in one part of the city to support the traders over a period when this is um, allowed or would be feasible to happen um, um, and I actually do dispute the fact that that we could do some things during social distancing there are things that we can um, probably do um, what they are. I'm just asking them to be investigated to um, to support the businesses. But I am mindful of the fact there are restrictions. I am mindful of the fact that we do have current festivals that we um, want to continue support. Um, and all I'm asking is to broaden it and to bring it forward to consideration when we do have that possibility of being able to be out of these restrictions to incorporate them in the northern and southern part of our city. Thank you, members. To the vote, those in favour, those against. Can I have a division? Yep. Council yeah. members, the division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called? Councillor Kira, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Abrahimsade, Councillor Kuros, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Canole, Councillor Ho. Thank you, members. That takes us to 15.15, Christmas in July. Councillor Kuros. Um, thank you, Lord and, 
Sorry. Thank you. I have a seconder in the Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, I just, uh, going back to um, reimagining, um, I threw this one as a uh, possibility if um, this um, is uh, something that elected members would um, consider. Um, basically, I, understand, I don't want, I saw the um, recommendation by council in which they incorporated it as part of the winter warmers. I actually don't want the winter warmers to um, be name changed. I actually like the winter warmers. I'm just basically wanting um, to light up our city in uh, bringing a winter wonderland in some aspects of it uh, in a social distancing wise, um, have fairy, if you can just imagine fairy lights, you know, in and around on the main streets in the city. Um, I'm looking at uh, the, you know, illuminating our, um, the buildings, how we have in the past, if we're able to do that, if it's within the budget, within the palette um, of the elected members in investigating the, the possibility of lighting up our city during the winter months. I've used as Christmas as July as a way of um, making a, as a feel good option, um, but just to encourage people to walk when they're walking through the city to uh, and enjoying this, uh, some shopping or, or having a coffee, that the experience is still there and they're still feeling connected. And that's what I'm asking from a, if um, in a, in a, uh, administration can investigate predominantly, obviously, incorporating the whole city holistically. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? Thank you. I have Councillor Kerra. Councillor Kerra. Uh, thanks. Just a, a variation to put to uh, Councillor Kouros, um, and that is uh, just simply replacing the word, uh, the words Christmas in July, um, replacing Christmas in July with, uh, in quotation marks, winter lights uh, with a capital W and a capital L. I don't know if that can be put on the screen. Uh, if Mary, you're happy with that? I'm happy with that. Um, I just, um, I'm wanting to basically going back to, um, you know, what Councillor Sims has always wanted and that's bringing an atmosphere back into the city. Um, and if we can do that through winter in support of our, our businesses and if winter lights uh, in July, incorporating it with the winter warmers and reimagining our city, um, I'm happy with that. Great. So, uh, Jenny, are you, did you get that? So, we, we, it just takes a minute to um, light up. I just need to check that the seconder is happy with that. Deputy Lord Mayor, are you happy with that? Yep, thank you. Uh, Jesse, did you want to speak? No, if, if that's if that change is made as a variation, I, I won't need to speak. Um, I'll just be supporting. Thank you. I have Councillor Sims. Sorry, Thanks, thank Lord Mayor. Okay. I'm afraid I, I can't support this motion either. Um, Lord Mayor, this is the second meeting uh, that we've had in the last few months where we've been dealing with the um, implications of COVID-19. And at these meetings, we've been told about the financial pressures that the organisation is under. Just tonight, we've had to make millions of dollars worth of um, cuts to um, the work that we do, infrastructure projects. Um, but also, Lord Mayor, I've proposed a series of measures that have been knocked back on financial grounds. Um, if we don't have money for seedlings um, to plant in the parklands to grow uh, fruit and vegetables, if we don't have money um, for uh, temporary bikeways um, or to even look at uh, doing pop-ups, how on earth are we able to find money for uh, Christmas lights in July? I mean, you know, that to me is the definition of a luxury opt-in item. And I mean, I'm all for um, activation um, and support for events in our city, but I think we have to be uh, fair here, Lord Mayor, in um, the way that we approach these matters. If we can't afford seedlings, if we can't afford pop-up bikeways, um, then how on earth can we um, afford Christmas lights in the middle of July? I mean, if that's sound financial management, I'm Santa Claus. So we need to be consistent, Lord Mayor. And uh, I do get a bit frustrated by the lack of consistency by some members on this council who knock back sensible, good ideas 
um, and then put forward uh, things that accord with their own hobby horses. Well, I'm sorry, Lord Mayor, until we've had a, a proper discussion um, around our financial situation, our revenue source, and um, the kind of issues that we face as an organisation, I'm not sure that these things are really um, priorities at the moment. But I can't, can't hear. Councillor Martin, sorry, you are, I can hear you. Oh, I couldn't hear you until I got the last little bit. Thank you. Uh, look, Lord Mayor, this is even wackier than the last proposal, although I commend Councillor Kira for changing the name to Winter Lights. Um, I was trying to imagine a nativity scene where the three wise men and baby Jesus are physically distanced in a 16 square metre area. Okay. And... My imagination was running wild uh, about the manner in which Santa and the reindeer would be held in quarantine for weeks. Um, this is marginally better, uh, but it still doesn't pay any regard to the reality of what's occurring. This is Kuros smoke and mirrors, smoke and mirrors, um, enthusiastically supporting in the early part of the evening, a program of massive cuts, including activations of 88 O'Connell Street killing, killing activity that was helping business and suddenly asking for a report for winter lights. It, it defies any reasonable explanation. Uh, Lord Mayor, um, I think our time would be better expended than dealing with these wacky motions that eat up the time. It is 11.49. Uh, these motions on notice from the team are uh, quite outrageous and as you reasonably observe Lord Mayor far in excess of what used to be the case. Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, I was just going to highlight Lord Mayor that uh, I know I and other councillors are incredibly consistent uh, with the principles that we apply to the matters that we vote on at council. Uh, it's, it's quite a simple um, idea. The good motions get voted up, the bad motions get voted down uh, and uh, everything's a judgment call on that basis. And it's on that basis that I'll be voting for this motion. Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Just very quickly, uh, I, I speak in support of this motion. I think uh, it's a wise decision that Councillor Kouros is wanting to uh, plan ahead um, because when restrictions are eased, uh, we better have a plan to hit the ground running and hit it fast. And uh, as, uh, as the only uh, Muslim elected member here in this chamber, uh, I, uh, I do endorse this Christmas in July, but now change to winter lights. Either way, I endorse uh, this, this motion to the chamber. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, briefly, I'm happy to support this. Um, it is a bit random. We have had to cut the uh, splash budget, most likely. Uh, we've had to cut other activation budgets. This is another activation. You know, I think council has a responsibility for strategic decisions, not bringing in um, little bits and pieces like this, but it's an investigation. Uh, so I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Kouros, to sum up. Um, what can I say? I, I, um... I, uh, I'm just confused in regards to Councillor Sims and Councillor Martin. Of course, they're going to um, it's, it speak that way, but that's okay. Um, I'm just asking for an investigation. I'm mindful of the spending of the council. Um, I'm not asking them to go ahead and spend it all. I'm just asking for all that we're wanting to support and the traders, we need to bring people into the city. We need to encourage that. Um, winter is very hard as it is um, in, in the city. Um, it is cold, it is wet, it is dreary. Um, we already um, have people's morale that's down. People are already um, depressed and gloomy. It is, uh, you know, it, we already have that in our city, in our, in our state, in the country, in the world. Um, I'm basically just adding, asking them to add on to the winter warmers that we have. Um, I use Christmas in July. That's what I thought of. I thought of lights. I thought of happiness. I thought of joy. Positivity gets people out. 
I welcome um, Councillor Kira's amendment um, to winter lights. That's what I'm wanting to do. Whether if there's something left over and what we've had in the past that we can incorporate, I'm sure we can be um, uh, we can be constructive. I'm sure we can be clever in our approach. Um, and I'm sure there are things that we can do that doesn't cost that much, but offers so much. And if you both are all, if we are all here to support our 80% of our businesses in the city, then we need to think outside the square a little bit. And I'm not asking a vast amount of money to be spent. I'm just asking us to draw in from what we have, draw from what we've got, see what we can give, see what we can do to our streets and bring some joy to people and to the traders and for people to come out. It's basically what I'm asking. It doesn't need to be complicated. Thank you, Councillor Kouros. To the vote, members, those in favour, those against. Councillor Martin. A division, please. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. Would all those in favour of the motion please raise your hand and keep it raised until all names have been called. Councillor Kira, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Abrahimzadeh, Councillor Kuros, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Canole, Councillor Ho. Thank you, members. We go to 15.16, which is amendments to standing orders. Councillor Kuros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, am I seeking a seconder? Yes, we have a seconder and Councillor Abrahams are there. Thank you. Um, basically, um, through you, Lord Mayor, bringing in some changes to the um, standing orders um, in regards to having the confidential items heard first. Um, I believe that uh, these should uh, high level or I should require strategic thinking or strategic um, responses from councillors. Um, so um, if we could change the order in which they uh, come forward on the agenda, um, I think that's a, a great way forward to uh, making sure that we can make good decisions with these items. Thank you. Councillor Abraham today, did you wish to speak? No. Councillor, I've got Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims? Thanks, Lord Mayor. I don't support this. Um, I'm really uh, struggling to understand the rationale here. Um, it appears to be a, an effort to put all of the elected members' motions at the end of the meeting, um, thus ensuring that members of the community that have um, an interest in the matters are disenfranchised, um, ensuring that the media is uh, disenfranchised because they're required to sit through uh, hours of um, discussion, um, ensuring that members of the community don't necessarily get an opportunity to uh, hear the answers to their questions and so on, unless they um, bother to stay on a live stream until the early hours of the morning. Um, you know, and this motion really is a, a midnight surprise um, and uh, not a positive one. Um, so, you know, I'm really sick to death of the tinkering with standing orders. None of the proposals that have been made um, to uh, change standing orders by the Team Adelaide faction over the last 12 months have uh, served the organisation in uh, any way. In fact, all they have done is created more rancour and dysfunction um, in council. I fear that this will do the same um, because if you can't gag people, um, then you try and um, silence them or push meetings off into early hours of the morning or um, you know, ensure that uh, there's limited accountability and transparency. Um, so I'm really sick of this approach, to be honest. I'm very annoyed that this motion has been put forward. The sensible course of action would have been to support Councillor Martin's proposal which um, would have uh, ensured that there was a, a set uh, ending time for council meetings. Um, but this just means that members of the community are going to be stuck waiting outside for potentially hours, um, rather than being able to sit in town hall, follow the debate and follow the issues that are of interest to them. And, um, you know, I just don't think this is the direction that we should be yet taking, Lord Mayor. And I don't know why some members of this council keep trying to look at ways that they can exclude the community from Town Hall. I just find it baffling. Uh, Councillor Martin, one second. 
There we go. Oh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, uh, look, I endorse what uh, Councillor Sims is saying. Uh, this is a dysfunctional motion um, that is characteristic of a dysfunctional council. Um, this one uh, takes the cake, pretty much. Um, if it can't be gagged, censored, delayed or stopped, then it's manipulated in a way to suit whatever the agenda is. Um, however, having said that, um, I, I am appreciative that Councillor Kuros has acknowledged that we have been debating confidential matters related to expenditure of tens of millions of dollars at 2 a.m. And this should bring it forward until 10 or 11. Um, there is a downside, um, uh, quite apart from the, uh, the matters that Councillor Sims raises. And that is that with confidential matters, um, the number of staff required generally can be anticipated. It's maybe one or two. Um, when you have a substantial number of motions on notice, um, uh, the staff input, that is the availability of staff to answer questions raised by uh, uh, councillors uh, exponentially increases. If there are 10 different subjects involving 10 different areas, there are going to be 10, 15, 20 staff. So it is in the mould of ignoring the health and well-being of staff. It is in the mould of generating extra cost. Uh, but on the other hand, it does bring confidential matters forward so that councillors can have some of the little grey cells working, and I know that some of them are quite confused even at this moment. Um, um, I, I can hear it in their voices. In fact, I, I hear their Thank admissions. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. I haven't finished. Did you want, did you want me to expand on that, Lord Mayor? No. Um, the Deputy know. Lord Mayor said he was confused a couple of times about matters that were put to him. Uh, Councillor Kouros sounded confused. Um, there were certainly some very confused questions that she was asking earlier on. So, you know, these late hours actually exacerbate people's capacity to absorb information. Um, and I have no doubt you'll see further illustrations of this in the short term. So, look, I, I'm, I, I'm in two minds about this. I can see exactly the points uh, that Councillor Sims is making about gagging, stopping, delaying. Um, frustrating. Uh, that is true. That uh, may well be the agenda. Um, uh, and certainly the cost, the impact on staff is an issue. Um, I'll have a think about whether I support or oppose it. Uh, it's, it's really difficult. I, look, I might ask some more questions later on, and you'll forgive me if they're a bit dumb, but at this hour, um, dumbness is the Thank you. I have uh, just as a point of clarity, um, the staff actually remain for the CEO reports. They aren't here to answer questions on motions on notice. Um, the, only our executives stay for that. In fact, you'll find that the staff members that are, have stayed back tonight are here for any questions that are in the confidential section. Um, I will just go to Councillor, sorry, I've got Councillor Canole. Councillor Canole. Thank you. Uh, I may just suggest to Councillor Martin, uh, he extends his nana nap in the afternoon and that may help him to keep a bit more clear. But uh, thank you, uh, uh, Lord Mayor, because that was one of the points that I had uh, put in that it, this is about the well-being of the staff as well. And uh, that means that all those staff members that aren't required, and in fact it is just the executive, can go home and it's reasonable. And we can discuss that and it is we take this out of the way because normally the confidential things are obviously the monetary and, and uh, issues around that and possibly negotiation. So that's why it, that's, it's quite sensible to do that. And I think some of us are forgetting we are, we are live streamed and we tend to be recorded. You can have it any time you like. And I have watched uh, you know, our meetings uh, with great excitement you know, at other times. So you don't have to sit here and be with us. You can have hours of entertainment anytime you feel like it. It's there <laughs> anytime you wish. So, I mean, all these arguments, uh, just they're so fallacious. It's just, you know, astound me. Why, why you think that the, you try to narrow the arguments and, you know, the, the somewhat condescending occasional conversation uh, uh, and the descriptions, et cetera, uh, from some councillors, certainly, 
doesn't enhance the conversation, nor does it make us look any better. Um, so I think, you know, I'm quite happy to, to support this. It does serve a purpose while we're having our long meetings, and at least we allow some of our staff uh, to be ready and able to work whom we are paying for, uh, to be able to put in a good day's work the next day. And the rest of us, well, heck, we signed up for this and I don't mind. Just keep doing what you want because I enjoy it too. Anyway, thank you. Councillor Abraham Zadeh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, uh, Councillor Canole uh, summed it up really well. I, I think what, watching reruns of the Adelaide City Council meetings is like watching Seinfeld reruns. It's, it's just as entertaining. Um, uh, but, but that was going to be my point is that, you know, we're not, uh, um, we're not drawing the curtains, we're not having, um, uh, you know, secret talks. This is all uh, on, on YouTube, this is all on, on record. Uh, if our uh, ratepayers and our stakeholders do want to uh, catch up on, on the meetings, then they can do that. Um, uh, Lord Mayor, it's, it's, it's funny that um, uh, some councillors refer to this council as a dysfunctional council. Just because things go the, don't go their way, they, uh, they, they label it and, and look at it as a dysfunctional council. This motion that's uh, before us now, Lord Mayor, is a very straightforward, very logical motion, and I do endorse it to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Martin, I'm assuming that's a question? Oh, yes, it is, Lord Mayor. Um, if uh, the proposed agenda um, is um, as presented, if there's a confidential matter that, and sometimes they go for an hour, two hours or whatever, and we have members of the public in the council chambers waiting to hear those matters, um, what will happen to them? Will they go out into the corridor for two hours or, or um, will we provide seating for them or refreshments or anything of that nature? Or is the intention just to sort of say, well, we're going into confidence, clear out? Um, if you want to hang around, you know, hang around. If, well, if we have a particular number of confidential matters in an agenda that we feel that actually is going to take hours and hours and hours of discussion, uh, generally those matters, um, particularly if they are of that importance and that level, we can actually move that around the agenda or we can actually do it um, at a special meeting as we've done many times before, especially if it's around budget. Um, this, I, so in terms of, yes, the traditional thing is for members to actually, or members of the public to leave the gallery while we uh, look at confidential items and they're welcome back into the chamber. At the moment, of course, we are on uh, electronic platforms and uh, we are working through by next month uh, for confidential items will be in a, what is it called? Like a, like a breakout room. Uh, on Zoom, so uh, the streaming will continue and then we'll come back. Oh, so um, I did ask this question, the administration couldn't help me earlier, so we're still Zooming next month as well? Uh, well, I would imagine so until the restrictions are lifted, so at, at the moment until we have further information as to well that when these restrictions are going to lift, uh, we are with, with this and I'm imagining that we'll get further information from the CEO uh, as mm -hmm. he answers your question without notice. Uh, and um, um, could but certainly we... the next few meetings will be until those restrictions are lifted. Okay. Uh, and could we, um, I, you know, I know it's only a minor issue for um, uh, some councillors, but could we provide seating uh, and, you know, refreshments for people who are relegated to the corridors currently for hours? We can on... ask the CEO to have a look at that. I mean, if, if, uh, there is seating there anyway, as far as I know. So no, uh, the only seating that's available is there are a few chairs outside the Colonel Light Room, but generally insignificant when it comes to large numbers. Uh, and as you'd be aware, Lord Mayor, um, during particularly the meeting where the team was advocating giving away parklands to the Crows, we had literally, um, you know, 100 people in there. Thank you, Councillor. And as you well know as well, whenever there is a matter before the Council that has a lot of people in the public gallery there for that item, that I will bring that item forward well possible. Oh, I'm comforted by that, Lord Mayor, comforted. Thank you. Councillor Donovan. And second, not oh, sorry, 
just thank you. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I will support this um, because I think anything that saves some of the staff having to hang around is beneficial. Noting that some of the comments around uh, staff health and wellbeing are clearly farcical if we're happy to uh, still um, subject other staff to uh, meetings that go beyond midnight. Um, and in reference to one of the other councillors' comments, I certainly did not sign up for this. I do not think it's a great idea that we have epic council meetings. Um, and uh, yeah, happily would have supported this and think it would have made a whole lot of sense to concurrently support uh, Councillor Martin's earlier suggestion and, and arrange for an overflow of, uh, of items, um, but happy to support this. Members, we are reconnected. Sorry for that short interval. Um, now, I will, I'm sorry, uh, I have uh, lost track of who was speaking. I think I had Council Councillor Donovan was speaking and it appears she's left. Yes? Okay. Uh, so... I think everybody else has spoken except for Councillor Kira. So if not, I will go back to Councillor uh, Kouros. Just before I go back to Councillor Kouros to sum up, um, uh, I agree some of the concerns around the staff. Um, staff can leave after the CEO reports and it's really a separation of the CEO reports or the public reports that have been through the committee process and, um, and procedural with the council members business, which is our, our reports and our questions and motions on notice. Um, uh, as with other things, as per um, the concerns, if there was a matter that needed to be brought forward, of course, I can do that at discretion. And I'll generally do that if there are members in the gallery and have done that on many occasions. Um, and will continue to do so. Um, and I'm sure that uh, if there are members in the gallery when we're back in chambers, uh, that we can make sure that there's seating, et cetera, for them. I will go back to, no, it's not letting me do that either. Uh, Councillor Kouros to sum up. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, just to, to clarify on some points, um, I know um, we, we like having a bit of drama during these council meetings, but this shouldn't be a drama. I mean, it's not a gag. I don't see this how this is a gag. We're just bringing items forward. Um, I, I like the fact that um, this will help the staff and, and that's what we're all looking at. We mainly, we have a lot of staff during those points and um, bringing them forward will allow good decisions to be made. And like Councillor Martin, rightly so, some of these decisions are real high level and, and are millions of dollars that, that we're, we're talking about. Um, so we really need to probably um, have that time um, with the staff and for them not to be tired, for them not to have gone through the whole list of um, 200 motions that um, councillors may choose to have and which some we agree with and some we don't and that is our job and I disagree with Councillor Donovan, it is our job, our job is to listen to the motions and listen to our other elected members and quite frankly I really think that maybe we should be starting at 12 o'clock just like they do in the House and Parliament. I think they do start at 12 and they finish at midnight. I'm, I'm sure they do. If anyone wants to clarify that to me, they're quite happy to. Um, uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't think that there's anything other than trying to streamline, uh, streamline this and efficiently run our council meetings with our staff and for our staff not to have to be there uh, through the whole, um, uh, the, the whole process of um, the motions in which really we vote on and which really our the elected members have the opportunity to um, try and lobby their uh, other elected members to um, uh, you know, agree with their motions. 
So the most important part of our meeting should come first. And I think it's fair. I think it's reasonable. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that there should be any controversy attached to this. It's quite a very simple administrative um, way of doing it. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Cross. Um, uh, Councillor Sims uh, did actually put his hand up just while he was summing up, just as a point of clarification. Um, he believes Parliament starts at 9am. Is that correct, Councillor Sims? Thank you. Um, which I think would be amazing. Um, members, to the vote. Uh, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. And we will go to item 15 point, Councillor Sims, Councillor Sims. Sorry, Councillor Sims, I, I need to, um, Jenny, sorry. Sorry. If you can unmute Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor, division, please. By hand, they get, you have to yeah, call their hand. You'll have to do it, okay. So, if I can do that, if everybody, um, a division has been called, if you raise your hand until I call your name, Councillor Knoll, Councillor Ho, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Kerra, Councillor Abraham today, Councillor Kuros. Good. Okay, <laughs> members, we go to the last motion on tonight's agenda, which is 15.17, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, sorry, I've got Councillor Martin waving and I've got Mark Goldstone waving. Uh, sorry, Mark, did you want to say something? Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor, just a preamble before you get into the um, debate of the motion. I just want to say that um, further to the recent media articles on the subject, I just think it's necessary to clarify a couple of matters in relation to the administration response to the motion. Um, you'd obviously be, it's obvious that there is an interpretation of the motion um, that is required in my, 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 from my perspective, further review. And, um, you know, I think it needs to be acknowledged that the motion doesn't directly seek to review the decision of CAP, um, um, as was, I guess, proposed or discussed by the admin comment. Um, I understand, however, that the CAP report did set out, you know, some of the historic planning content, um, the um, existing use, and um, I do have confidence in, in the staff and the, and the advice provided by the staff, but I recognise, you know, the amount of interest in this matter. And I just needed to clarify that the response that was provided, the admin response, um, probably um, incorrectly um, assumed that there was discussion about the decision of CAP when that wasn't the case. In relation to uh, part four of the motion, the administration um, does um, seek to protect council's interest. Um, and it's important to note that um, there is potential for any legal review findings to prejudice the council. And we've had these discussions before in other similar matters where legal advice has been sought to be tabled in open agenda. But I do appreciate um, that in certain circumstances, public interest considerations may outweigh um, any waiver of privilege. And um, that really comes down to a political, a political decision um, rather than an administration decision. Um, but the advice is quite clear from my perspective um, in that um, you know, it's always best if we're able to to protect our privilege um, when um, dealing with legal advice. So I just thought I'd provide that preamble before you get into the debate of the motion. Um, thanks, Lord. So, Councillor Abraham today, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I, I, the chat room wasn't working. Um, uh, that's okay. I, I declare a uh, perceived conflict of interest uh, as I am a uh, CAP member. It's a material 
Oh, okay. So if it's a material, yep. If it's a material conflict of interest, I'll declare that. And uh, in saying that, I will be leaving the meeting. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. So, Councillor Martin has his hand up. Um, well, two things. First is, uh, I'm not sure uh, what Councillor Abrahimzade was saying. At CAP, he declared a conflict of interest because his employer holds a, a contract over the facility or some kind of contractual arrangement. And now he says he's not. Um, why is everyone shaking their head? Who's shaking their head? So. Councillor Abraham today has got a material conflict of interest because he's a member of CAT. That has been the advice through governance, which I have Rudy nodding his head at me. Oh, so it's not because his employer has a financial relationship? No, that was his, uh, he had a conflict of interest with a an item that was going through CAP, but in this item he has a conflict, a material conflict of interest because he's a member of CAP. But given they were the same subjects, don't the conflicts remain the same? No. Okay, all right. Uh, the second thing is, look, I, I would like this matter deferred. Um, and the basis for that is the administration comment was quite clear, I understood. And now the CEO is saying that's not now the case, that he has a different view. Um, and I don't understand that different view. I would like that in writing so that I can properly consider this matter. Um, if the administration is now saying that the comment it provided is not accurate, then that has the potential to change my vote. Can, can we, can we Councillor Martin, and can we put Councillor uh, uh, Mark Goldstein back on council? So, CEO, did you want to comment on that one, please? Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor. It's not a complex uh, matter that I'm that I'm proposing. Um, all I'm doing is correcting the record that the um, the administration comment um, assumes that the mover is seeking um, to um, seeking advice regarding the decision of CAP, when that is not in, in fact the, um, the the motion that is before us. And if you look at Part two of the, of the motion, um, it requests that the administration commission an independent and comprehensive legal review of the current and historic development approvals, et cetera, the impact of the land use, and also then whether an increased intensity of the land use has extinguished historical existing use rights. It doesn't actually refer to any decision of CAP itself, more so the advice that was provided to CAP. And I just needed to clarify that. Um, thank you, CEO. Uh, we haven't actually moved the motion yet, um, so I will go to the Deputy Lord Mayor to move the motion and seek a seconder. Thank you. I move it as printed and seek a seconder. Thank you. Members, I have Councillor Canole as a seconder. Um, noting that uh, there's been a request for a deferral. Should we, should we go to that first or? It's up to you, it's your motion, whether you want to defer it or not. Oh, well, uh, naturally no, um, because I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, it just means that uh, uh, the administration comment at one um, is not relevant to the, to the debate. So you just remove that and the rest of the comment is relevant. And so you do have all the information you need. So you have a second, uh, to Lord Mayor, so if you want to speak to the motion. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, um, and thank you, councillors. Obviously, this is an issue that has um, uh, gone on for some time um, over the past few years, and it's taken many, many different forms. Um, uh, but what, what is fair to say is that we still, as yet, after these many years, do not have a resolution to this matter. Um, uh, we have uh, lots of residents and traders, and in fact, the centre themselves, that deserve an answer um, uh, to the question. And, and the, the question is fundamentally a legal question about planning approvals. That's 
the only real question there is. That's the only real question there ever has been. Of course, we had councillors in the last term um, uh, jumping up and down and, and talking about a, uh, or a whole range of different things that set council off a path um, which meant we were paying for CCTV, it meant we paid for a security guard for a local business and all manner of other things. Um, when really what we needed to do from the beginning was answer this fundamental question uh, um, about planning, about the intensity of land use at the site. Um, and then once we have an answer to that question, uh, we can actually move on one way or the other um, uh, and, either, and either work to better it will, regardless of what the outcome is of this review, we will be working to better the entire street, knowing that the framework, the legal framework we're operating in is sound um, and that we've actually provided some leadership on the matter. And I actually think it's a real failing of council that over the past three years, uh, we haven't really provided um, uh, real leadership and direction in this regard. Um, we haven't, we've left these questions unanswered. And in that vacuum, in that vacuum, we have allowed our ratepayers, um, and that includes the Hutt Street Centre as a key stakeholder and deliverer of social services. We have allowed those ratepayers all um, uh, to essentially have a boxing match over three years um, uh, where they've been disputing things one way or the other. This is about us stepping in uh, with some legal clout, some clear authority, um, and regardless of what it comes back with, we will have a solution and a way forward. Now, it could come back and say everything's compliant and then we continue on as we have been, knowing that we can operate in that certainty of that framework and knowing that we have um, and can rely on that information. It may come back and say it's non-compliant um, and that the land use intensity at the centre needs to be adjusted, um, uh, which would in all likelihood uh, just be the case of um, a line being drawn in the sand around the number of visitations a day, because when it was originally approved, in the mid 90s, it was at 40, and now it is at 200. Um, and as per the remarks um, of their CEO recently, around half the people that visit the centre um, are suffering from mental illness. So you've got about 100 people visiting Hutt Street every day um, that are suffering from mental illness, and that, that has effects. What COVID has actually shown us is that these services can be delivered to people in their homes, because the majority of clients are actually not homeless, they are housed, but they're accessing other vital services that the centre delivers. Um, that's what we're dealing with. But um, if we don't have an answer to this question, then this will drag on um, ad infinitum and our ratepayers and our stakeholders will continue playing fisticuffs um, and trying to battle it out. And um, I'm actually concerned that if we don't do our due diligence on this, and if we don't show that we've actually done our due diligence on this, we could potentially ourselves be legally exposed down the track. Um, because we have been negligent in the application of our uh, duty as the relevant local government planning authority that has given the original approval for the operation of the centre, has given subsequent approvals, and over the last 27 years is largely, well, is solely responsible for ensuring that those approvals are complied with. So I'm, I'm seriously concerned that if we don't do this, I'll seek another um, minute, Lord Mayor, I think. Um, I'm seriously concerned that if we don't do this, we're not going to see a resolution down here. We're not going to see a resolution to this. And while I appreciate it is unorthodox um, uh, to release legal advice, I think um, the public interest test here um, demands that in order for us to instill confidence in the stakeholders down in this precinct, we do need to show them the same advice that we're acting on, the same advice that we uh, are seeing so they can know and understand um, what our position is, why we hold that position and why we're working within that framework. So I think that is integral to solving this um, uh, matter and answering these fundamental legal questions um, into the future. But just, just picture this, for example, and this is one of the key and practical reasons why we need an answer and a proper position. Um, so the Hutt Street Master Plan is telling us that we're going to have a Lord Mayoral Round Table that is gonna be responsible for overseeing the implementation of the master plan of this precinct. Now, uh, picture this, that you've got the Hutt Street Traders, about, I could another minute, Lord Mayor. Hutt Street Traders around that table, you've got uh, the Hutt Members, Street. Members, I'm going to actually have to give you another minute only by leave of the meeting. So I'm, hands, can I have a show of hands, members? Yep, thank you. 
Thank you. So you'd have a situation where you've got the Hutt Street Traders, possibly the Hutt Street Residents Association, uh, SECRA, who are anti-expansion, but generally happy with the status quo at the moment, but they don't want to see anything further than that. Um, and you've got the Hutt Street Centre as the key stakeholders, as well as others. Now, if you go into that round table without a firm answer to this question and a firm way forward, leaving, and if you've left this question unanswered, you're going into that round table and you're going to try and trying to shape a precinct for the future uh, while you've got one half of the stakeholders basically at odds and, and if dare I say it almost at war with the other half of that stakeholders of those stakeholders. It's not a workable situation. It's not a workable situation at all. By undertaking this, um, we can actually uh, do what we should be doing, which is answering this fundamental legal question. We would be appointing to act on our behalf um, uh, experienced planning law experts to undertake this review and to uh, act as our agent, gather information as to what is actually occurring on the site, give us a determination and a way forward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Canal, did you wish to speak? No? Um, I have Councillor Sims. Sorry, just a moment, Councillor Sims. I'm just. Uh... Thanks, Lord Mayor. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes. Thank you. I profoundly uh, disagree with this motion, Lord Mayor. I cannot fathom why in the middle of a pandemic, when uh, council resources are so scarce, a member of this council would be advocating for us to waste council resources on a witch hunt against an organisation that supports homeless people in our city, that supports the most vulnerable people in our city. It is not just a waste of council resources. It is low politics, dog whistle politics, trying to demonise vulnerable people in our community and trying to demonise the organisations that work with them and support them. And also, Lord Mayor, the hypocrisy at the centre of this is plain for all to see. Members will recall that I and others on this council advocated for legal advice around the Crows proposal for the parklands. We were stymied by members of this council who argued we couldn't possibly do that. We couldn't possibly justify the expenditure on legal advice when we're dealing with a corporate takeover of our public space. And not to mention, of course, Lord Mayor, that this council can't afford a bag of seeds or a temporary activation of our roads for uh, bikeways. But somehow when it comes to a witch hunt against the Hutt Street Centre, we can find the money to engage a senior planning lawyer. What a waste of resources, Lord Mayor. What we do not need is this council whipping up hysteria, whipping up a moral panic around a decision that has already been made. If Councillor Hyde is uh, serious about wanting the community to move on, then the best thing he can do is butt out. The last thing we need is members of this council sticking their noses into a cap decision, inflaming anxiety in the community and wasting council resources on a witch hunt such as this. I think it's a real low point for this council and I'd encourage Councillor Hyde to withdraw the motion. Thank you, Councillor Sims. I have Councillor Martin. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, I, I have listened to what the Deputy Lord Mayor has said, and I honestly don't believe I've ever heard politics as low as this. The intention is clear. This is about beating the administration around the head to achieve the goal that has been long sought by rednecks in his neighbourhood to close the Hutt Street Centre. And as Councillor Sims observes, at a time when its services are needed, at a time when its services are pressed, when it has been there for 60 years, and when it does not propose any expansion at all, it is proposed in the most discriminatory fashion I have ever heard, that we should somehow come to our senses and reassess whether it should be there. Well, I, I am so appalled. Where does this stop? What's next? The Adelaide Men's Day Care Centre? Let me tell you, many of the people who attend that and who receive their services have mental health issues. What about the Royal Adelaide? 
there are many people who go there with mental health issues. Should we relegate that to some other part of the state? This is dog whistle politics. It's as low as a snake's belly. And I am so appalled that I will write to the people who care about the Hutt Street Centre, including the Premier, including the Housing Minister, and including the Chair of the Legislative Council Select Committee investigating poverty, and which is investigating those who have demeaned the Hutt Street Centre in this fashion before. I am appalled. I am beyond appalled. This is the most disgusting, vile motion I've seen. I, look, my, my feeling is I just want to get up and leave. I, it is just sickening. This, this council is beyond redemption. Thank you, members. Uh, are there any other speakers to the motion? If not, I'll go to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Well, in, in summing up, Lord Mayor, I'd just like to highlight a couple of points, and that is that um, I'm among the most vocal people when it comes to support for homelessness services uh, in this current term of council. That has been my ethos uh, from the beginning, and it will continue to be um, what I do. That does not mean that the operation of social service providers uh, is excluded and, and somehow does not need to be policed with regards to planning law. And that's fundamentally what the question is that we're here to answer. And we're answering it, we're answering it not in response to the identity politics that Councillor Sims and Martins wish, wish to whip up. It's not about that at all. Um, and on the flip side, it's not about um, the other side of the coin, which is Councillor Moran's um, uh, 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 advocacy, I suppose you would call it, on the issue, which along with Councillor Martin actually helped inflame all this in the beginning, instead of coming together and working out a reasonable way forward. That's what happened in the previous term of council. And it's been incredibly disruptive to my precinct where I live. Um, uh, and it hasn't worked out a way forward and it hasn't helped anyone. If you want to talk about a waste of money, you can, you can, you can look at the security guard we paid for, um, uh, for many, many, many hours, um, which didn't help anyone. But um, this is not actually about shutting down the Hutt Street Centre at all. Not at all, because uh, it, it's, it's about providing clarity for our residents and our ratepayers in this precinct. Um, a decision here that they're non-compliant would not actually shut them down in the slightest. It wouldn't touch that. Um, what it would give us is an indication of how many people go through the doors each day, and it's 200 at the moment, it might be 200 that is compliant, it might be 180 that is compliant. Um, uh, but that's essentially what, what it'll be telling us. And so we can work with them if they're non-compliant to ensure that they are delivering their services in a manner that is consistent with the law and with the planning approvals that they've had. And if we do that, then stakeholders, investors, property owners, businesses, and residents and potential residents can have clarity around where we stand on this very important issue. Because at the moment, it's a noose around our neck on Hutt Street. We don't have an answer for it. Our stakeholders are battling it out by themselves and the council has provided no leadership on the matter. It's, it's a very, very bad situation. We need to provide some leadership and we need to answer these fundamental questions. And um, uh, moreover, I would just add on the development approval, um, the reason this is tangential to CAP and is not directly related to CAP is because the development approval um, uh, in essence is, is most likely okay. The real question is, are they compliant um, and uh, if, if 200 people visitations a day and the intensity of the land use is compliant, uh, then the DA is good. If it's say 180, then uh, the DA, well, they need to bring down their levels to say 180 visitations a day. And I'm just plucking this out. This is all hypothetical. Um, uh, they bring it down to 180, therefore they're compliant, therefore their DA is fine. Um, it's not actually about shutting them down. It's not about stopping their renovations. It's about giving clarity and certainty to everyone down here, centre included, around what's ruled in and what's ruled out. That's something we haven't done today. I think it's a real failing of us and the previous council that it wasn't done today um, uh, because it's allowed this, uh, it was fueled um, this horrible neighbourly feud which has divided the community down here. You've got hundreds of residents on the one side, you've got hundreds on the other side, um, and we don't have an answer for it, but we do have a significant problem it's not a comfortable problem. Um, uh, it's, it's not one that's easily fixed, um, but I'm hopeful uh, that this council will show some leadership in fixing it.
Hello, members. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, it's actually in the Colonel Lightroom. Uh, Jenny and I have just moved back into my office. Um, I will, uh, you were just finishing your summing up. Um, um, I, can't un I can't unmute anyone, Jenny. So yeah. Deputy Lord Mayor, I'm terribly sorry. I think you were almost at the end of that, but I- Yeah, uh... yeah. pretty well. No, I'll, I'll, I'll just um, be very, very brief. Um, if this is not an us and them issue. We all need to work together to fix this. Um, I don't think boiling it down to an us and them issue is necessarily useful. Um, uh, we can definitely support and expand social service providers while also being in line with planning approvals and planning law and ensuring that our town planning is up to scratch and that we're actually staying true to our development plan and how the city was planned. Uh, the flip side, again, I'll reiterate it, um, it's important to release this publicly so that they can have confidence um, that we're moving forward in the right direction um, and that uh, we've done our due diligence because if we don't release it, there will be lingering cynicism in the community one way or another around this, and it won't actually achieve the outcome of resolving this matter once and for all. And again, I think it is incredibly important that we undertake uh, this review and get a determination by an independent third party so that we can insulate ourselves and protect ourselves legally um, uh, for anything that may happen down the track. Um, and I think if we do the right thing now, there won't be anything that happens down the track that could adversely affect council. Um, but we need to make sure we're confident in that regard and we need to make sure we've done our due diligence now um, so that a court does not seek to award exemplary damages or punitive damages in any sense um, to someone who might bring a successful action against us in the future. Uh, we need to protect ourselves now, we need to protect our residents now and we need to resolve this issue. Thank you. Now, members, given that that was um, the councillor summing up, I see your hand, Councillor Martin. Can you hear me, Councillor Martin? Yeah, I can hear you. Yep. Um, no, look, it's all right. I was just calling out abuse for the uh, the dreadful discrimination. Um, okay, I'd thank like you. To... Sorry, it, we, we'll go to the vote first. Thank you, members. Um, to the vote, those in favour? Those against, and Councillor Sims. Division. Division. Uh, division has been called members. Um, please pop your hand up until I call your name. Those in favour, Councillor Canal, Councillor Ho, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Kerr, Councillor Kouros. Game. Uh, members, that takes us to the end of motions on notice and we're going to motions without notice. I have one no motion without notice, which is from Councillor Martin. Um, Councillor Martin, in uh, having looked at the motion on notice, um, I'm going to rule not to accept this um, motion as I believe it would be better taken on notice to ensure that it's considered in an informed way. It isn't time sensitive, and I do believe it requires input from our administration to make a decision. Um, so um, I'm going to ask you to put it on notice. Yes, yes, Councillor Martin, you're unmuted. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I move that the meeting dissents from your ruling. Um, I think... I don't think you can, actually. I can. Yes, I can. I can. I don't think you can challenge a motion without notice. No, no, I am, I am challenging your ruling that this motion is not eligible to be accepted. Um, my governance is telling me that you can't. That, that's my call uh, as to whether the motion without notice is accepted or not. Well, look, Lord Mayor, it, it was invited by the administration in the summary for the item on question on notice. Um, if you persist with this, you do so. It, it, it's just a further indication of the dysfunction of this council. Um, Councillor, that is not about the dysfunction of this council. There are things within this that require administration comment for us to actually have an informed decision making. And it's not time sensitive. And I went to the standing orders and... 
uh, that, that is the standing orders that I'm using to make the ruling. Uh, Lord Mayor, uh, you subvert the rulings in whatever way you want. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, members, that takes us to uh, exclusion of the public. Um, so we're just going to the order to exclude. So members, I've got three items before you. Um, if I could actually have someone move 18.1.1, which is the advice recommendation from the audit committee. Uh, sorry, I actually can't see you all. Just do this. Thank you, Councillor Canol and the seconder, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, uh, members, those in favour, show of hands. Those against, Councillor Martin. Councillor Martin? Lord Mayor, I, I urge you to suspend this meeting. I keep raising the hand electronically. You do not see it. We move on. And it's consistent through the whole thing. The system is not working. It is not a, a desirable thing for us to proceed if members cannot be heard or seen. Oh, majority of the time uh, that I actually had, well, without some um, problems that we've had with this tonight, um, that members are being heard and seen. So I'm well, sorry. Well, can you hear me then? Uh, what is the strike rate? 50%, 60%? Uh, Councillor Martin, I don't believe that's true. And I, I actually have other people with me the whole time. So, okay, well, so Councillor Martin, was there a problem? Um, yes, I want to urge members um, to vote against it. Uh, I wanted the opportunity to speak to say that these are matters of public interest. They should be in the public realm and uh, to hold them in confidence is inappropriate. Thank you, members. Uh, we will vote on 18.1.1. Those in favour? Thank you. Those against? That is carried. Uh, members, I have 18.2.1, which is the 2019-2020 qu uh, quarter three commercial operations report. I'll look for a mover. Thank you. Councillor Martin, are you moving that? No, I'm speaking against it. Okay, members, I'm looking for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Canole and a seconder, Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Martin. Same argument, Lord Mayor. The information should be in the public realm. These are council enterprises. Public has a right to know, particularly as we're telling them, these are the reasons we're taking measures that we are. If they can't see the extent of the problem, then there's no way of carrying them with us. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Members, uh, to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, the last item is 18.2.2, .2, which is membership of the Heritage Advi Promotions Advisory Group, and I look for a mover. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to ask for electronic hands, members, if you can. I have Councillor Kerra and seconded by Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, members, did anyone wish to speak to that? No, if not, we'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, one moment, and I'll just have to make sure we stop streaming. Okay, so thank you, um, uh, members of the public and members of staff that aren't associated with these items before us. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. We will, uh, in a short moment, stop recording.